Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our meeting tonight of Tuesday, April the 10th. The way we typically start off our council meetings is with the singing of O Canada. So I'd like to call up our singer first to the microphone, and then I'd like to read a little bi uh, bio on her. Her name is Joya. Joya, welcome. Thank and you. is the light on that little microphone? Can we tell? The little red light on? Yeah. Okay, great. So Joya D. Linardis. Joya is a vibrant musical grade 8 student. She attends St. Michael's Elementary School in Niagara-on-the-Lake. She has a strong passion for singing, dancing, and musical theater. Joya is already accomplished in the arts, having received the Most Outstanding Musical Theater Performer Award in 2016 at the Niagara Music Festival. She's preparing to perform at Universal Orlando with Niagara's premier show choir, the Niagara Star Singers. In addition to her great success in musical theater, Joya studies singing and musical theory with her voice coach. She achieved first class honors for her grade four Royal Conservatory exam. And Joya is thrilled to have attended a master class on the musical Hamilton in New York City in March. When she isn't immersed in music, Joya is enjoying sailing and swimming. She holds a bronze medallion in life saving and is looking forward to attaining the bronze cross next year. So maybe one of our future lifeguards. <laughs> Joy also enjoys spending time with her family, including her two dogs, Jet and Luna. So, Joya, whenever you're ready. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons' command. Carton bras se porte le paye, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des plus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada. We stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Well, Joya, you did a fantastic job. I know that all the council very much appreciated it, and we know we wish you lots of luck in the future with your singing and all your other endeavors. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. If I could ask you to remain standing uh, just for a moment more, we're going to stand right now in solidarity and support the humble Saskatchewan families that have been affected by the recent incident that took place. Sunday evening during the community's memorial, the falls glowed gold and green to support the community. And a binational show of support from both the American and Canadian uh, sides, the Horseshoe Falls were illuminated. The tragic crash that took the lives of 15 and injured 14 others in their community reverberated throughout cities from coast to coast and in both countries. In addition to the lighting of the falls and the humble team's colors, the flags at City Hall were also lowered and remain at half staff. Our sticks are out at council chambers, as you can see in front of my desk to my left and behind me in the corporate crest. They're there, they're countless, they're there. Our sticks are out at council chambers as they are at countless homes across the country. The Professional Hockey Players Association headquarters have also gone green and gold, and they've got the sticks displayed in support of Humboldt out front. And you'll see the picture on the screen. So this Thursday, April the 12th, is Jersey Day at schools across districts and at many professional locations, as well as right here at City Hall in city buildings. And we're encouraging everyone to wear their jerseys in support of those of our friends that are affected in Saskatchewan this Thursday, April the 12th. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna put the falls back on the screen and we ask that you give us a moment of silence and solidarity. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay, we'd like to start off an adoption of the minutes from our March 27th meeting. Moved by Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Just okay. one, one. Oh, we have one note from our clerk, I'm sorry. Uh, just one minor change in uh, communications, item 10.11. Uh, there was a request from Norm Puttick requesting council support, asking the region for a review of the 2000 Berkeley report. The minutes do say that it was to uh, receive, but in actuality, the, uh, the motion was to refer that to the region, so we'll make that change. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. Um, we voted then, all in, fa all in favor? Just confirming, okay, thank you for that. Uh, next up, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, in the in-camera uh, discussion regarding uh, bridges across roadways, I had a conflict. Okay. Councillor Cario. The same thing, Your Worship, on in-camera, we excuse ourselves from that meeting and uh, declare a conflict on that bridges across Balsley Boulevard and some of the others. Also have a conflict, Your Worship, on a report that's coming up on um, Boyers Creek. So Boyers Creek, we're, we're doing some work on Boyers Creek. We're gonna do some work and Boyers Creek runs through my farm. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, in camera, the meeting prior to this one, I had a conflict with uh, Report L 2018-04 dealing with accessory dwelling units. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, if there's no other disclosures at this time, a very brief uh, mayor's announcements. <laughs> Already. Already, yeah, we're gonna get this over with the solemn part of the meeting. Uh, starting off with obituaries, uh, our uh, condolences go out to the family of Pasqualino, Pasqualino Pat Tudini, father-in-law of Selene Tudini of our Municipal Works Department. As well, uh, James Brow Pace, brother of John Brow of our Environmental Services Department passed away, as did Elizabeth Betty Lou Manker, Longtime volunteer and community champion who just passed away on Sunday afternoon as well. Uh, council representatives, I want to thank Councilor Peter Angelo for representing the city at the Boys and Girls Club AGM and Recognition Evening, and Councilor Strange representing the city at the World Autism Awareness Flag Raising and Hockey Talk at the Blue Line Diner. And as well, I don't need to repeat it, uh, but the city has made uh, efforts to show solidarity with our friends in Humboldt, Saskatchewan, and the terrible loss that they've recently suffered and continue to suffer through. And just lastly, to point out that our next council meeting will take place Tuesday, April the 24th. So now we move on to deputations and presentations. And we have uh, one tonight, and I'd like to call up Lucas Body to be recognized, uh, Lucas, you want to come up here and meet me? Well, let's call you come up to explain again where they should have been about yeah, this uh, coach in there. Let's not do anything. Bring your gloves. Oh. I don't know if there's enough room in here for you and your gloves. <laughs> some big, and if you mom and dad want to take some pictures, by all means, eh? Hey? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. So I'm going to read a little bit here about uh, what's going on with, uh, with Lucas, and then I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Strange if he'll weigh in a little bit as well. And, uh, and then I've got a little, little gift for you, so don't get too excited. It's just a little <laughs> gift. Some, uh, you know, the BNF stuff, Councilor Peter Angel. You, love so you got much. it. You know it. So, Lucas Body, and I know your parents are here and your family, I see, and uh, and we're really proud of you and all that you've done so far. And, you know, we know you've got a lot more things that you're going to be doing. Uh, Lucas is a reigning three time Canadian senior boxing champion. Nice sound, right? Champion. Gold and silver medalist in provincial and national championships, winner of 12 international competitions. He's competed at the highest levels in the amateur boxing world, including two Canadian national championships and won many outstanding boxer awards from international meets. 
Lucas has traveled all over the world over the past three years for training and competition. He was committed to coming back to train and develop right here at home in Niagara Falls. He competed in Boxing Canada's 2018 Super Channel Championships at Edmonton the end of March. Over the course of five days, Lucas scored four consecutive victories, including two knockouts. This garnered him the gold medal for the men's elite 60 kilogram class. Last winter, he and manager trainer Willis McManaman, I get that right? All right, started the Falls Boys Promotions. It's a sports marketing and entertainment company with the purpose of bringing international boxing right here home to the Niagara region and give Niagara boxing fans an opportunity to share and support his drive to the 2020 games in Tokyo. That'll be a pretty exciting thing to build toward. Lucas believes that hosting regular shows here in Niagara region will bring world-class competition in our backyard. His longtime dream is to compete with the world's elite fighters in front of his hometown fans. That's our dream too, Lucas. On behalf of City Council, we wish to congratulate Lucas on his outstanding achievements so far and his commitment to the city that he was born in. He's an inspiration for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a big hand for Lucas? Just before I ask Councillor Strange to, to speak as well, a, we have a certificate for Lucas. You want to come in? We'll do a picture here. Come on, trainer. So his dad. Let's fist up. We always oh, do fist up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to do one. Thank you. I just want to put things in perspective because, um, you know, after 2016, he was on the national team and trying to uh, to get the Olympics. Unfortunately, he didn't make, make it to those Olympics. So his eye is on uh, Tokyo in 2020. And last year at the Nationals, he made it to the finals and ended up losing to, uh, to a box from Hamilton. A very close match, one that I thought was, was, should have won. And, and there was a, a little bit of politics. Uh, that played in it, and, and he was on the second team. They actually, so he should have traveled with the national team all over the world. But unfortunately, they took the guy who we beat in the semifinals and took him on that on that national B team. So, and I told he took on his coach Willis uh, just over a year ago, and he's made some great changes. And Willis is a great guy, great coach. And um, you know, I, I I told Willis last year, I said it could be a blessing in disguise what happened because he's going to make him hungrier and and more focused. Well, this year he went, he won the nationals pretty easily, beat all the guys in, in his competition, and won the best boxer award. And um, it's unreal, like to, to win it. And then all those Canadian boxers and the whole tournament, he won the best boxer, representing Niagara Falls and, and, and Ontario at, at those games. But he's on his road to, uh, to Tokyo 2020. He's going to get our support, but they want him, the national team wants him to move to Montreal. And, and I was. They want the whole team to stay together. And I would say it's not a synchronized swimming team where they need to gel together. <laughs> they don't want to bring the personal coaches there. So there's a little bit of politics playing uh, wrong. We just want to show that you know Niagara Falls is behind them and city council is, is behind them. And I would love to get a picture with all of city council with Lucas just because if they, they want to play this kind of type of politics, I want to let them know that Niagara Falls city council is behind them and Niagara Falls is behind them as well. So. Yeah, having a picture with all of city council would be pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 You can you can wear these. <laughs> <laughs> Thompson, you and I are probably in a ring together. I'm Jewish. So Lucas, I just want you to show that all Sorry. of us council, so they're going to have to answer to us. If some politics <laughs> plays a role, they're not going to pick you 
to some of these terms. You've proved that you're the best boxer in Canada right now. You're on the road to Tokyo, and I know that there's a lot of fundraising that you're going to have to do because you don't get a lot of money as an amateur athlete to get there. There's a lot of training. And uh, when I was training, I know uh, when Wayne Thompson was mayor, and the whole council helped me out, and I know you got the full support of us council. So if uh, they're not going to send you on these trips, they're going to have to answer to us in all Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> And the last uh, last thing we're going to give uh, on behalf of the city of Niagara Falls, it's a, a backpack filled with Niagara Falls swag. And I know uh, you'll never forget <laughs> you'll never forget where you come from, but this is so that everybody else remembers where you came That's from. Great, right. thank, thank you. So Congratulations, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's a very good looking boy too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Represent the city. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the report. And council, if I could just remind uh, all of council, your microphones, make sure the button is on when you speak. Councillors, we've had some complaints from people calling in, they can't hear council. So please turn your mics on, make sure the little red light's on when you speak, and then it's off when you're done. Because we have people that are calling in, they can't hear us. <laughs> okay, starting off with the uh, reports. There's a Boyers Creek Municipal Drain reappointment of engineering under the Drainage Act. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 7.2, the extension of the interim control bylaw regarding boarding and rooming houses. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Thank you. 7.3, Rosedale Drive intersection control reviews. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 7.4, CD 2018-03, Adult Entertainment Appeals. Um, this one, uh, who would do this one? Uh, I guess just receiving. Question? Yeah, Councillor Cario. Uh, Your Worship, that was never on our agenda in the past. Is there a reason? I don't think it was ever on our agendas in the past. Was it? Uh, yeah, actually, it was. It uh, was. It? Yeah, it, but it's it's always been, been it's been on the consent agenda. Oh, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Vince. So, uh, I need a that's a receive. Is that to receive? Uh, See, no one reads the consent agenda. <laughs> and we're just looking for a motion to uh, pass the recommendations that are in the report. There, the background of the report, uh, Councillor Cario just does talk about. Uh, the wording within bylaw 2002-197 that it does suggest within that bylaw that the report and the recommendations from the committee come back to council at the next available meeting. Okay, so I've got a motion by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved. Uh, now we're on to communications and comments of the city clerk, starting with 8.1, request from Star Valentino requesting that May 16th be proclaimed as do something good for your neighbor day in the city of Niagara Falls. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. 8.2, celebrate old downtown. Uh, cruising the Q car show, they're requesting that waiver of fees associated with road closures and cleaning and parking permits. Moved by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Item 8.3, the 11th annual Enbridge Ride to Conquer Cancer, taking place June 9th and 10th, requesting the council recognize the event as a public event of municipal significance in order to obtain a special occasion license permit. Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Item 8.4, Red Boss Pyrotechnics, requesting approval of the use of Glenview Park for various fireworks displays for the Great Wolf Lodge. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? Thank you. 8.5, Revel Charity Ball. It's a benefit benefiting project share, requesting for funding by purchasing, purchasing a table of 10 for their event on April the 27th. What's the will of council? Uh, I'll make a motion, only because uh, it is uh, 
four projects here. Your Worship. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I do represent council on the uh, project shares board, and uh, I know that project share would be greatly appreciated. Is going to receive all the funding from this this uh, event. Okay. So we got a motion by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Morocco. Yes, Councillor Crater. I just have uh, one question, and I'm, I'm in support of it, but. I've been asked by a couple of people, so I said I would ask it in open council. Um, when all of us vote on something like this, and so we purchase a table, and then some of us are able to go and some aren't able to go, the question that was asked of me, is it a conflict of interest because you're voting on something that you could derive a benefit from? So maybe I could just get our solicitor to give us an answer if that's, and I did make a promise that I would ask it in open council. Okay. So I, and I want to make it clear, I'm not asking you for the wrong reasons, I'm not opposed to project share, but it was a legitimate question. Okay. Mr. Beeman? Well, I can't actually give individual counselors opinions on conflicts of interest. We can, this is an ongoing matter. Of course, when we get it, an, an integrity commissioner will be able to deal with that. However, uh, were I advising any of the counselors, uh, I would not, I would suggest that that is not truly a conflict of interest. That's not really what the act's intending to, uh, to talk about when they're talking about benefits because the, the councillors are going out and representing the city and these charity groups want the city to show their support for the events. And there's really no other way you can participate and support the, the, uh, the cause. Otherwise, you'd be going there as freebies and <laughs> that would already help the cause. So I think that, that uh, on balance, it's, it's what's expected of you as councillors. And I, I, would, I think it would be very petty indeed if anyone tried to argue that that was properly a, a conflict of interest. And I doubt any of Her Majesty's judges would have much, uh, much uh, time for the case. Thank you, Mr. Beeman. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Kerry. Well, Your Worship, I brought this up before. The, the, the practice of buying a table, I've never been in favor of this. I think if we want to make a donation to the event, we should make a donation to the event. I know that your staff has a heck of a time selling the tickets. And we, we've cost the taxpayer whatever amount for the table, and sometimes half the table's empty. We'd be better off for the charity to make the donation directly to the charity for whatever amount of money, if we believe that we want to support the charity. It would solve the problem of a possible conflict of interest, and the charity would get the money. Regardless, they'd get more money, because the charity doesn't pay for the dinner that we don't go to. They would get the full value of the donation. So I think we should, we should either have a policy on that or whatever but the way we do it the charity's not winning the most that they could win and I, I noticed by some of the emails we get we're being criticized for doing it in some cases so we should have a policy if we want to donate donate but the tickets to me it's not the way to do it we should just give the charity the money well did you want to do like you did last time counselor where you said uh, for any seats that are not uh, attended by a, a council member that that be a cash donation in lieu. I think we did that at the last uh, fundraising. But that doesn't solve the problem of the possible. I, I don't know whether that, that was a, a definite no. answer by He said it's not a conflict in his opinion. It's not a conflict in his, in, in his estimation. Yeah. You, Councilman Rocco? Yeah. Um, if I could just speak to that. We've heard from a few people that actually have come and asked our, for our support. Um, it's support of us counselors being there. Uh, they're looking yeah. for not just the cash, but they're looking for us to actually have a physical uh, uh, presence. presence at the event. Um, it also encourages other people to think that we as a council do care about those uh, organizations. And I know that sometimes it's really tough for all of us to have the time to go. So um, I think it's an option to go, but I also say that if you can't, I mean, you don't want to waste the money on a dinner ticket that no one's going to use when you could actually give them the cash that they need. So I think that where um, Councilor Cario is coming from, that could be a little mm -hmm. bit of a win-win for, for the organization. But I think really, and what they've said to us standing here is that they really want us to attend. And uh, if we can have a presence, it's great, uh, and to support them. But also, they have silent auctions and they have other things that are going on there to sell tickets and to generate more money. And I think really that's what they want to get you there, to go and, and spend a little bit more money and, and mingle and show the community that you, you do care. So I think that it's, it's still a good process to do. So do you want to make a friendly amendment, Councillor, that uh, for anyone that can't go, the rest be just a strict cash, cash uh, yeah. donation? Okay. So that's uh, amended and moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Morocco. We've had the debate. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's approved. Thank you. Good idea. And thank you for the discussion. 
Item 8.6, Water for Life Art Exhibition. There's gonna be a temporary exhibition taking place at the Niagara Falls History Museum on May the 12th on Ferry Street. They're looking for council to recognize the event as a public event of municipal significance in order to obtain a special occasion license permit. Moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Item 8.7, notice of public meeting. Uh, impact of Canadian National Railway train operation within the city's urban boundary. Uh, this is uh, for information of council. So Mr. Clerk, are we just looking to receive this? Yeah. Says for the information. Okay, so a motion to receive the report on the CN trail operations within the city's urban boundary. Moved. moved by Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Oh, did you have discussion, Councillor? Sure. Yep, Councillor Crater. I think is it. Is is this purpose of this public meeting that we're talking we're talking about? Is this is to get input about the problems that we have with the, the railway cutting through the city. Uh, can we get, um, I'm just trying to call up the report here. Um, who would this be? Is this Mr. Uh, Pullman? Yeah, train operations within city's urban boundary. Well, I'm sorry, Carl, and Carl's not here, so uh, did you want? This is, uh, yes, Councilor, uh, we've, as Council knows, we've engaged uh, a consultant, and this is part of the process to have stakeholder engagement, reach out to the public and get uh, input on all of the train crossings across the city. Okay, so that's part of that. This will be the start start yeah. of the process. The only thing, um, and, and again, I'm just sharing, and we probably got a lot of the emails or calls from people who saw that we passed the motion, and I did support it, to hire a consultant to do a study on the impacts of the railway through the city. And most of the people that were sending me the emails are calling me and saying, Kim, you don't need to do that if you don't live here. And don't you realize what has been happening to this city for all these years? Because we've all brought it up many times. So there, I think all their, what they wanted, and, it, and I said I would, and it made sense to me, are we doing the study because we need to do the study in order to convince the CN that they've got to do something to get these trains out of the city? Is this going to be, and you know, you're shaking your head, so that's really good, good to see, Mr. Mayor. But that's what they want to know. They don't want us the public is saying don't spend to do another study on something that we who live here already know the lineups when the train goes through I was just caught in one the other day on on Thurlstone Road oh my goodness it was <coughs> all the way up almost to my mechanics who's Wally around the corner on Stanley Avenue to the to the city service center it was almost back all the way around there and I was standing there sitting there waiting and actually I got out of the car and talked to a few people while I was standing there waiting and, and a couple, one of the guys asked me this question. That's where it, one of them came up and said, you're doing a study, why are you doing a study? You're standing out here with me, you can see how long we're waiting. It's gonna be another half hour before we ever get to the stoplight. So is this, this is, but will this produce something? That's what they're asking. Are we gonna do another study, then we give them a report and nothing happens? Is the CN asking for this study in order to justify that they're gonna prepare to do something? So I, that's what I'm looking at. For Plus the our CAO to address that. Thank you, Council. So um, we, know we, we know we have a problem, and that's the reason why we're doing this study. So the study, this first public meeting is a public meeting put on by us and our consultants to um, get out and start having the conversation with the public. It's not so much about hearing from the public that we have a problem. It's trying to find what solutions we have to that problem. So. One of the things that we're going to be doing through the study, and one of the individuals that's on the project team is uh, Mr. Gary McNeil. Gary McNeil is a former uh, president of Go Transit. Uh, he's part of the team. He's part of the team that helped bring Go Train to Niagara. He knows all of the major players in terms of CNCP. He's assisting us with it. So it's to try to identify what what the solutions are and to outline to the public the steps we're going to be taking to try to find what those solutions are. So that's really the purpose of the meeting. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, well this comes as a result of our uh, resolution uh, years ago, but uh, I think uh, probably four or five months ago, six months, that we uh, not go ahead with uh, building uh, bridges over the railroad at $20 million uh, a kick, that we try to do something to determine how we can get rid of the railroad, which doesn't stop 
during in the city of Niagara Falls. And this is our resolution and as a result, how we're carrying moving forward to try to accomplish convincing CN to move it out and uh, rid us of uh, the second rail line through the city. So this is uh, the process that we've chosen and this is the first step, so it's good. Okay, so uh, did we, I get the motion to receive or no? We've got the first. It was moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, and we just need to call the vote. Okay, we'll call the vote then. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. So now um, we're gonna do ratification of our in-camera meeting. Uh, Mr. Clerk. All right, council did meet earlier this evening. A uh, motion was made in open council for them to go into a closed meeting prior to the regular scheduled council meeting to consider matters that fall under the uh, uh, Municipal Elections Act, or sorry, the Municipal Act, Section 239 2F, mm -hmm. advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. That report that was discussed is report uh, L2018-03. Uh, it was heard earlier this evening in open council of Councillors Kirio and Thompson's declared conflict. The report dealing with overhead pedestrian walkways and all the recommendations within that report were passed. Motion. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, moved the recommendation. Uh, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. With a conflict declared by Councillor Thompson and Kerio. Okay, uh, so now we're gonna do new business, Councilor, Council, and then we're gonna end up having to take a break until 6.30 when our advertised public meeting will take place. So uh, we'll do new business now and then we'll end off our meeting with uh, the reason everyone's gonna be showing up tonight. Councilor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, first off, just to carry over from last meeting in regards to the Lundy's Lane BIA, um, their CIP that uh, that Council had passed what they were looking for was just simply to be treated the way that all the other CIPs have been treated uh, in regards to DCs. And I think that staff were going to have a recommendation back to council. Uh, I was hoping it was tonight, um, but I didn't see it on the agenda. So I just wanted to ask what, uh, what staff uh, are intending to do, uh, or if we can expect that something will be back to us soon. Okay, uh, would that be, yep, Mr. Harrison? The, um Mr. Mayor, the uh, report wasn't available for tonight's meeting, but it'll come on the next uh, budget meeting or the next meeting, and we'll be bringing forward a recommendation to make it similar to the funding similar for DCs in that area as with the other uh, CIP areas. Um, we would have to, we can't amend the DC bylaw at this stage. As you know, we just had our kickoff meeting yesterday with the consultant on the background study for the. Uh, next uh, bylaw, the DC bylaw, and that would be, the intention would be to put it in, in that. Um, however, in the interim, until that's completed next year sometime, um, we, could, we could amend the, the, the agreement with the CIPs. And then, since council utilized the uh, uh, OLG funding, uh, as we've done in similar paths, we have to make the, the DCs uh, fund whole and we could utilize that money for any DCs in the future. These, that would be subject, obviously, to the agreement, the CIP agreement, and that would come in for council for approval. And that's what we're intending to bring back to the next council meeting. Thank you, council. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship, and uh, that's acceptable. I think the only other option was to do a, uh, a study of uh, how the DCs would be affected in the CIP, and then opt to amend the existing DC bylaw which I, I, I think would cost us money, um, and it's gonna cost us money anyway if we exempt the DC, so I'm sure it'll just be quicker to exempt them. Uh, my second order of new business, Your Worship, was in regards to um, the Adam single A uh, team for the Niagara Falls Girls Hockey Association, um, won bronze on the weekend, and uh, I was hoping that we could get them down here and you could give them one of your um, famous one inch trophies. Um, so that they could be at the very front of all their other trophies. So um, it's Matt Masterson as the coach. Uh, so maybe someone from your staff can uh, can reach out to Matt and have the whole team down here. That'd be great. Okay, we can do that, Mr. Clerk. Did we get uh, we got that? Excellent. Thank you. I'm sure they'd be excited to get that one inch trophy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yes, uh, Councillor uh, Ainoni and Thompson. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd just like to say that I had emailed Council out and said that I would and asked if anybody had any objections to having banners made to sign through City Hall and through our different city buildings in regards to sending community condolences to Humboldt. Um, I do have them in my car, I'm sorry, I forgot them. And I wanna thank Stan Bain who, you know, one phone call and it was boom, they're there, you have it. So I will go get them at the break. And I, and I wanna thank um, Bill Burke, cause last night at the Ice Dogs we were there, they filled seven banners I think out of the 5,500 people who were there, 75% of them signed those banners. Um, some of them you could not read without crying, and they raised $8,129 to put towards the GoFundMe page. So it was a great event last night. Um, and I also want to ask, when will a report be coming back to council in regards to the cost of the city hall and the police building renovations, the budgeted and the actual? Uh, Mr. Harrison. Uh, we we anticipate that a, a report will be coming back on all of the capital projects for the May 8th meeting when we do the uh, follow-up to the OLG. So any any type of uh, project that is in, we don't normally uh, report back as projects are underway. We would be uh, reporting back on projects that are um, that are need funding or are completed and we would reallocate the funding to reserves or utilize the reserves. So it's anticipated that the report on those projects would come on the 8th of May. Okay. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you. Um, I had emailed Mr. Harrison some time ago and he said that that report would be coming back, but I would like to know the actual cost of the renovations here. At some point, I have no memory of supporting a new outside of a building um, I think it's called cladding, I'm not sure, whatever it is. And, and people are asking us, what are you paying for that? Um, and I think it's an important, an important um, number for us to be able to tell them. Um, I'd like to know, is it along the lines of what we first approved? Because I remember us talking about make new windows and making it wheelchair accessible. I do not ever remember us having a report that talked about doing all around the building. In, and I'm sure it was involved in the capital budget when it came to us, but I don't think we've had an update since that last approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. CAO? So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, all of those projects were in the approved capital budget. So anybody that wants to go online and look at them, they're there. Um, we made a decision probably six years ago when we uh, approached council with making a decision to stay in this building. Uh, we knew we had major renovation work to do here. Uh, the building literally is falling apart. Uh, brick cladding on the outside was falling off. Um, we made a decision at that point to install new HVAC. That was the first phase. Uh, we then had a, the second two phases, which were the windows. And then once the windows were installed, uh, we needed to install the cladding uh, and reinforce the brick so that the bricks would no longer be falling off the exterior of the building. So those were approved in the capital budget. The reason why you haven't seen the final details on the cladding yet, uh, as Mr. Harrison explained, we will be reporting on all of the capital items and it will be in the report. But as you can see, uh, they shut down work over the winter because of the cold and winter temperatures. So the project isn't even completed yet and we expect that to be completed probably in the next two to three months. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Anor. And that includes the renovation of the counseling camera room and the renovations to your offices. All of those, I know that he's saying they're in the capital budget. I quite frankly don't wanna go online and have to search through each one to find it but I remember us passing that motion that night. So all I'm asking for is an update. Thank you. Council, all of those projects you've mentioned were in the capital budget. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Council. I'm aware they were in the capital budget as a line item. We don't necessarily discuss line items line to line to line. So do I need to make a motion for, for a report simply on the, reno the cost of renovations for um, the new in camera room, your office, the cladding, the windows, everything, because I quite frankly like to be able to tell people when they ask me what we've spent. I don't think that's anything outside of a public policy question. Mr. Mayor, as the treasurer's indicated, all of that detail will be in the report that's coming to you on May 8th. Thank you. It'll be there along with every other capital project that we have un underway at the present time. It'll be one of, one of many. Okay, okay. Councillor Dobson. 
Thank you. Um, I wonder if the clerk uh, has my picture up there. I um, normally don't uh, get involved in these situations because you can uh, resolve them by going through the staff and uh, making sure everything is looked after. And I want to start out by saying Gerald Spencer once again uh, has been relentless in trying to assist uh, with this problem. This is on Lundy's Lane. Uh, it's a veterinary clinic. Uh, he put a nice sign up there. Uh, he could have put a large uh, billboard sign type out in front, but it's a veterinary clinic. Anyway, once he put it up there, the people next door uh, that have the uh, restaurant didn't like the sign and put the fence up uh, around the patio and uh, they uh, got approval through the region. And I, I'm bringing it today because we've been working on this for about four months, maybe longer, and uh, the region gave approval for a patio up there and then the person put the uh, cladding up uh, to block off the sign. Um, uh, one of the solutions was, well, you can take that sign down and it'll cost you uh, $2,000 for another application for another sign, uh, which is unacceptable. So um, I'm bringing it here tonight so that we can assist uh, uh, Gerald Spencer uh, and hopefully our regional people can say, uh, that's at the corner. Uh, I think there's a, a blockage of the, the uh, traffic because uh, it's right on the corner and it closes off this person who tried to do a good job on putting a, a uh, sign up which is attractive and uh, I would refer this to uh, uh, the staff to deal with the region uh, and the solicitor uh, to see if we can't get that cladding down so this person can uh, uh, have his sign uh, work the way he wanted to in the first place. So I'd make a motion to have that done. Okay, so motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange to refer this sign issue in Lundy's Lane regarding the region to bylaw. Call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Uh, Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship, just, I just have one item. Um, I've been following with interest and I'm sure most of, most of the council probably has, but certainly the public, um, the story by Grant LaFleche dealing with the hiring of the um, CEO. So just a couple things. First, I want to congratulate yourself. I saw your remarks indicating that you certainly supported at least doing a review of the hiring. So congratulations for saying that. I also see that the chair has indicated the same thing and that's that's really positive and I know Mayor, Sun, Sun, Mayor Sunzex has Sunzex. said it and uh, a couple of the, a number of the councillors. The only uh, reason I was standing, because I think it's important, in fact I know it is important that not only do they go ahead with this just to clear it up, whatever way it comes out, it comes out, but it, it be done during this term of office, that it not be delayed so that it doesn't get reviewed and completed and whatever the outcome is, it's not gonna be heard. Um, until after the election. I think it's important for the current regional council to have uh, be in the position of making a decision once they hear it. So I wanted to make a motion just for our council to say yes, we support what's been asked for a review, but for this council to say we think it's important that you do the review now before the next election. So I'm really pleased with the next motion. I'll close with saying congratulations for your comments as well. Thank you. Okay. And Thank I'll make you. that motion. I'll okay, moved by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Iannone that this council support the region, regional review of the hiring process for the CAO, and that it be done uh, now during this term of, so, sooner the better, hopefully we can get it done right this away. This term of office. This term of office, but hopefully really soon in this term of office. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council Morocco. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I just uh, have a question from uh, Garth Hutchin from um, the Lions Park in Chippewa. 
So it was my understanding the last time when I made the motion to uh, move forward to have the park and line in Chippewa uh, completed and move forward with, with that development that it was going to be done. I didn't realize that it's a two-phase project. And apparently, I didn't realize that uh, here in this email from our staff, uh, Jeff Clayton, back to uh, Mr. Hutchinson, Hutchinson, is that, um, however, City uh, Council did not approve this project for the funding in the capital budget to date. I didn't know that it was in the budget. I didn't know that we didn't approve a certain item such as that. So maybe I can have an explanation of why is it in, a, in two phases, and when do they expect to finish it, and why would we take on a park and only half do it? Okay. If I can uh, have staff respond. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. So I don't know if uh, Councillor, or uh, if uh, Mr., is that Mr. Holman, Mr. Harrison, or which one of you guys don't, don't fight uh, for the microphone? No, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure why that particular project uh, uh, wasn't in the, capital budget, as you know, uh, we had a long discussion at the last council meeting where we have almost uh, uh, multi-million dollars that are in tab 10, which are pro projects that are identified as being uh, that uh, were required and uh, didn't make the, the grade. We have a lot of competing uh, projects for the funding that's there. A lot of times the projects are done in multi-phases simply because um, there has been uh, it's required to do it in that fashion, and instead of tying up money uh, for something that's not going to be done for a year and a half or two years, it's uh, it is done in phases, and so that the first phase is completed, and then we get to the second phase. Uh, again, um, you know there was other priorities in the parks area that were was were funded, and there were other areas that were uh, deemed to be uh, to go first in line. So, so I guess I'm just. Great, I might have heard you, I might have blocked it up because I didn't want to hear what you said, but the thing is, I'm sorry, but I don't understand, we just we just announced at the Mayor's State of the Address, mm -hmm. all these parks, like last year and this year, how we're gonna build on the parks that, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm thinking that if we're gonna build on the park, build the park and complete the park. Because now they're wondering, when are we gonna finish that? So you got a whole neighborhood out there in, in Chippewa that's now got half a park to, mm -hmm. To house like 5,000 people yeah. there. I mean, there's just a couple of parks, but this is a huge park. It's done a beautiful job. We even had funding and whatever to go there. So I, I guess what I'm, because the, the request was from city staff is to go back to council and see if we can get the money through the OLG casino uh, rent for you. So. Well, if I if I can help out, Councilor. So. Sorry, they're just frustrated. And it frustrated me because I made the motion to let let's get this park finished, did, and I did, didn't realize a two phase. We did many parks all over the city last year and more this year. The way that the, uh, the Chippewa Alliance Park was set up, it was designed into two phases because the first phase dealt with the, the pool, the playground, tennis courts, all of that, significant dollars. The baseball field reconfiguration, the baseball field was still usable and it is still being used. That was put off as a second phase because they had over 200 trees to take down because right. of dead, uh, dead ash trees in the area. Uh, they were working on a, a different design. As you know, we are looking at a redesign or possible redesign for the Cummings Park with the slow pitch. Uh, we didn't know at that point whether or not if we put more ball diamonds there, we needed to redesign that part of Chippewa Lions Park. We also spent over a million dollars on Riverside Park that's just not even a kilometer down the road and that park's being all redeveloped and at that time the final plans for that weren't determined. So all of these moving parts, it made sense to say let's divide this in two phases because we don't want to go and refurbish a baseball field that may not be significant or we need to put in that location based on what other decisions we make. I think those decisions are now becoming more clear as to where we're headed but that's one of the reasons why it was divided into two phases. And you have to remember, I don't know the exact dollar number, but I think the first phase alone was probably six, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars on phase one alone. So there was probably in the last two years, probably close to two million dollars in terms of park development in the Chippewa community alone. And the rest of that was spread around the other parts of the community with playground upgrades. But Mr. Harrison's right, there's only so many dollars to go around 
And I think that might have appeared on tab 10. I'm not absolutely sure because I don't have tab 10 here. But if it didn't make tab 10, it would say it wasn't even at the design stage yet to yeah. make tab 10. So that those designs are probably still being worked so, out. Okay, because they've been informed that it's not going to happen this year, probably maybe next year. So it's not in this year's budget, it's not next year. We did so. not approve it in the 18 capital budget. No. But that ball field is still usable. But it's not tab 10, and so it's not something we can actually take. But as no, long as that, because that's like, not even explained. He didn't even explain that to me, and it's not in the explanation that was given to him. But that was that. explained fully to the Lions. They're yeah. well aware of it. So basically, when can we look at anticipating that? I guess you're going to come back with the report based on... Uh, Patrick Cummings, uh, the ball diamonds, and the earliest that would be is consideration under the 219 capital budget. So, uh, you know, I would I would argue that there's probably not even enough money left in ULG money from this year with other pending commitments that we've already no, made. No, I know, and we, uh, and we just can't. That's that's basically whittled down to not very many dollars. So, mm -hmm. really, projects of that magnitude we're really looking at for the 2019 okay. capital budget. So just, I just didn't, I didn't know as a, as a counselor, you know, to, to represent them and hopefully that this park was going to be finished, that that was a two-phase myself. So when I was presented with this email, I'm like, what are you talking about two-phase? And I didn't see it in even the project in uh, the tab 10 or whatever, the, the wish list. So uh, I greatly appreciate the explanation, and maybe we can actually um, supply me and uh, Garth with uh, a breakdown of when we can anticipate, uh, and those details that you explained to me about the ball diamonds, that, that's a great explanation, so that they understand that uh, there is a, a little yeah. bit more of a, a research process underway. Mm -hmm. The other piece comes well, make it a we, priority. We, we talked and tied into all this, because it, it, it's a much, much bigger issue. I wish Ms. Malden or was here tonight, because part of the other thing that we, we were trying to tie in is, is a, a citywide approach where the GMBA is looking for another couple diamonds. Mm -hmm. We had the report at Hulk Park, Park where we're putting in an artificial turf subject to uh, Canada 150 funding. That will provide another senior baseball diamond. That was playing into it. The other part is that uh, on Kerr Park redevelopment, we've talked in councils where that we're looking at a uh, Kerr Park redevelopment which would look at senior diamonds. So it wasn't just looking at one park. Uh, we were trying to look at all of how all of these parks fit into meeting the need for one to two senior, additional senior diamonds. And as I said, my understanding is that even though the diamond at Chippewa is not in the greatest shape, it is still a usable diamond that we continue to use. Okay, so it's work in progress. Hopefully we can get that in 19. Yeah, we'll be looking at council, next year's capital budget. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carey. Uh, sorry, Your Worship. Um, I was reading some of the Airbnb emails when the Councilor was asking about the outside uh, building. Um, when we get that report, are we going to be able to see uh, the tenders? I, I had some contractors ask me about the tenders, what, what the tenders came in at. So when we tendered the, I, I'm assuming we tendered the job for the cladding, the, the whole job. So if we tendered it, can, can that be included in the report? I, no tenders. If I well, there was tenders. I but I believe we already had a report on those tenders to council when that project went out. And that's probably two years ago now. But. Yeah, we we can because uh, there was a uh, report that came to council uh, for the cladding. I'd have to bring it up, but we can certainly make that available. For well, the, the, yeah, the because that, that was the question I was asked. I was asked about what what the tenders yeah. were because yeah. the local. I, I don't even know who's doing that work. Whether it's local guy, out of town guy. I don't there, was a, there was a report. Some local they, contractors yeah. asked me if it was yeah. tendered. Yeah. I said, I think it was tendered. Yeah. So if we're going to do a report, I just like, they might as well throw in a copy. If we have them, I'd like to see them. I'm sure the other counselors are okay. Just, just Ms. Merritt, but yeah, because this project had to have been tendered. And that's probably why you don't recall it. It's probably two years ago now, I would think, that this project was tendered. Yeah, it, it was, right? Yeah, so that's probably why you don't recall it. Okay, any other new business? Okay, so we're going to adjourn until 6.30, so we've got approximately a half hour, and uh, we'll get started back here promptly. So thank you.
Okay, I think so. Can we start off with that? He already challenged you out here in the middle. Yeah. Uh, let me just find a. Not yet. I'm just getting. Uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started now. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the council. This is our third public meeting on vacation rentals throughout the city. Uh, we had one at the, McB at the McBain Center, one at the Gale Center, and now tonight. So what we've done, we've asked everyone to uh, sign in. So hopefully everyone sign in. If you haven't, please make sure you sign in before you leave. You can do it on the way out. Uh, for anyone that wishes to speak, We've asked that you identify to uh, our people at registration that you wish to speak. Anyone that wants to speak can speak. We're going to give everybody between three and five minutes to speak. We're just going to ask a couple of things. Number one, that there's no repetition. So we know, we know you're very passionate. And we just don't want to have the people saying the same things over and over again. So again, this is our third meeting. There's not too much you're going to say tonight that we haven't already heard. We've received your emails, we've received your calls, we're very aware of how you feel on both sides of the issue. Staff have made a recommendation that we're gonna discuss tonight, and then tonight council will be making a decision one way or the other. So the only thing I ask is that we try to maintain decorum, which means no clapping, no yelling, no booing, just listen, and if you do wanna speak, you'll have a chance, anyone that wants to, at the microphone for three to five minutes. But all we ask is that we maintain order. It's very difficult, there's a lot of people here, a lot of, pe a lot of people at home watching, listening too. What's that? Don't throw anything. Yeah, no, and please don't throw anything. <laughs> so, now we're gonna get started with the formal part of our meeting. So I'd ask our clerk to please introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit vacation rental units subject to zoning bylaw amendments and added definitions for vacation rental units and bed and breakfasts to appendix one of the official plan. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, March 16th, 2018 and by publishing a notice in the Niagara Falls Review on Saturday, March 17th, 2018. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal, formerly Ontario Municipal Board, shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and the, and the reason for this proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Worship. The, uh, this application is a uh, city-initiated uh, amendment application, and it's uh, here before you to uh, present our findings. This is uh, a, a study of more than a year that uh, we've been conducting early intensive research. I have with me tonight Andrew Bryce, who's sitting on my right-hand side. Um, so he's been conducting a lot of the research. He's fielded a lot of the calls with, uh, with the public. Uh, most people in the audience are familiar with uh, Andrew as well. And so uh, he's with me tonight. So should we have any specific technical details I can't um, answer? Andrew's my right-hand man. Uh, his uh, manager, Ken Meck, is also uh, with us this evening. And we're really all here to uh, pull together so that once uh, this evening's uh, uh, discussion is through, we know exactly where council is going and what we can put into <coughs> official plan policies and what we can put into uh, zoning bylaw. It is, um, you know, we are rec recommending both official plan and zoning amendment, amendment, excuse me, that's on the screen before you. Um, so official plan sets out the broad context of policies, of where we might allow something, how we would go about permitting it, but 
it can't happen unless we have a zoning bylaw also in place. So we need official plan and zoning. So we have recommendations uh, for you. Some of it's uh, both of them together, some of it's separately, and some of it's uh, um, entirely separate. So I'll just go through the uh, presentation then. So I've outlined that uh, this has been an ongoing report. Uh, you've already elaborated on the number of uh, meetings we've had. Uh, vacation rentals and bed and breakfast establishments uh, have become increasingly popular, primarily through the use of websites, VRBO, uh, Flipkey, um, Airbnb, those are all applications, they're, uh, they're programs that allow people to list their properties. Uh, they're not necessarily a land use, they're a, a platform for listing properties. Uh, to ensure the types of accommodation do not adversely impact on various properties, uh, we need to develop official plan policies, I've mentioned that, and zoning provisions, and then ultimately licensing regulations to effectively control these uses. Uh, it's not one, it needs to be a package. So on June 13th last year, Council directed that we hold an open house. Um, we've had two sessions, as you mentioned, in September of last year, and then again in March of this year, they were well attended. Uh, there were various presentations, both by those supporting and those in opposition. Uh, there were fewer concerns expressed about owner-occupied bed and breakfast establishments. Uh, there was a broad acceptance <coughs> of the uh, regulating both uses through licensing and the requirement of reasonable fees and uh, payment of taxes. Uh, we had a 19 <coughs> question survey that went out. This was available online as well as in hard copy. Uh, we had 340 responses. Generally, we summarized those as uh, to allow these uses in a residential uh, or commercial or rural areas. There was 45% support uh, for this, uh, meaning that I guess 55% were not uh, in favor of as of right. When we use the term as of right, it's kind of planning jargon. That means if the zoning bylaw says you can use, have the use on your property, for instance in an R1 zone, if it says detached dwelling, that means you can have your single family house. If it says detached dwelling and bed and breakfast, you can have a detached dwelling and a bed and breakfast. But you need to have them in the list. So that's what we mean by as of right. If they don't appear on the list, you can't have them. Um, then the survey also said that um, some felt, 27% felt these should be only allowed in tourist commercial areas. Um, there were some that said only allow, so 17% said only allow the legally operating establishments to continue. And then there were 12% said allow them on a site by site basis. So apply for zoning, yeah, public meeting like this, there's a discussion, public gets to say A, a or nay, whether they're in favor, council makes a decision. So those are um, kind of the summation of how people felt about these uses. Uh, there are provincial policies. Provincial policies say we should be providing adequate housing to meet the current and future needs of, of residents. So there has been some concern expressed. What about the conversion of dwelling units into vacation rental units? Uh, that might adversely affect our housing supply. Right now, I think council is aware that we have a vacancy rate in the range of uh, two percent. It depends on whether we're talking one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom units, uh, but on average about two percent for the last couple of years. Uh, we have recommended policies to implement, um, be implemented so the council can um, have regard to the vacancy rate before a um, bylaw amendment to allow a conversion from a detached dwelling to a vacation rental unit. These are two distinctly different uses. Um, that's been established already and I'll speak to that later. Uh, similar to the city's, we have this uh, policy already, that if someone wants to convert from a rental property to a condominium, if a vacancy rate drops before, below, it says 30%, drops below 3%, um, the, um, we uh, recommend against uh, conversion to condominium. We haven't had a condominium conversion application in a number of years, but that's uh, basically our, our city <coughs> policy. We have that on the record, and we have used that in the past. Um, so the official plan, uh, bed and breakfast, is currently uh, permitted in the official plan in residential areas across the city. Um, so um, that permits bed and breakfast as an accessory use to a dwelling unit. Uh, there are various tourist accommodations, including uh, tourist homes as a specific use, that are allowed in tourist commercial, major commercial, and minor commercial areas. 
uh, in terms, there are terms in the official plan that refer to bed and breakfast, tourist homes, um, bed and breakfast uses, bed and breakfast stuff. There's a all range of uses that's created some confusion. We're suggesting this be unified to be called bed and breakfast. That's the use. Um, there are no policies in our official plan to guide vacation rental units. Um, the Ontario Divisional Court has ruled that vacation rental units are a separate use, separate land use. So a retail store, that's a separate land use. A detached dwelling, a separate land use. Vacation rental uh, unit, a separate land use. So that's already be been determined by the courts and therefore we can regulate it as a municipality through our zoning and our planning documents. The Ontario Municipal Board, board was uh, uh, critical of us because when we went to an Ontario Municipal Board hearing without having policies, uh, we relied on bed and breakfast. Uh, Andrew presented that evidence, he did a great job. However, uh, based on um, other merits, the application was not supported. So we really felt we needed official plan policies to provide guidance to the staff and council if we're going to continue to uh, uh, use these or entertain these uses. We've made some recommendations in our report. So we're rec making recommendations that we include definitions of what accommodations mean. So basically those are hotels, motels, inns, bed and breakfast, vacation rental unit. We've said what a bed and breakfast is. We're describing this as a home-based business that is licensed to provide guest rooms with or without breakfast um, in which it's in the principal dwelling of the proprietor. So the owner is present or the owner's uh, responsible agent is, is present living in the building. That's his principal dwelling. Uh, guest room means a room that's capable of being rented separately to travelers and would not have any cooking facilities. So it's basically a bedroom. Uh, vacation rental unit means then a dwelling or a dwelling unit that's licensed uh, so that licensed is the operative word. You can't just operate one without a license. So it's a dwelling that is licensed to provide temporary lodgings to a group or single uh, to a group single group or of travelers or a single person for up to 28 consecutive days. 28 days. That's the shortest month of the year, February. If um, if people are lodging in these for longer than a, than a uh, 28 days, it becomes a residential use. They're subject to the uh, Ontario Residential Tenancies Act. So it's a different uh, form of housing. Uh, so we've made some recommended changes. We're make, uh, recommending that the official plan provide that the tourist commercial area be primary location for uh, accommodations. Um, and that by the change of those definitions I just uh, was pointing to, that the uh, bed and breakfast and a vacation rental unit are also a tourist accommodations, they should be allowed in tourist commercial areas. Uh, we've also uh, recommended that uh, bed and breakfast and vacation rental units be allowed in major commercial and minor commercial areas. So major commercial would be um, the area of downtown. Queen, Queen Street downtown is c considered a major <coughs> commercial district. Um, minor commercial districts uh, would be uh, Victoria Avenue from Queen Street down to the 420. Those are areas where we already permit hotels and motels as permitted uses. So again, it makes sense. We already have tourist accommodation in those areas. It makes sense that we have a bed and breakfast or vacation rental in those units. That's the, the purpose of our recommendation. Uh, we, sorry? River Road. Uh, River Road is separate. I'm going to come up. That's under residential. Um, so these uses would, you know, we felt would be compatible with uh, other commercial uses because they're adjacent to commercial uses. Uh, the impacts would be uh, uh, relatively the same as other commercial uses um, would be having it to their uh, adjacent businesses. The uh, home occupations and bed and breakfasts are permitted as accessory units to residential units in the official plan, but they must be zoned on a site-by-site -site basis with the exception of the River Road neighborhood. So basically from Morrison Street down to the Rainbow Bridge and from the River Road to the uh, Olympic Torch Trail. That's the area where bed and breakfasts are allowed as of right. That is, they're listed specifically as a use that can be uh, added to a property as long as they're licensed. So that's a, an already established uh, um, situation. I've been here 30 years. Those policies were established well before I came here. 
um, as it, uh, and, and we believe that this is uh, valid, that this should be, uh, um, you know, that it's minor operation because it maintains the character of the uh, area. It'd be still as the principal use of the property is um, someone's home, but they're allowed to have a home-based business just as the same as someone might operate an accounting office out of one of their spare rooms in their house. They do taxes. Um, that's a home occupation. It's allowed because the owner lives there. Like similar to the bed and breakfast, the owner lives there. It's uh, allowed as a home, or recommending it as a home-based business. Uh, we've made some wording to that so that, again, we're looking for consistency <laughs> across the municipality. We haven't had that. Um, we're recommending that the zoning bylaws be revised that would allow a bed and breakfast, up to three guest rooms uh, in residential areas across the city. So it wouldn't matter whether you're in the in River Road area or the north end of the city, Chippewa, um, we're recommending that bed and breakfast be added as of right so that in addition to single detached dwelling, you now have bed and breakfast added up to three guest rooms. Um, we suggest that uh, greater than three guest rooms um, could still be considered, but only on a site-by-site -site basis. So if someone had a five-bedroom house, they wanted to rent out four, they would have to uh, apply to council for four bedrooms, but we're recommending three uh, as of right. The vacation rental unit is a commercial use. It's similar to a hotel and motel, but on a smaller scale. And therefore, we feel there are policies needed to guide this. And due to the impact of these commercial uses in residential areas, it's recommended that vacation rental units be subject to a site-by-site -site review through a zoning bylaw amendment. So you would have, if you wanted to operate one on your residential property, you have to come before council, apply for that uh, zoning change to add that use. Council would then review it. We're recommending policy changes that the council would look at whether the residential character is being maintained, uh, that there be no undue concentration of vacation rental units in one residential block or in one neighborhood. Um, so these were all factors that council would consider. Again, as I mentioned, the vacancy rate would not be affected. Uh, we'd also be looking at conversions uh, of dwellings to vacation rental units be controlled such as they continue to provide that there's still permanent housing provided for residents and that a vacation rental unit be regulated as to its size in order to min minimize disturbances. In this regard, we're recommending vacation rental units be no larger than three bedrooms to ensure that the size and parking are maintained to a scale that's compatible with residential. But again, everybody would have to, those are the policies, you'd have to apply site by site, we review it by those criteria. We check all the boxes, uh, that we would make a recommendation um, in a positive direction. If we don't check all the boxes, it might be a maybe, and, or it might be approval with certain conditions. So um, that would be, as I say, on a site by site basis. Um, we have an area of Niagara uh, resi or Parkway Residential. This is the area along River Road, south from Chippewa, extending down to the town limits. Um, this is an area where our policies already uh, allow for bed and breakfast, and we're recommending that the bed and breakfast policies for uh, Park, Niagara Parkway be identical to those in the residential area, the ones I just outlined. I don't want to repeat all of those. Um, again, bed and breakfast up to three guest rooms would be permitted as of right. Uh, the policies for vacation rental units would be identical to the residential designation, but again, only permitted if it was an application to this council, site by site basis. Uh, in good general agricultural area, the, um, the OP or official plan permits ancillary uses such as bed and breakfast by regional policy. Um, those are allowed to be up to six bedrooms. Um, the region also allows home industries and agritourism uses. Um, all of these uses, the bed and breakfast, the vacation rental, are seen as agritourism uses. And, um, but they must maintain the agricultural and rural character of the area. Uh, staff is recommending official plan policies be added uh, to allow zoning bylaw amendments for vacation rental units up to three bedrooms on a site-by-site -site basis. So again, we're not recommending them as of right. They would not just be added to the zoning. You have to apply for it for your specific property. Um, in the zoning bylaw, uh, we've um, included a couple of uh, schedules in the, in the report. Uh, so those show the areas where we would be recommending 
uh, bed and breakfast. We did provide some larger uh, maps on your desk because the uh, ones in your iPad are very hard to read. Um, not that these are perfect either, uh, but they do provide some <coughs> ideas. So in terms of uh, bed and breakfast use, um, those would be permitted uh, along Lundy's Lane in the Falls View Central uh, Tourist Area, certain areas along um, McLeod Road that are zoned uh, tourist commercial, um, and other spots, as well as the uh, um, area around uh, Great Wolf Lodge and uh, some locations along um, uh, Drummond Road and up to Five Corners. So those are uh, areas that we're recommending for bed and breakfast. Uh, vacation rental, uh, again, <coughs> we're recommending only those for uh, the, uh, the commercial areas and not the residential areas. Um, the, um, the other recommended changes then are for, uh, I mentioned this already, so this would be uh, bed and breakfast would be as of right in tourist commercial Central business commercial, that's downtown, uh, and general commercial zones. Um, the accommodations are already permitted in those zones, and so allowing these uses, which serve the tourists, uh, again, um, follow a log logical progression. The bed and breakfasts are permitted to have, we're recommending that the bed and breakfasts in the commercial areas could have up to six rooms. So um, there's some large houses, for instance, on Victoria Avenue, just south of the armory. Those houses, um, could be used then if we went with the zoning uh, as of right in a general commercial. Those houses could be used for a vacation rental unit um, and uh, up, to, uh, up to six guests as opposed to our recommendation for other areas of the city which would be a MAC, um, uh, a MAC sorry, six guest rooms that would be two people per room, 12 guests, uh, a recommendation for the residential area by site specific amendment is uh, three bedrooms up to six guests. Um, and again, we felt that the surrounding commercial areas could absorb this additional commercial use. Um, the, um, as well, um, the, uh, based on the complaints that we received and the, and the disturbances, uh, we did have uh, our bylaw enforcement uh, section provide me some statistics today. Uh, we've had 44 complaints about noise, parking, and land use issues related to vacation rental units since June of last year, so basically um, the last eight to nine months uh, have, have resulted in 44 complaints. Um, we have resolved many of those. Some of those are still outstanding. Um, anyway, so that we're recommending that vacation rental units up to uh, three bedrooms by policy. They would have to comply with Ontario Building Code um, which states that a bedroom is to be occupied by no more than two people. So therefore, a three bedroom vacation rental unit would be a maximum of six people. Uh, vacation rental units and bed and breakfast are, are not recommended in a shopping center commercial. That's basically Morrison and Dorchester and Niagara Square. Uh, nor would they permit, be permitted in uh, neighborhood commercial zones. Um, neighborhood commercial would be, say, the Ryle Street Plaza at the corner of Ryle and St. Paul, so we would not be permitting them in those areas. Um, again, in keeping with the official plan changes, it's recommended that the bed and breakfast be permitted as a home-based business in detached, semi-detached, duplex dwellings, and any zone that permits these types of dwellings, provided that the proprietor or owner resides there. So basically, just as we know what bed and breakfasts are on River Road, the owner is in residence, operating uh, a bed and breakfast. Uh, since 1979, uh, the R2-2 zone, which applies to the res uh, River Road area, um, I've already described that, allows up to four guest rooms. There would be no intention to reduce that from four down to three, which is our recommendation in the line above, um, but, or, or the, it was a page before. Um, so we'd let them keep their four bedrooms because that's what they've had for um, almost 40 years. Uh, as, a, um, as the above zoning reg reg uh, regulations have permitted bed and breakfast, that's a repeat of what I've just said. Um, the, uh, the maximum of three guest rooms is proposed in the other zones of the city, again on a site by site basis. Uh, again, we selected three because uh, once you get four bedrooms and above, by building code and fire code, you're expected to meet 
um, the fire code statutes that would apply to uh, hotels, for instance. You would not be able to just use your hollow core bedroom door any longer. You'd need to have a one hour fire rated door for any of those rooms in your bed and breakfast. So those would be upgrades that would have to be taken out uh, and, and done in, a, in accordance with a, um, a change of use permit issued by our building department. Uh, other municipalities such as the town of Niagara-on-the-Lake and city of Welland also restrict their bed and breakfast to three guest rooms. So again, in doing some surveys of what other people were doing, we felt this would be consistent with what's happening across the region. Uh, we're also recommending, well right now we have actually our standard for guest parking in a, for a bed and breakfast in a residential area, basically River Road, is one parking space uh, for the dwelling unit and one parking space for each guest room. So if you uh, have three guest rooms, you need three parking spaces plus one for the owner's uh, owner in the dwelling. So that would be four parking spaces would have to be provided on site. Um, we're not making any uh, ch changes or recommending any changes to that parking standard nor to the landscaping re uh, requirements that already exist. Um, the official plan policies are not intended to permit vacation rental units <laughs> in other zones. I probably have repeated that ad nauseum at this point. Um, it is possible that a group of six people could arrive in two vehicles. Uh, so therefore, we're suggesting that we'd need two parking spaces for a three bedroom vacation rental unit um, so that we can reduce the impact of uh, cars going to uh, vacation rental units. So again, this would be a standard. If on a site by site basis, a vacation rental unit was approved, we'd have to meet these standards. Um, there are 16 properties that council has already approved for vacation rental units. We were calling the uh, cottage rental dwellings. However, uh, that term is not easily understood. I think vacation rental, <coughs> someone's on holiday, they've come to the city, they're spending three, five, seven days here and they're renting, uh, that's the rental, and they're renting a unit. So they're renting the entirety of the unit. So vacation rental unit. And um, the, uh, so we have had some recent approvals. We have limited those to three bedrooms which is consistent with our recommendation uh, moving forward. But we do have some older zoning bylaws. I think the first one we approved was back in 2002. Um, and we did permit some of those units to have four bedrooms and some of them we didn't actually put a restriction on at all. Uh, we're not recommending that we change those. They, w they paid their money. They went through a review process. There was a public meeting. Um, they've uh, achieved a certain right and we haven't actually had uh, any complaints about those uh, actual units. Uh, lots of other units, but not those units. Uh, so we're recommending as well that the city, city's licensing bylaw needs to be updated to regulate bed and breakfast, um, and that um, the vacation rental units would also have to be, uh, be licensed. Right now they're licensed under the motel schedule. Uh, doesn't make much sense. Uh, vacation rental unit, renting the whole of a house, is not very much like renting a room in a motel. Um, so again, we need to update the terminology, the regulations, and the fees. Uh, so we've made some specific recommendations. We feel that anybody who is, would be operating a vacation rental unit would need to post their name, address, phone number, uh, the number of licensees, uh, the, the city, and the city designates that on the website. So that would be recorded on the city's website. The application for the license would have to have a detailed site plan. We would have to have floor plans. We need to confirm zoning compliance. We have to meet all of those standards before a license could be issued. Uh, a license would also have to um, be attended by, uh, oh sorry, uh, a licensee would have to be able to attend the property promptly if there was an, a violation of, say, noise, for instance. So um, if there's a noise complaint at midnight, you know, the owner needs to be contacted and um, the owner needs to be able to get there quickly or his designate, um, but we can't just wait in, uh, until morning and, um, and respond. Um, they're also required to post a co code of conduct. That code of conduct would have to be signed by the renters of the vacation rental unit. Uh, that would outline, of course, our city's noise bylaw and other uh, matters, uh, our parking regulations, uh, particularly in the winter. Um, the application would also, or, uh, would, or the licensing would also include a administrative penalty 
for violators of the licensing. So rather than laying a charge as we would do now, if we don't get compliance, we then have to take them to court. We have to present evidence in court that there's been a violation under this uh, administrative penalty. It would be the same as the police pulling you over for a speeding ticket or your car parked in a, uh, an expired meter. We write a ticket immediately. So our bylaw enforcement staff was to attend the site and find that there were 10 people sleeping at a vacation rental where six were allowed, then a ticket would be issued immediately and the, uh, there would be an administrative uh, penalty applied rather than going through the law and court pro process. Um, we also are recommending that the license contain provisions that a license would be revoked if there are three or more complaints. So if we get a complaint about parking, we get a complaint about noise, we get another complaint about parking, that's three complaints, their license would be revoked and they would be uh, ordered to shut down. Um, so we're trying to use our licensing as a more restrictive uh, tool. Uh, again, those would only be where we have zoned for a vacation rental unit. Um, <coughs> the uh, revisions to the bed and breakfast schedule also involve changing the terminology from lodging, house to bed and breakfast. And um, again, I mentioned the requirement for uh, site plan and floor plans. Um, the planning fees are set on a cost recovery basis and similarly, we're recommending that uh, fees for licensing be also set on a cost recovery basis. So that is that um, if you're applying for a zoning amendment, you're the only one that benefits, you pay staff's time. So if somebody needs to know how far to put a shed away from their property line, we give that advice uh, free of charge. That's part of our, our service. If you want to change the zoning to put something else on your property that doesn't comply, you pay because you're the only one that benefits. So we use this as our tool. So we're recommending that the fees be increased um, so that we can get stricter enforcement. Uh, we would you know, hire additional staffing with uh, these funds that would be generated. Uh, we would uh, um, include that the initial uh, application requires an inspection by the fire department um, and that uh, Fire uh, follow-up inspections would also be done at the applicant's cost. Uh, we'd also attend that with uh, our building department to make sure that there are no uh, building code violations. Uh, I mentioned the in, uh, introduction of the administrative penalty, uh, and we would have a database that would list, uh, be listed on the city's website. Uh, we're recommending that a new application would have a fee of $1,000 for application rental unit a bed and breakfast would pay a similar fee of $1,000. Uh, renewal for those would be $500 per year. And the administrative penalty, if we're issuing you a ticket on site, it's a $500 fine. Um, so our recommendations from staff to council are that they approve amendments to the official plan in accordance with the wording that we outlined in Appendix A. That would permit vacation rental units it's a policy that would permit vacation rental units. It sets out that criteria. It doesn't mean they will be allowed. It's just we would set the, the stage for them to be allowed. Uh, we would permit vacation rental units subject to a zoning amendment, and we would provide the definitions that are outlined in the report for bed and breakfast and vacation rental units. Um, the second recommendation is that we do the same thing in the, uh, for in the zoning bylaw 79200 and the Willoughby bylaw and the Crowlin bylaw, that so we define a vacation rental unit, that so we define a bed and breakfast as outlined in the report, we require the parking as I've outlined, we will permit a vacation rental unit with up to three bedrooms and six persons in a tourist commercial, general commercial, and central business commercial zone only, uh, so not in the residential areas. We permit, we're recommending that bed and breakfast, up to three guest rooms be permitted as of right, in an R1A, an R1B, an R1C, R1D, R1E uh, zone. So those would be uh, permitted as of right. Uh, we're also recommending that they be allowed in the R1F, the R2 zone, and the uh, residential uh, multiple transitional zone. There are some properties on Thorold Road, for instance, that are zoned transitional multiple, not multiple residential. Uh, we'd also allow them in the deferred tourist commercial, again, for commercial, tourist commercial uses are appropriate and includes accommodation, uh, vacation rental, bed and breakfast. Um, 
would also make sense. Also, we're recommending it in the agricultural zone and the defer, uh, development holding zone, which development holding permits a single detached dwelling. Um, we're recommending that the bed and breakfast uh, be permitted up to six guest rooms as of right in the tourist commercial, general commercial, central business zones, and that we would maintain our current site area specific uh, approvals for cottage rental dwellings and vacation rentals that have already been approved to date. And uh, we're recommending that Council approve amendments to the licensing bylaw to add the new regulatory provisions and fees for these vacation rental units and the, the bed and breakfast. Um, so those would be uh, consistent. I think that's the last slide, this last slide. Um, thank you, those are the, uh, the highlights. Okay, thank you, Mr. Herlovich. Are there any questions from members of council? Not at this time, okay. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an, an appeal as per section 1724 of the Planning Act. <coughs> Council will now hear from anyone who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. And I would ask that when you come forward, you please state your name and your address. Is there a list right here? Ah, okay. So first up, I think I have uh, Mr. Beam. John, come on up. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Anyways, long meeting. Lot of good, good crowd here. Yeah. My name is John Beam. I live at 6219 Johnson Drive, Niagara Falls. Um, I went to the last public meeting and I had a, there was a few questions that weren't really answered uh, at that meeting. And uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Hurdovich uh, through you, mm -hmm. uh, question. Uh, you said that uh, you had. Uh, bylaw give you some figures that you had 40 something uh properties that were uh complained about uh airbnbs uh how many regular like or how many of those were the same property over and over again you have a, a breakdown of that or your worship i wonder if we could you know he's got five minutes to speak and so i'm just wondering i got 20 ask minutes questions, of questions and then i can respond to the questions oh, yeah okay. uh, that, that would i think uh Fair enough. Keep things a little bit more. Fair enough. Inside. So if you want to okay. bring your questions forward, um, okay. good question. I'll keep going. Okay, that was the first question. Uh, second question, how many normal rental units uh, had complaints with them? Uh, do you know how many regular houses that are just owner-occupied had uh, bylaw complaints for noise? And uh, next question is that uh, you got a bunch of uh, qualifications to have a vacation rental unit like uh, the, the fire stuff and all that uh, things. Uh, is that for a safety point? And uh, if it is for a safety point, uh, are you gonna li uh, are you gonna license regular rental properties? Because there's just as much safety unit uh, problems with normal rental units. I mean, if you're gonna do that and put it on the same foot. Also, any of the vacation rental units now operating, are they gonna be grandfathered? If not, why not? Because they're already existing. And the last one for you, uh, I bought my house when I was 17 and I've owned it for, I still live in it. Um, taxes are going through the roof. Like there's no control on the property taxes and utilities and stuff like that. So basically, uh, I'm allowed to have anybody I want stay at my house. This is a new thing that's gonna come up because there's a gray area. Uh, I don't have to charge them. I could do an Airbnb for free. And if I'm allowed to run a business at my house, what if I charge them uh, some, for something else and they come over and they stay over my house overnight? It's the same thing as eBay with their user fees. Like when you, sell, when you did shipping, people used to charge a dollar for a TV and $600 for the shipping. And that's how they've gone around the fees. I used to sell direct TV systems all through Canada. I was the biggest dealer for a long time, and there was a gray area. And I got I sold systems to the Canadian government, the same department that was prosecuting people through a gray area. So, like, can you answer any of those? 
All right, Mr. Bean, thank you very much. We got a lot. We <laughs> need 10 minutes to answer your questions. <laughs> Uh, the list that I have, oh, sorry, turn my mic on. Uh, the list that I have from uh, our bylaw enforcement are uh, separate properties. So there could have been multiple complaints about the same property, but we recorded it by property. So 44 properties? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, it could have been multiple people about the same property. Um, and it could have been one person calling 10 times about the same property, but we record, I, the 44 were. 44 separate properties. Okay. Um, the, uh, we don't track normal rentals, so you just, what I believe the speaker was me meaning was if I rent some, my house to somebody for you know, a year, um, you know, how many times was there a disturbance and did someone go out there? Uh, we, don't, we don't patrol that because the use is a legal use. That would be a noise violation, the police would be called, that would be a police report. Uh, we don't have access to those records, uh, so I don't, I can't say. Um, the, uh, with respect to fire, yes, it's for safety. Uh, again, it's going to be a multiple occupancy building, uh, so we need to make sure that it is, it is safe, uh, but certainly it's uh, not any different than um, somebody renting somebody's apartment, you know, they rent my apartment, um, and they notice there's no smoke detector, they could call the fire department and say, hey, shouldn't I have a smoke detector? They're gonna come, come out, check it out, and it, issue a, uh, a, uh, a ticket to, uh, to the operator, lay a charge uh, against the operator. So we already do that for, um, for regular, bill, regular rentals. Uh, vacation rentals, um, the, uh, op, so the question was whether or not we would recognize the existing vacation rentals operating uh, that's not our intent. Those uses established illegally. As I said, <coughs> council has changed our zoning bylaw 16 times. For those who actually came in the front door, they came in the front door, they paid their fee, they made an application, there was a public meeting, council considered it, council approved it, council approved it with conditions. Um, that was the proper way to do it. So rewarding people who didn't do it properly in the face of those who did do it properly would be unfair. Um, the, um, I don't know how to respond to somebody who says, uh, you know, you can stay at my house, I'm not going to charge you anything for the room, but the meal is $200. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to respond to that. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I think that's fair. Those are fair answers. I'm not sure how we answer that one too, but it's a good, it's a good point though. It's a very good question. Good point. Okay, next, uh, thank you for that. Uh, next on the list, we've got Gary Wilkins. We've got the number three. Okay. Okay, uh, number three, uh, Janice Lowe. Four will be Vince Urbanic, so if you want to kind of get ready, so we'll... Uh, easier to do the Monty Hall thing and bring the mic to you. <laughs> Let's make a deal. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Councillors. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Janice Lowe. I live at 7625 Green Vista Gate on the Thundering Waters uh, property. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you're working on these issues, and I know that it's uh, a, a long process. Um, we are very much against vacation rentals in our neighborhood. Um, but we do appreciate that where they are allowed by zoning or will be allowed by zoning and regulations, um, those regulations must be in place and enforced. Um, we purchased our home on Green Vista Gate uh, almost six years ago with the understanding that our community is zoned as residential and we are taxed accordingly. Um, we feel now that we should not be forced to accept changes to that zoning of our street that would completely change the environment of our uh, neighborly community. We want to know that the person living next door, and I do mean literally next door in the brand new townhouse that was just built beside us, um, is either the owner or a long-term renter, uh, not a vacation rental. I want someone who cares about their property there and uh, the community um, as an owner would. I want to feel that my grandchildren can play on my property knowing that there are not strangers renting on a nightly basis next door. 
this is currently happening illegally next door to us right now as an advertised Airbnb. Um, it's quite obvious with the suitcases going in and out and the fact that it was advertised as six parking spots where in fact there are not six parking spots so they are parking on the street. Um, no doubt there are more in our neighborhood. So please allow vacation rentals in areas zoned to tourist commercial only and uh, please help to keep our community and our neighborhood neighborly and uh, I really appreciate your, your concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got Vince Urbanic. If I've got that right. The next it will be uh, David Lowe afterward. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Vince Urbanic, and I live at uh, 7637 <coughs> Green Vista Gate, Niagara Falls. We moved here about four years ago um, to retire, and uh, we chose the location in Niagara Falls because for a number of reasons. First of all, it was somewhat removed from the tourist area. Uh, we, uh, secondly, we hope to kindle new relationships with uh, permanent residents and neighbors since we are uh, returning to a, uh, a new area. And uh, we also wanted to look for a place and be in a place with a safe and friendly environment for our retirement and also so that our grandchildren can explore the neighborhood uh, when they come to visit. Um, that will not be the case if every other home on our street or neighborhood is allowed to operate as a, a vacation rental. If so, we'll essentially live in a tourist area. We'll always have migrant neighbors. Uh, and these neighbors, we don't know if they have criminal records, if they're pedophiles, if they're involved in the sex industry, we don't know that. And we'll always be looking over our shoulders to see, um, um, to be wary of any strangers that are in the community. So it's not the sort of community that we thought we were buying into. Furthermore, I mean, with vacation rentals, certainly in our area, um, most of them are absentee landlords. So things like uh, garbage uh, property standards and, and garbage comes uh, issues. Personally, we live in a townhome. I think that's owns uh, residential R3. And allowing a vacation rental on either side of us, essentially, would be considered living in a, like a motel complex. And when we bought this place four years ago, it was, um, you know, it was a residential development, and we certainly didn't think we were paying a lot of money for a home that's going to be essentially almost like a motel with vacation rentals on either side of us. So I have a lot of concerns uh, about that, and for those reasons, I, I urge council not not to allow vacation rentals um, in any area that's zoned residential, and just to keep them all in uh, areas zoned either tourist commercial or or the such. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Councillor Campbell. Just a, a comment, Your Worship. Um, with respect to the comments made by the last two speakers, you realize that vacation rental units are not going to be allowed in residential areas by right. Uh, that's what the bylaws passed. It, the, we're not allowing vacation rental units in residential areas. We're allowing them in tourist, commercial, business areas. No, 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 I think I'm just making those comments, okay? Just, I, want, I wanted people to know that residential vacation units are not being allowed in residential areas. That's, that's what's being proposed by the staff report. So that's, that's where it sits right now, depending on if council supports it or not. Yes, uh, okay, so we've got David Lowe. My notes are very short. Okay. <laughs> Um, You'll be well received. It, it, it did seem, though, that there was comment that um, uh, individual applications might be made under a future bylaw for a particular property. Now, I just wanted to share some of the, uh, and this is anecdotal, but uh, uh, the property next to us, as Janice outlined, uh, is actively advertised on Airbnb at the present time. It's in, the re it's in a residential area. They advertise it as having six parking spots. And in actual fact, two of those parking spots have to be illegal parking on the street uh, in front. Uh, the very first night that, uh, that this was, uh, uh, the first night that there was somebody staying there, there was an argument on the deck at about 2.30 in the morning that roused more than one resident. Um, there is 
a potential for some degree of confusion if there's an opportunity for people to make individual applications. Uh, because I believe in our, by, our condominium bylaws, it says that people cannot operate something of this nature. But if it's passed that the city will grant uh, 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 an application on an individual pop, uh, on an individual property, then it's in conflict with our own uh, bylaws. But does the city bylaw supersede anything that's in the bylaws of our condominium corporation? I think that there's a potential uh, problem there. Uh, my wife and I have uh, uh, certainly rented through VRBO. Uh, and uh, Airbnb, so we know and appreciate the opportunity that that offers. But, uh, you know, the city, Janice told me I wouldn't win any favors by using the word culpable. But the city becomes somewhat culpable in this as well, in that what the city tries to do, and there were, uh, there were at least one or two prominent people from, from uh, this uh, council, who are at the opening of the high rise that's going at the end of Green Vista Gate. And we know that all of the units were eventually sold by um, uh, real estate agents from Toronto to people from Toronto. And part of the promotion that was put across them was that these were vacation property units. That was part of the promotion that was put out there. So uh, I just say there needs to be some caution in terms of, um, you know, trying to attract properties of uh, this nature in uh, as well. Certainly see the benefits in it, uh, but there are problems. Thank you very much. Yeah, before you run away, sir, uh, Councillor Cario. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, I forgot your first name. Uh, David. David, I just have a question. You were suggesting that it's illegal in your association for you or anyone else in your in your area to do this. I, I believe that's the case, Vince. In in our the bylaws of our condominium corporation. So has anyone taken uh, anyone to task so far to stop happening what's been happening? You know, it, it starts to get down to <coughs> sort of an ugly level because if we want to do complaints about uh, people and noise at two thirty in the morning then we've got to call the police. We've got to go through our condominium corporation and have them try to find out who the owner of the property is and they have a discussion with that person. And compliance is um, a problem. So then just for clarity then to Mr. Herlovic, so what's been happening, the Airbnb rentals that they're describing up till now have been illegal. And is that correct, Mr. Herlovic? What they're yes. describing. They're, they're illegal they're and illegal. it sounds like contrary to their bylaws. Contrary to our bylaws. So I think we should start, we should have, should have started the meeting by apologizing to the residents who've had to live near illegal BMBs and that has taken us this long to get here because it's really not fair. What's been happening has been illegal and it's been taking us quite some time to get to the point where we're going to address it. So we should start by apologizing I, I, to the I, residents. I just think that um, uh, as well, you, you need to be cautious that the impression isn't left that, you know, uh, the ability to make an individual application uh, can supersede uh, the rules yeah. of the corporation. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got uh, next up Joe De Palma and then uh, William Nobes, I believe, and then Olga Gersovic. Welcome. Joe De Palma, 7631 Green Vista Gate. I know you don't want to hear repeats, so I'm not going to repeat anything that we've already heard. Um, but I, I have to tell you, you two gentlemen have raised points that were unclear to me, because um, we are in a situation where there are rental units in our community, and it's seems to be against the law, against what we want. So my the reason I did make the trip up here is when would we see something like these illegal units shut down, action? Well, let's ask, uh, I'm not sure who over here, if that's going to be legal or planning. <laughs> Mr. Beeman, let's our solicitor. Maybe he so, can give us an idea. So far, uh, since Gerald came here, um, and he came to see me and we agreed on how these things were going to be dealt with. Um, 
we have been successful in closing every one we've gone after um, within a rut. There was one that I think took a couple of weeks, but most of them closed down pretty much as soon as we, as, uh, we started going after them. The, what was not done previously, despite any requests that we had, was that we notify any mortgagee of the property. Oh, sorry, the microphone's on. I you got to just lean into it a little bit, I think. Okay. We, we would notify the mortgagee of the property as well as the owner. Mortgagees are allergic to these things because, generally speaking, the fire insurance will not cover them if they burn down. So what happens is, as generally in these situations, the mortgagee will call the owner and tell the owner, you better stop doing it. Um, and most of them, at least so far, and that includes the, the uh, incredible mess there was on Bell and Drive that I waded into, but we're shut down in a relatively short time. That one took about a month because he was pretty, he was kind of a hard case. That's it. But most That's of them it. are pretty That's questionable. Yeah. So yeah. if you give us a complaint, we'll go after him. If the property's mortgaged, we have a real good chance on it. If it isn't mortgaged, then it gets a little tougher. But so far, I'm knocking on wood and I hope everybody hears that. The ones we've dealt with are mortgaged. And so that makes it easy. When you get one that isn't mortgaged, then it's a bit of a problem because actually proving the use, because you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and that can take a while to get the accumulated evidence. You've got to get the out-of-town license plates. You've got to find the ad. You've got to find a way to tag the ad on the owner because they don't put the addresses on them because they're not stupid. They know I'm looking for the address. And, you know, we've got various ways of getting the address, but, which I'm not going to reveal here. Um, and then we eventually track them down. But um, I think the, the, uh, the council should be, and I hear Councillor Carrio's thing, it took us a while to get to this, but uh, since Mr. Spencer's been on board, I think uh, you'll find we're one of the more efficient municipalities in getting rid of these things and uh, should be pretty pleased with the service you're providing. Thank, thank you. And nice gesture on the hockey sticks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next up we've got, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Iannone. Thank you. Three you, Mr. Mayor. Two, Mr. Beeman. I think what people want to know here are if I'm living beside an illegal B&B &B and we pass the bylaw that's before us tonight and summer is coming up, do we have the staff to shut them down before they're full for the summer? Because a lot of the phone calls I'm getting is, you know what, your May 2-4 weekend's coming up. Before you blink, it's going to be here, and I'm going to have people <coughs> next door to me in a BnB. and b So do we have the actual staff, if, this, if we pass it tonight, to start shutting them down before the summer months hit and the illegal ones are affecting the neighbors beside it? Beeman? Well, uh, there are, when we run the vacation rental uh, apps and try to find out, you know, just to see how many hits we get for the city of Niagara Falls, um, the last time we did one at a meeting I was at were 700 hits. Now, assuming that some of those are repeats, no, we're not going to be able to shut down 700 before June, uh, assuming anybody complains about them. Because one of the things, and, and I know Mr. Vaca is not here, uh, but one of the fascinating things about arguing about this with Mr. Vaca is that he has 200 and some clients and we don't know what one of them is. So uh, those people, have the, his clients have not been complained about because otherwise we'd be investigating. So it's, it, it will be a process to shut down that many illegal uses. Hopefully some people, once it's publicized that they are illegal uses, will shut down voluntarily. But it's going it's to take a long time to shut down minimum 200 no, land uses that. yes we so only have four officers okay thank you very much yeah. Okay. yeah i just i just don't want anybody to leave here thinking that should we should we pass the bylaw tonight and know your next door neighbor's not allowed to have it that come me to for weekend it might not necessarily be an immediate fix for them so, yeah we just need some teeth to start with okay next up okay so we've got william nobes did I say that right? You did. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Will, I go by, no, uh, 4703 McDougal, so just up the street here. And uh, I've attended all the public meetings. Um, you know, I think this is a very important subject that the city has, you know, finally starting to address. Uh, and I think the proposals uh, that are before you guys tonight, uh, and ladies, I apologize, is uh, is a very amicable agreement and would be fine, you know, to maybe not satisfy kind of both sides of the coin here, um, but definitely provides a, a middle ground. 
there are a couple of things I noticed uh, just from the proposal I wouldn't mind some further clarification on. Um, and, and one of them kind of just discussed here is really like the repercussions uh, that would be put on to the owner of uh, an illegal vacation rental. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd love to see that um, as part of the criteria, if somebody was to request rezoning for the specific reason of a vacation rental outside of a normal planning use in the future uh, for that application to be by owner occupation uh, as well uh, and I know that there was uh, to be legal uh, a license does have to be issued by the city uh, but it didn't say how many applications for licenses can be made on one property and who those can be made by. Uh, so whether it is just the owner of the property or say it fell under, uh, say like a multi-owned conglomerate, uh, if each person could then subsequently apply for a license uh, if one got revoked. Okay, we can uh, ask our uh, director of planning and or legal. They want to jump. You're going to jump in that one. Uh, you can you can wait at the mic if you like, just till we get our answers. Yeah. Okay, so we're not going to let anybody. Uh, we're we're going to run into that, and you do run into that, and and I've dealt with it in taxi licenses and things like that. You just don't let them do it. You know, if the guy, you know, the guy wants to give it to his, wants to circumvent you with all kinds of nifty ways of. You know, eventually trying to get this essentially the same person still operating the business, but he's got all kinds of friends and stuff like that. Yeah, there are some guys who are real enthusiastic and they'll waste your time with that stuff, but you eventually get them. But it, you just have to be persistent and keep after them. Um, as far as uh, uh, penalties, what we're proposing is to start a system with administrative penalties, which at the moment the province are six to five hundred dollars a pop. Um, those, the reason why we like administrative penalties is the cost to the municipality of enforcing them are a lot less and you can get them done quickly. And essentially how an administrative penalty works is the other, the, the, the onus is more or less reversed. The, the licensee has to, has to convince the little tribunal that he didn't do what happened. Now if we get a guy who's a repeater then we're going to, it'll be my advice, that we then start charging them and the fines can be up to $25,000 for a first conviction when I've done this type of thing, when I used to prosecute in St. Catharines, what I would propose for the fine was exactly what the fellow advertised the thing was for rent for. So if the idea was if I could prove he'd had it rented that weekend and he made 1500 bucks, then I'd fine him 1500 bucks with the, with the surcharge. If there's a 25% surcharge, the fine, he'd pay us 2000 bucks, so he's short 500 bucks for the weekend. Now that was a hell of a disincentive to continue doing what he was doing. Um, when you get the absolute, you know, total hard rock guy, then you go for injunctions in the superior court and you get court orders telling them to stop. <coughs> there aren't, you know, every municipality seems to have two or three guys like that and you just live with them. But uh, they, by and large, uh, most people get the idea after their first ticket. Did that answer your questions? Uh, you I guess for the, for the most part, yeah. Um, if I could just, just maybe like follow up with one comment and uh, uh, it, it is truly about, I. I believe in uh, keeping these vacation re rental units outside of our residential areas. Um, you know, that's that's the part that's impacting the communities uh, and the lives of the people that live in Niagara Falls full time. Um, and I know all of you on council uh, appreciate the residents because we're the ones that put your name on the paper. That puts you in those chairs, and Why don't you, do it again? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, we we want to be here to do that. Where where the transient population coming in for the weekend is not going to be able to do that for these guys. Um, so, just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, next up, I've got Olga Gursevic, and then Linda Manson, and then Angela Collins. Hi, I pretty much agree with everything the previous speaker said. Thanks. Um, I just, ha and 
at the beginning, I was totally against vacation rental units, but I find all the work that everyone has done, I really respect and can agree with so many of the changes that are, are being proposed. But I do have a couple questions or concerns moving forward from what you are proposing. One of them is basically about the whole accountability and enforcement of all of this. You can't put in these changes without having the staffing in place in order to put this through. And this is going to cost money and this is hiring people. And you can't just tell us, well, we've passed the bylaws, it's gonna take time. And then we have to wait two years for all of these illegal places to be shut down. And in your appendixes, you tell us that in, in this, in your uh, proposal, that if someone applies for a license, but if they are continue to run their vacation rental unit illegally, then that they will not get approved. But how are you going to enforce that? Who are, like, do you have the people to enforce all of this? I think what you're proposing is perfect. It's great. It's on the right track. But I have some serious concerns about how long it's going to take. And in the meantime, there are hundreds in this city and a lot of people who are being inconvenienced by the neighbors and these transient people coming and going and the messes and the noises. And I, nowhere are you telling us how this is going to happen. I like the cost, I like the process that you're saying, but are we going to be able to do this? Realistically, is the city going to be able to put this into place? And I would like you to make sure that before you pass these, you budget for this and that, because um, I know you're saying you're going to collect the money, but you're not going to get the $1,000 uh, a license until you can get the staff to get out there and, and license them. Is the fire department going to be able to get out there and inspect all of these places if all these people actually want to apply? You're, like, it's, you're, you're going to be inundated with applications. Well, there's no doubt there's going to be a lag, but I'm going to let our CAO address your question, Olga, or well, that first part of your question. Okay. Just the one thing on the staffing, and what I would encourage the Green Vista people, yourself, if you have an illegal Airbnb, VRBO next to you now that is bothering you, you have to call in tomorrow and just lodge that complaint with our bylaw department. The first key is that we need to know about it. As Mr. Hurlovich or, or Mr. Beeman Warman said, there's several hundred out there that quite frankly we have not had any complaints about and I'm not sure even neighbors know they're operating. Those are the ones that perhaps will take more time getting to but the ones that people know about and they're a bother today, call in and get your complaint in and those will be the ones that will get right on. As Mr. Uh, Beeman has said, we've had pretty good success on dealing with the ones that we've had complaints about. But we need to know the ones that are being bothersome right off the hop. So I suggest that to you, the people on Green Vista. The only other thing I'd say to the people on Green Vista, I don't know who your property manager is, but uh, I've got some experience in condo living and uh, your, your property manager to me should be the one that should be investigating this and following it through with your, whoever your lawyer is for the condo court and, and trying to enforce your bylaws and that would be some advice I'd leave with you. And just before, uh, Councilor Cario. Just come. another quick one, Your Worship. All of our emails are on the, on the city's website and many of the complaints that were passed on were passed on by residents or neighbors emailing us and then we pass it on. So uh, if you email the complaint to the city, our emails are there too and uh, we would probably like to get a copy of the email of the complaint as well. Great. Okay, I'll spread that around. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one other concern. When you say that um, when you consider a specific zoning bylaw amendment when people apply to have a, a vacation rental unit in their neighborhood, in their residential area. You say that undue concentration on one block or street will be taken into consideration. But what kind of assurances will we have that, you know, if it's a three block street and there are two applications, but they're on either side of my house. <laughs> and you'll say, oh, well, it's fine. There's only two on the street, but they both are on either side of my house. Like, the people up the street from me won't care, but I'm going to care because they're on either side of me. Like, will I have a chance uh, when the zoning bylaw uh, comes up for amendment or when they're proposing to request it? Will the neighbors be, will that just, like, will there be a public notice? No, I couldn't find that anywhere when I researched. I wanted to make sure that that was going to be clear. I'll get Alex, uh, Mr. Ilovich, if you can answer that, please. Yes, through you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, excuse me, the speaker would have the same opportunity she has tonight. 
So she would receive, let's say it's on either side of her, she's within 400, those, that use is within 400 feet of her, she would get notice mailed to her, advising her that there would be a meeting before council, it's intended to be a vacation rental, come out and have your say, um, and she, if she thinks it's great, she can come out and say so, if she thinks it's a bad idea, she comes out and says so. Uh, similarly, staff will have its report, similar to what we had tonight, um, and anybody else could come out uh, and object as well. Um, as well, properties are required to post a sign on their properties, we issue those signs. Uh, you probably have seen them say public notice or big blue letters. Um, so even if you don't get a notice, you live next door, I think you're gonna see the sign. So uh, we pretty much want that to happen. We want people to come out. That's the way council gets its information it's from the public. We circulate to our departments. We provide a staff report. And weighing all that together, council is going to make a decision. Uh, and it, it will be council's decision. Is one on either side of you too many? Um, it, you know, you're a good speaker, you probably convinced them that it is. I probably will. <laughs> okay, oh, perfect. Just got one more, uh, Councilor Crater. Oh, like great, great. Councilor Crater? Um, just a short question. I just sure. want to follow up on what you were saying. We passed this tonight. The one section says you can't have them in residential areas. Right. So then there's, Alex. So if, if that is passed, then no one can make an application to have a vacation rental in a residential area. Is that correct or not? That's not, that's not correct. Right. And I knew, I knew what the answer was. I wanted you to know. I know, I know that. So, some people, I've I read was, it. I was watching okay. some of them. So you can't stop someone from coming to the city hall and making an application for something. In this case, they want to put into a tourist area. What we can do, and, and we had a bit of a discussion, and Alex was explaining what we can do is try to ensure that we put a lot of very strict conditions on someone who makes that application. And then the other factor is, in, is what we've just been saying is if all those applications, if people do decide to make them, and there's an expensive fee to make these applications, you just don't walk in and fill out the paper and you now apply to have a vacation rental in a residential area where the cost could be three, four, five thousand dollars to make the application. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things you have to prove that uh, someone who's making it. Um, and then the council, and you heard it, then we have to hear the application and we're gonna make a decision. Everyone who's in that area, you just heard it all. I wanna make sure you understand this. We can't stop somebody from making an application. They have a right, that's just how the system works. I mean, a person who come in and make an application living beside you to say, I want to open up an auto body shop. <coughs> well, you know it's not going to get through, but they can come in and make the application. That's the predicament that, that we kind of run into. We can't just say you can't make the application. We're just trying to make sure that it's a fair process for you to protect you. So I just wanted, to, I want to thank you for bringing that forward because I was watching some of the people and I didn't think, I think they, I think some of them thought we can just say, no, you can't make an application. We're not going to accept it. Even though we say, you can't have it in residential area. They can still come in, but the odds against them, and Alex said it, the odds, if you did that, probably not going to get it passed uh, by the council on the day of the time. So I'm sorry to take up your Oh, mind. no, she no, that's perfect. Ten minutes left to speak <laughs> oh, I don't want 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, just one other quick thing, though, and I know this is slightly down the road from what you're trying to decide tonight, but once a home anywhere gets the permission or the thing is passed that they are allowed to have a vacation rental unit down the road will that change their property assessment and increase their taxes will they be included in this eventual uh, destination tax that you're going to collect from hotels when you're deciding that is that going to be part of the, that discussion down the road I hope that I don't need an answer now but I hope well, we'll that becomes a consideration we'll get you something. I'm not worried about the people speaking it's the councillors by the way they're the one <laughs> I got to put a 10 minute limit on the councillors speaking so, uh, Mayor, uh, so one of the things we will be doing is we will be noting MPAC, which is the property assessment. If they determine that there needs to be a reclassification of somebody's assessment, which the assessment then is applied to become tax, that'll be up to them to set whatever that change might be. Um, our building and fire will be involved, so they have to meet all building and fire regulations. We haven't uh, really talked about how much more we go in terms of you know notifying you know mortgagees and insurance and all that but but we're going to be uh, as 
open as we can to identifying people. Uh, the other thing we've talked about is actually posting these on our website so that people would actually know, you know, what the addresses are uh, so that, that they're well aware of ones that have been through the application. And even if somebody has applied for rezoning, uh, they still have a licensing component. So you may get the rezoning, uh, but if you have parties there every night, uh, you may not get a license renewal, and then that becomes a licensing issue and an enforcement issue. So just because you have one doesn't mean it's going to be in there in perpetuity, depending on how you behave on that property. Perfect. That's what I want to hear. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Linda. Linda Manson. And then I've got Angela Collins after, and then Whitney Hark. Planning has done a great job uh, uh, in, in all the... Uh, I think many of the things that I had put down, including insurance and the various things, um, I'm just concerned. It, I'm learning about compromise lately. And it's, it would seem to me that if we were to absolutely look at a, a made in Niagara Falls solution versus taking some of these things from other places, why aren't we taking a look? We, tourism is our business. The tour, why aren't we looking at restricting these to the tourist area right now? See how it works out. I looked at the maps. There's a lot of area. There's, you know, if you look along, uh, you know, um, where, where we have the traditional B and Bs, and if you look downtown, you look out on on Lenny's Lane, you look along Victoria. <clears throat> I'm more used to talking about environment and beasties, but this is a case of environment too. Only I'm the beastie this time, and I've been living in a neighborhood where we've had evictions. Five, six. We've got we've got numbers. Pick a number here. We, I think we have 10 of these illegal operations on two streets. We've had, um, and, and Will was so eloquent in talking about voting you. I, I would like to say, I would, we, the residents of Niagara, would like you to vote for us tonight. We didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't buy in a residential area to become a tourist area. And there's a huge difference. We, we, we are entrusting our future. I think planning has done a magnificent job. Why can't we just keep it to keep it to the tourist area, and 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 and, and tourism as our business? Make that part of it. You know, instead of extending it out. And and believe me, um, I have enough of a science background to know that chaos is the natural order of things. And so all of these laws were necessary, but to open this chaos out in the community believe me you people that don't have it yet i can see toronto tomorrow million dollar homes mortgage come down here think they've died and gone to heaven by three three places sit in toronto you know i read with great interest one of the letters online from the lady across the street whose house we've taken 50 five old pictures of until the garbage exploded out the back and the rats are running around the neighborhood with their raccoons and she had the audacity to say, my home is up for, <laughs> I want to share my home. I don't even know where she lives, but now I know her name. Um, but it, it really is, it's a, it's a wonderful idea to have the laws, and I just couldn't be more appreciative of the work that's gone into it. But why can't we make a made in Niagara Falls solution? Keep it to the tourist area. There should be a lot of places. It seems to me the only other reason for expanding it right now would be to cave into the squatters in my environment. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Yes, just further to that, Your Worship. Um, despite the fact that this has still not been passed, anyone can come into your neighborhood by right, by the laws of the province of Ontario, to make application for a change of use. Anybody can still do that. They could come in and, and put in a garage, ask to put in a garage. We wouldn't allow them to put a garage into that neighborhood. What we're trying to do is get something in on paper that we can run the, the the operation of these rental units with some form of organization. No one, I don't want to see anything in a residential area. I'm telling you right here, nobody wants to see it in a residential area. But we're, we can't restrict it because it's a, it's a right as it stands right now. 
And that's the love of the province, not ours. Thank you. Okay, next up I've got Angela Collins, then Whitney Hark, and then Betty Ann Buck, I believe. So is uh, Angela Collins here? No, Angela Buck. She left? Okay, thank you. All the questions were answered. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, next to uh, Whitney, is Whitney Hark here? Hart. Hart, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, oh, my name's Whitney Hart. I live at 5090 McGlasham. Um, the first thing I want to say is I'm not a public speaker, so don't let that distract you from my points. A lot of these people are really good speakers, um, but please just listen to some of my points. So myself and uh, several other hosts have created a Niagara Falls Airbnb Association. We had our first meeting on Saturday and we discussed a lot of the benefits and risks and everything else that we could think of that we wanted to bring to the table and there's several of us here. Um, we want to be a voice that connects hosts with the city. If there's anything you guys have questions about, you can come to us, we can come to you. So we do want to be able to bridge that gap um, and neighbors as well. We are on Facebook. Um, if anyone wants to contact us with questions, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, we do want to work with the city to legally run our businesses um, as long as they coincide with our interests as well. A lot of people have focused on a lot of the negative things, but there's a lot of positive things too, and I would like to take some time to mention that. Um, the first thing I want to say though is um, times are changing. Technology is driving this change, and we can't, and I know another host here wants to speak about this, but we can't be using old rules and old laws to, to try to regulate this. Um, I'm sure at the time when the automobile was uh, introduced, there was a lot of people would have been here at the council meeting, and they would have been um, trying to protect their businesses associated with horses. It's happening now with manufacturing, um, there's change, there's a lot of people who are protesting that. And here with Airbnb and uh, other like um, platforms, there's change. And I think Niagara Falls needs to embrace that. And uh, the residents need to take advantage of it too because there's a few reasons why we should. Um, one, I did some research, I looked at Stats Canada um, the Niagara, Niagara Falls medium household income is one of the lowest in Ontario. Um, we make, on average, less than $28,000 per individual. And nearly 3,500 people did not work every year over the last few years. One third of our jobs are part-time only, and obviously we're a tourist city, so half the year there's some people who are unemployed or underemployed. There's several benefits for allowing this for residents. Um, obviously, the extra income will allow low-income families to do some things maybe they weren't able to before, such as move into home ownership, or pay to go to school, or pay for their child to go to school. So there's a lot of people here. Of course, there's voters who are voting you in. Um, but there's a lot of people who aren't here today who aren't speaking, so I'd like to mention um, some of these points for them. Um, so Airbnb provides the opportunity for a new industry and that's jobs in the Niagara region, such as photographers, professional people who can take pictures of our host space. Um, STR consultants can emerge. I'm not making this up. This happens in New York. It's all around the world. I've done my research as well. Um, cleaning services, landscaping, renovations, all these are jobs that um, are there. They're ready to be developed. Benefits for the city, tax dollars, so we can regulate this and have, have us tax. Think about Uber. Uber has introduced the tax into their platform automatically, so the driver doesn't, doesn't have to um, pay tax on top of what they're making. It's automatically put into the system and then you can just give that to the city and pay your tax dollars. As I mentioned, it opens up business opportunities, uh, more, more tourist dollars, to be spread around to other businesses. Hotels have had a monopoly on tourist dollars for too long. No one said anything about that. Restaurants, other small businesses, I'm sure have suffered for that because all the tourist dollars are going to the hotel room. But at least with Airbnb, with the lower prices, um, tourist dollars can be spread around. It's more egalitarian. Um, we can be known as a world-class city that supports short-term renting to world guests. I'm sure that'll bring in more people here. And um, 
Mr. Mayor, I th if you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe I remember you saying we need about 30,000 more rooms to meet the demand for tourism. I think the answer is here. I think City Council doesn't really have to do the job to try to figure that out because there's people here who are willing to open their homes up to guests. Um, I want to say that us hosts who do rent, we know the risks involved um, in neighborhoods and which is why we think definitely we need to be regulated to some degree. Um, we should be able we should be able to have guests come into the home, but again, if there's parties, definitely there should be some kind of um, fee or something if we're not following the rules. However, over regulation and over licensing and high fees can make the whole business risky for both hosts and guests as well. I'm almost done, I know my limit's coming up. Um, so I, I mentioned this story at the last meeting that we had and I stayed at an Airbnb in New York and the host who greeted me was not the person in the listing and the address wasn't the correct address. She gave it to me while I was about an hour away. So over-regulation will drive this underground. I, don't, I think now that people have had a chance to have, they have a taste of having extra income, maybe up to $10,000 a year. Um, if this is shut down, they're not shutting down. They're just gonna make this a little harder to find. Um, so overall, I think there's a misunderstanding of who guests are. Of course, there's been some bad guests, um, but the hundreds of people who stay here every night, I'm, it's pretty quiet. Not everyone knows they're even there. I think that we've really, uh, some of us are really focused on the fact that um, there's going to be these empty houses in neighborhoods, that there's just transient people coming and going. But most of us, we actually live on property. So you do still have a neighbor, one that just has a lot of friends come and go. And I believe that is it. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, uh, Councilor Morocco, you want to comment? Um, yes, Your Worship. I just want to make a comment. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, you know we need to get into the future and look at the way things are now changing and evolving, especially with Airbnbs and Ubers, and we've all talked about that. And and it's our um, mandate to try and regulate that. We're not going to make Uber go away. We're not going to make the Airbnbs go away, the vacation properties. We're not going to make them go away. Our job is to try and regulate them. And to me, if our residents are coming to us and saying, I don't want that vacation property in my subdivision, then what we're trying to do is make it a safe environment for our residents that they want to feel comfortable in a place where they bought and they want to have long-term longevity, longevity and you know, raise their children and have their grandchildren. So that's fine. The Airbnbs, vacation properties, they'll be, it's going to be tough to try and you know, put them in one area when you look at these maps and see. And, and they're all over the place. I don't think we're making them go away. We're going to try and regulate them. We want to make sure that the neighborhood is safe and we want to stop them from going into the neighborhoods. There, there's lots of land out there in Niagara and they can go somewhere else and they act, actually, before they go there, they have to come here and apply. So we're just trying to make it that we're, we're actually trying to control where they go and um, that they're not going to disrupt. I mean, we've heard the stories of in a neighborhood where people were like 15 people in a house just crazy stuff going on. Drunk people knocking at three o'clock in the morning at the people's house next door, waking up their children and just being disruptive. Like, that's not where you want, and we don't want that for our, our community and for the constituents that put us here. <coughs> so I just want people to know that we are really trying to make sure that we do the best for our community, and we're gonna work on it. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I just wanted to say that I think that we're really giving it a good shot, and I want to thank staff for where they are. And it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to try and make it the best possible uh, conditions, better than what it's been. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cario. Uh, just a quick comment, you were By the way, your presentation was very good. Um, I'm not against Airbnbs at all. I'm, I'm uh, not against them. I just want them to be in the right area, in the right spot. Um, I've got more complaints and more calls, the more emails about this particular problem in residential areas than I've got on anything else ever. So um, I'm not against them. If we can put them in a place, if they can go in tourism commercial, uh, commercial, uh, whatever, 
Uh, I'm all for it. I'm all for all the benefits that you described. They're all things that we want in our community. They're all things that businesses bring to our community and I'm pro-business. When I opened up a factory, I put it in the industrial area. When I wanted to go into the tourism business, I went into tourism commercial. I didn't stand up and like and say, if you don't do it the way I want, I'm gonna find a way to do it around the whatever rules you happen to put in. So that did bother me just a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got next up, Betty Ann Buck. Is that right? Is there Betty Ann? Am I saying it right? Oh, there's a delay out in the hallway. It's kind of funny. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Wow, really? So Betty Ann Buck, I guess, has left. All right. Uh, Ross Taylor. Already answered. Oh, great. See, I love that. Isn't that great? <laughs> I love you. Got that man a donut or something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Florence, Florence, I'm Nick, Nick I or something? No, yeah, okay. Pardon me? Oh, it's been answered. Oh, you're wonderful. You're sure about that now? Okay, good. Next up, Marcel LeBlanc. Yes, Marcel LeBlanc? It's waiting for the echo out in the hallway. I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, what's that? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Nomi Jackick? Nomi Jacek, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. My Sorry. dad spelt my name wrong on my birth certificate, so. <laughs> <laughs> I've been living with it ever since. <laughs> so how, it's Nomi? Noemi, yeah. Noemi, okay. Yeah, Noemi Jacek is gonna go on record forever. Um, okay. 4733 Cookman Crescent, um, and I'm just gonna blaze through my points. A couple of them have been said. So um, um, uh, one of the things, I've just been doing a lot of research on both sides. So I wanna thank you for listening, and I love everything that's been said today. I've learned so much, and it's been such an eye-opening experience. Um, one of the things I heard uh, coming uh, up over and over again is this uh, idea of accountability, and um, how do we keep, like how do we have enough staff to like, monitor these Airbnbs and stuff, and um, um, there actually is a way that uh, neighbors can keep their neighbors who are hosts accountable. Um, so if you do a quick Google search, uh, Airbnb neighbor complaint, um, uh, Airbnb and VRBO has an email, but Airbnb has a link where you can actually go in and comment. So let's say the, the people are being loud, or let's say that somebody uh, is advertising falsely, or let's say somebody is actually running an illegal Airbnb. Um, that can actually be reported, and Airbnb will shut that down right away. Uh, which is really great, um, especially since the, pe the people, let's say for example it's a party and the host didn't know, that those people will be penalized right away, which is good. Um, and also Airbnb has this code of conduct that each person who wants to rent has to accept. And that means if um, they accept, yeah, I'm not going to throw a party, and they throw a party, they can be evicted right away. So the host can come in and say, get out, you broke the rules. So that's really cool because that way you can have action right away. Um, and that's not to negate what's happening with our, our, our team here who have been doing an incredible job. Uh, Ken said that he's been shutting down all the, the, the 44. They're doing a great job already. This is just if you want action right away. That's something that can happen. You can right away go online and do that as a neighbor. So neighbors do have a lot of rights. I think there just needs to be more conversation and more education in that sense. Um, um, especially with the false advertising six parking spots. That's crazy. That's a lot of parking spots. <laughs> um, oh, so um, one of the things mentioned was that um, every renter needs to sign a code of conduct. Um, uh, again, I think that's a little redundant because when I've gone on Airbnbs, uh, when I've traveled, um, I've always had to click that I agree with the terms and conditions. And so as long as uh, whoever comes in to the council and says, I want to run a vacation rental um, uh, a, a, a home or room or whatever, um, as long as they put the regulations of the city into their posting online, then uh, all renters immediately uh, uh, will click to yes. In order to rent, they have to agree to the codes of conduct. So you don't really need a signed piece of paper because it electronically will be signed. Sorry. So. Um, that's just the one point that I thought was a little redundant with the whole um, Airbnb signing the code of conduct. Um, something already mentioned was the income, uh, so that's really important. Um, I'm a student and a mom, uh, so uh, I don't know if my husband thinks I'm pretty. I don't know why he's paying for all this, but uh, long story short, he has a lot on his back, 
And we were doing the calculations over the summer and we were like, it really would help. It would, even if we only rented our Airbnb for 60 days throughout the year, the extra income would really help us out. And so this isn't, you know, we're not money hungry or anything. I, I just, I can't raise the kid and go to school and work at the same time. And so uh, that's, that's one thing, the, the income really helps. Um, I've heard a lot of stories about, um, um, you know, renters from Airbnb or VRBO that were really difficult. Um, and I, I do think that that could be the extreme, uh, those can be extreme stories. I remember when I was growing up, I didn't grow up in a really good neighborhood. Um, and I kind of found this out one day when I was like pulling on my mom's shirt. I'm like, mom, we live in like such a safe neighborhood. She's like, why do you think that? And I'm like, there's cops here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, I learned very quickly that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're living somewhere or renting from a place or vacation rentals, you're going to have some people that cause trouble. So um, I do agree with restrictions. I think those are very, very important. Um, I do believe in accountability, um, but I also don't have a lot of money. I, I agree with you. I know that, um, I'm sorry, I can't see any mic, I think. Um, I know you said that when you were, had an industrial business, you were going, you bought in an industrial neighborhood. Yeah, um, uh, I don't have that kind of money to do that. I kind of work with what I have. So if I can't afford to purchase a house in an industrial neighborhood or in a Jewish neighborhood, I'm going to work with what I have. Um, and I'll try my best to do it within the, the legal parameters of the city. Well, I mean, I have to do it within the legal parameters of the city. <laughs> um, and so I just think that um, to keep monetary costs as low as possible would be a huge, huge benefit to Niagara Falls residents. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's like a couple thousand dollars is a really big deal, especially if there's not like um, a payment options available. You know what I mean? Because a two thousand dollars is a lot, or one thousand dollars is a lot, but it's manageable if the city has some sort of a payment plan. Like, okay, let's say you start making this much a year, we'll take this percentage until you pay off. Things like that. Just a small suggestion, and um, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I had to blaze through to keep it within the time bracket. Hold on one sec. No, yeah, yeah, my, my only point was that when I did that, I meant I opened the business legally. So right. I bought it and I opened it legally. Everything I did, I did legally. Right, that makes sense. And most of the cases where we have the complaints, the business were open illegally. Illegally, yeah. Uh, Councilor Iononi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the speaker. <coughs> Maybe through you to Mr. Herlevick, because I just want to make this clear. You said you have to work with what you have. Mm -hmm. And we had this discussion in the back room, so I want people sitting here to understand it the same way. If you run an air, if you open an, a vacation rental, I won't say Airbnb because I've used VRBO myself and Airbnb. So, but if you open a vacation rental in a residential area and you are owner occupied, they can come and get licensed. You're asking me? I, I'm asking maybe through you, maybe through you so. to Mr. Okay. I believe that is the case, but Mr. Herlovich, to rent uh, a room? Well, well no. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have to be zoned for a bed and breakfast, which is our River Road area. So if you're anywhere else in the city, you can't do it unless you've come in and got site-specific approval. So for a B and B. For a B and B. So if they want to be an Airbnb in an owner-occupied home, because I remember, I understand everybody's concerns. I mean, we're getting the emails and the phone calls every day, but I remember at the community set at the Gale Center at the public meeting, somebody asked you, how many complaints have you gotten on owner-occupied Airbnbs? And your answer was none. So I think people left that meeting thinking, if I am an owner-occupied Airbnb and I have been operating, and I remember there was a senior that spoke and said, this augments our, our old age pension. We're owner operated, we've been in operation X amount of years and you have never had a complaint on my property. My neighbors don't really even know we do it. So if you haven't, what are we doing with people who are owner, presently, owner occupied Airbnb that have never had a complaint, does this, does this change in a residential area? Does this change, does, if we pass this, does this mean they can no longer have that. 
they have to come to us for an amendment. They don't have it now. I don't know what you mean by Airbnb. Okay, Air, vacation Air, rental. Airbnb, okay, thank you. Vacation okay. rental, so, better generic. Kind okay. of like granny flat, we'll right, go right, with okay. vacation rental. Yeah. So, so vacation rental, no, they can't do it. We allow, you know, council passed zoning bylaws for 16 properties since 2002. Those are the 16 properties that can legally rent a vacation rental unit. Okay. Everybody else is doing it illegally. Okay, so I misunderstood the, the conversation we had in the back room then. No, I didn't? No. So what am I misunderstanding? If, 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 they're, if she is owner occupied. She's in, a B and b So she's not gonna call it vacation rental, she's gonna call it a B&B. &B. So it's semantics. No, she lives there. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. Oh, you don't? Well, okay. then, then... You don't live there. You don't live there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's my situation, so Okay, folks, we're going to all have our turn. Okay, I don't want to... Don't... So, so if they live on property and they're renting out two rooms, through three rooms, two rooms, whatever the seniors, the, the senior who spoke was renting out one room. But if they are renting out up to three rooms, they are not calling themselves vacation rentals, they are calling themselves B and B's. And if it's owner occupied, it can be in a residential area. Am I understanding that? The does that, does, no. Our, our recommendation is that anywhere, That's what they said that we would, we would, yeah. We would, where our recommendation is, and if council adopts it, would be we'll add in the zoning bylaw in any residential property, you know, in R1, R2, R3, the, the, the whole list of them, we would add a bed and breakfast as a permitted use, up to three bedrooms. Okay. So if you have a house and you live there, right. you could rent three bedrooms out in your house. In a residential area. In a residential area. We're just calling it an Airbnb, not, I'm sorry, if we're not calling it a vacation rental, we're calling it a B&B. Correct. The difference is you live there. Okay, but there are, air, there are people that operate vacation rentals who are calling them vacation rentals right now and live there and rent <coughs> out one or two rooms in a residential area. So they can still do that after this. They're just called uh, uh, Airbnb. Uh, but they have to be zoned. Here's why don't we do this? No. I'm going to ask your CAO to sum, sum it up. And I'm no, sorry, I don't mean to confuse it. We had the conversation back <coughs> and I thought so, I understood it. So, any resident, any residential zone in the city, if you live there, you can apply to be a B and B, and you're allowed to have up to three bedrooms rented out on a short-term basis. If you do not live there and think you're going to run an Airbnb VRBO, you're coming in for a rezoning. It will not be permitted. That's all. That's, right. That's exactly. Right. And so I just want to point something out. And so in order to rezone or an apply apply for a BNB, how much does that cost? Because I was told something about six thousand dollars, which I can't afford. Right here, uh, Ken. That's about. That's about right. Oh. Yeah. So my husband and I couldn't afford that, so instead of being able to move into our home that we bought, he has to keep on working in Toronto and we have to do a long-term rental. And so it, it sucks that, like we don't have the money, but if it was a lower cost, then that would have been doable. Yeah, it's a fair comment and I brought this up in our, one of our council review meetings that it's prohibitive for a lot of people, it'll cost you between, you know, it'll cost you upwards of $10,000 for a rezoning application, just an application. So it is, it's expensive. That is expensive. Yeah. So that's for a vacation rental. Right. That's not for a B and B. So if I decided to live on my property, which we were planning on doing once I finished school, we still can't afford it because we can't go through like, that's a yeah. lot of money. No, no, so what? There's yeah, confusion. So, as soon as, as soon as oh, it's only a thousand. Yes. Oh. As soon as you live on the. Property, if I live there, but now that I don't live there, it's six thousand. Or more, depending or more. on. Or more. On what other okay. professionals Next. you may want to engage to come and plead your case, but the, it could be it could be up to that. The thing is, as the other lady indicated, is that you make an application. It gets uh -huh. circulated to your neighbors. There's a public hearing here at City Council. They're going to weigh the evidence in front of them, and they're going to make a decision. Even by spending the six thousand dollars, there's no guarantee you're going to get get what you want, right? So, 
Uh, well. When you talk about the cost, the planning people will tell you that there is a process, there's a circulation process, there's advertisements in the newspaper. Every other person that wants to change the use of their property from R1 to R2, or they want to build a garage where there's no garage permitted and it's a rezoning, they all have to pay the same amount. So it wouldn't be fair to give a break on just an Airbnb when other people that are coming before this council are paying $6,000 a month as well. Right. Every, 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 every time. Like, yeah. so, and I would say that uh, those fees are based on pretty much a cost recovery. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up, uh, Adam, Adam Ain. Is that right? And then next uh, after that will be James Black and then Mariah Kasmer. Okay, it's all Hello. yours, Adam. Thank you very much, Honorable Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me um, in the audience. I, I, um, I had no idea uh, how evil Airbnb was. Um, and uh, I'm, again, like last time I spoke, uh, willing to plead ignorance. And this was very eye-opening to hear the, uh, the other sides, the views, um, all the issues that you guys have put forward. Um, and I thought when I was coming in that I would just read my letter, but I'm realizing that maybe my letter is out of this world. Um, it's, maybe I'm out of this world, I don't know. But I have a completely different view, and I hope you guys who are against Airbnb uh, will still love me for it, because I'm, I'm your neighbor. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read it. I might, uh, take a few things out because they might be too radical for everyone, but, um, okay, great, great. Okay. So, uh, my, my tag is accommodate, don't legislate. And, um, I was talking to somebody about Turo, if anyone's heard of Turo, it's a company that allows you to rent out your vehicle, however often you want to rent it out. And I thought, yeah, another great way to accumulate a little more wealth because we need to. This technology could also enable a person to enterprise if it was viable. Numerous vehicles for rent. The reality is, the world is changing. We've addressed that already. Technology is allowing all walks of life to enterprise in all kinds of ways. Government, public servants should be there to accommodate the changes in order to properly serve the public, not regulate something to death so that they can be comfortable while killing an industry. The puck is going that way, and especially being a world-class city that we, we are, um, I see that the world is going to want to have this, and um, I'll keep going. Um, the puck is going that way, so let's not regulate the ways we regulate now or in the past with things of the future. Apps like Airbnb is something that has enabled people to travel to our world-class city that otherwise wouldn't and spend their money here in exchange for a unique world-class adventure. The future is that even less economically abled people will be able to travel here. So what are we gonna do? Perhaps neighborhoods in the future will contain families that are there on vacation from a different country while the parents are on their job wirelessly and their own house is being rented out in their own city. The thoughts from the past would be, I'm not having something like that in my neighborhood but the thoughts of the future and new generations might consider that past mindset absurd. One of my main points is this, as Niagara Falls is the world-class travel destination that it is, considers the ramifications of this future, we, including all of us in city council, should definitely be thinking ahead and thinking radical. Imagine Niagara is known for being a world-class in having a variety of unique places to stay. Imagine it gets in the papers internationally, becomes marketed that the governing bodies of Niagara have embraced and supported the world coming here and let Niagara inhabitants be a part of that world-class adventure while here. When I was in Rome, I stayed at a place with a host who had five places and I definitely got that feeling when I was there. They allowed him to enterprise. I was a little confused by the last meeting we had because there were some things that weren't clear. Um, I didn't know if we were meeting because there was a problem with these vacation rentals or better breakfasts. Again, I'm, I'm ignorant. Um, because if we were, then it seemed like the problems were parking on the streets, partying, and excess garbage. Could be a couple of more, but 
I had a simple solution for that, and it's pass a bylaw that makes parties illegal in vacation rentals, bed and breakfasts, whatever else you want to term it, with a fine boast to the guests and the host, and the problem is solved. There's no more parties, no more parking problems, no more excess garbage. All the while, you're supporting the people of Niagara Falls and allowing them to enterprise without killing it. People need to enterprise here. If City Hall continues to kill enterprising industries, then what good are we doing in the end? If parties, excess garbage, and parking wasn't the reason that we met, then I'm a little confused, although I heard a couple other things this, tonight. And I think that uh, anything else uh, that could be analogous to a doctor who sees a cyst on someone's arm, obviously there's a cyst there, that needs to be removed, and he starts yelling, get the saw, we need to chop the arm off. You see, that's not wise. Uh, friend, fellow neighbor, and government workers, the letter that uh, this meeting actually did raise a lot of questions. Actually, I had one question, um, and I think it was addressed, but I wasn't totally clear. If, you ha if you're living on site of a residential house, do you have to pay a rezoning fee of $7,000? Yeah. Yeah. You have to apply for B&B &B because you live in the house. Okay. For a thousand dollars. For a thousand dollars. Could could we not ask for a little bit lower than a thousand? Well, the renewal will be five hundred. It's just the yeah, first year. Because we have to have the fire department win. Uh, all that stuff helps you. Yeah. Uh, it did. It did sound a lot like uh, the heavy arm was coming down on a potential amazing opportunity for Niagara Falls that would be crushed. It 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 sounded like that to some of us. And uh, I'm sorry uh, for the people who are, are, are loving the fact that it's coming down that way. Uh, it's just how I feel about it. Um, anyway, I, uh, I will, I'm not sure how it goes, but if there's unreasonable um, uh, rezoning uh, for enterprising individuals, people that want to do it well, people that want to do it right, if there's unreasonable licensing fees, which I think it's just my opinion, but $1,000 seems uh, kind of high. Um, that um, I will probably, people who want this in here are probably going to speak again on it. And uh, I do appreciate everyone's opinion. Um, I just don't see that um, a, a few seemingly small issues, maybe I'm wrong, uh, could warrant such a large policy change or policy change. Uh, um, that, that is strict, that doesn't allow a new market to come in because I think we, as Niagara Fallsians, I think that's right, Niagara Fallsians, I think we, I think we need it. And uh, the, it sounds like the regulations are, are too harsh. And I, and I know that no one wants neighbors that are partying. No one wants uh, like unexplained incidents and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I hope we can work towards something that's that's a little more lenient. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, I have James Black, and then uh, Mariah Kazmer. Hello. How are, how's everybody doing? Great. Good. Sorry, a little nervous <clears throat> and dry. Um, first off, I'd like to say that you know I'm a father of four children. After me and my wife had our our fourth uh, our child. Um, we needed to come up with some sort of solution to bring in some extra money because daycare just doesn't afford uh, her working. It just doesn't make any sense. So we worked very hard. We did a, a few investments and we purchased a, a house in a certain new subdivision down on Drummond and McLeod Road. That's currently where we're situated. Uh, currently to date, we have about 600 guests booked into Niagara Falls um, from now until the end of the summer. Uh, you talked about getting this kind of shut down before the May 2-4 weekend. That being said, I think I have five nights available in June. Uh, six nights in July and about two or three in August. So I think you kind of missed that boat um, going forward uh, with all the pre-bookings. I do not live there. No, we purchased this as a, a vacation. Yeah, excuse me one sec, James. Yep. Yes. James, on the analogy you're using, if this bylaw goes through, those nights aren't going to happen. Right. You don't live there. Right. Okay, I just wanted you to understand. No, that's, that. that's what okay. I'm, I'm just trying to explain my situation that 600 people are going to have to cancel their trip. They're not going to be coming down to Niagara Falls. They're not going to be spending their money down in, the, in this area. Um, they're not going to go to all the local restaurants in that, in that surrounding area to spend money, which I'm in the food service industry, and I do talk to those chefs. I do talk to those restaurant owners, and it does help. A lot of uh, 
groups of eight to 10 people that are staying at these Airbnb vacation rentals um, travel to these local restaurants like a Strata West or a, you know, they order from Gambler's Pizza because it's down the road. It's really giving a lot of extra business to them. Um, I think we're a tourist city. I don't think we're a, a commercial tourist city. I think we should look at it as a whole. I think if you allow an Airbnb in a certain area, it should be allowed throughout the whole city. Um, the, the, you know, to the point someone made about someone knocking on a door at three o'clock in the morning and waking up children. Well, there's children that live over on Epson and by River Road as well. There's families that can only afford a certain uh, house in those areas that can't afford the Thundery Waters area. They can't afford the St. Michael's area. That's all they can afford. So how are they penalized because they can't afford a nicer house in a nicer residential area. Niagara Falls as a whole should be a residential area no matter where you live. Um, so that being said, I think you should not limit it to anything. I think it should be a one or all. I'm obviously for it, but if you sat here and said, you know what, Airbnb or vacation rentals are not for Niagara Falls and you shut them down completely through the city, I would bow my head, I would put a for sale sign on my lawn, and I would look for my next investment. I don't think it should be restricted to certain areas because there's family that live in all those areas. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Mariah Kazmer, is that right? And, and then Guy Pace, and then Sean Hyde. Yeah. Okay, so my name is uh, Maria Kazmer, but don't worry, everybody oh, Maria? says Mariah, no worries. Okay. Um, <laughs> considering changing my name legally? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, I live in, uh, currently in Fenwick, uh, but I've until recently lived in Niagara Falls. I uh, own a couple properties in Niagara Falls, and uh, I am a supporter of Airbnb and those kind of platforms for various reasons. Um, a, I am a host, as well as I have been a participant in those platforms by going to Toronto and other cities uh, throughout the world. Um, there's many benefits that were cited, not going to reiterate those again. There's many issues that were cited, not going to reiterate those again as well. I just want to ask a few more questions for uh, a few of the hosts that are not living on property. So I, I think there was a lot said about the, the uh, hosts that are living on site. Um, so I had a few questions about the ones that are not living on site. Um, what is the, uh, basically, what would be the process or rather um, uh, with those hosts and um, more so I have some concerns with regards to that um, is why are uh, hosts being on site so much more different than them being not being on site. Uh, for example, I also have a home that's permanently rent uh, rented throughout the year. Um, I have never received noise complaints. However, that could quite possibly happen. Um, I know all the neighbors and all the homes that I own and they have personal contact of me. So if there's ever any issue, they will get in contact of me, uh, with me. Uh, however, what would be the um, <coughs> repercussions if if my permanent tenant were to have noise or um, uh, other kind of issues that have been cited, and how would that be different than having a temporary rental situation? Uh, for example, I cannot kick my permanent <coughs> resident for being loud or having parties. I, it's her home now, uh, even though she, she pays for it, right? But uh, I can kick, however, the ones that are temporary residing there because that's still my home. <coughs> so if I do receive or, or the police receives a notice of noise complaint, I feel that that is easier to resolve than uh, you know, permanent tenants. I could understand that you know, to, uh, when the host is present on site, uh, they would also not want to be woken up at 1 a.m., just like you know, neighbors wouldn't. Uh, but I feel like it would be similar kind of control being that we're owners of the properties and we do not want to have issues and our business being shut down, just like with any other business they would be, right? Uh, so basically my questions would be, uh, what can we expect going forward uh, for those hosts that are not present? Uh, is it possible that we can have a manager present on site to live on the property? Um, is it um, that we can have for example, rented only through a certain amount of time in the year, uh, what kind of opportunities can we be granted to be able to, to afford to have a business like that in Niagara Falls? Okay, uh, Mr. Hurlovich, <laughs> you keeping track of all the questions? I was trying. Sorry, I, I can that's okay. help. That's okay, if I missed one, I'm sure she'll remind me okay. of that. Um, so so I, I think, you know, her, uh, you know, her points are uh, that, you know, we've been supportive of the owner 
living on the premises as being more acceptable and um, because there's a responsible body there and if there's noise, they will shut the noise down. Um, her point is um, she doesn't want trouble either. She want, doesn't want her uh, investment destroyed. So similarly, you know, she will make efforts to shut the noise down. I'm not quite sure how long it would take her to drive from Fenwick to Niagara Falls to do that. 30 minutes. But 30 minutes. Um, so, uh, but, but that's one aspect. And that would be the point of the recommendation that we had was that the owner's name be published on a website so that people would be able to contact the own, owner if she was off site. But again, this is, you'd have to get, a, you'd do it site by site. If, let's say this lady was successful, her, her name and number would be published on our website. You live next door, it's noisy, you call her at 3 a.m wake her up and she drives over here and shuts them down. Um, the, um, you know, so I certainly get, she doesn't want her property destroyed any more than anybody else wants the property destroyed. Um, if there is a manager living on site, we have that situation now with bed and breakfast on River Road. Some are owner occupied, some are manager occupied, but the manager sleeps there. That's not quite like what we call vacation rental unit which a lot of people have been calling Airbnb, which is I and my family rent a whole house. We rent top to bottom. There's no one else in there. There is no manager uh, living there. So uh, I'm not quite sure where the manager would fall in in that particular situation. If the manager is there and you're just renting a couple of rooms, that would be a and b uh, because that would be the proprietor uh, of the building. Well, if the the uh, basically if the manager is not the actual owner, as stated on the uh, document uh, title of the house, however they they're living in there, would that be a, a preferred situation to obviously the owner not living there, but kind of a middle ground between the two points? If you're renting rooms, that would be probably <coughs> acceptable within the terms as they're drafted. The language is not that tight that it would. Right. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's a responsible person. It's the same as a hotel or a motel. You know, there's front desk staff at a hotel that if there's a noise, you know, in the room next to me, I don't go to their room and knock on the door and say, keep it quiet. I call the front desk, the front desk sends somebody up and they tell them to keep quiet. Um, similarly, I, you know, the motels are the same thing. There's a manager on site who would be responsible. So again, a bed and breakfast with the manager on site and the couple next door is having an argument, I'm trying to sleep, you know, I get in touch with the manager and they take control of the situation <coughs> for my own security as well as that of the, everybody else and the, and the facility. <coughs> so the manager, the owner, those are all anal analogous to the hotel and our tourist accommodation. So that has been acceptable in the past. Right. And then the other question that I have is, um, how can we find out information about what are the acceptable areas um, to f for zoning, uh, for example? Um, which areas would be permitted um, manager or owner-occupied rentals and which one not specific? Well, if it's, you know, and Cause they're all if, if you fit in residential. that definition up there of bed and breakfast, means a home-based business license to provide guest rooms, traveling public, and it's the principal dwelling of the proprietor. Our recommendation is it would be allowed in most single and two-family residential okay. zones. So let me rephrase that. So which ones would, would be possibly allowed if you're not residing on the property as an owner? That would be a site-by-site -site cases, pay your $5,600 and take your chances. Right, so, so basically the, the city is against, that's what it, it seems like uh, with the high cost and uh, the... I don't know what council is going to decide, they haven't made a decision yet. Seems yes, like. Councillor Campbell. I, I think the answer she was looking for is if you want to have a vacation <coughs> rental, it is allowed in the tourist area, it's allowed in a business area, uh, it's allowed in an industrial area. What's considered a tourist area, maybe that's, that's tourist my... Commercial. Tourist commercial. Is there a map of some sort? I'm sure that there's a map okay. on, the web, on our website. There, there is a map, and we have maps here. I can give you one. 
Can I have one too, Chris? We all have one? Well, no. there, there's a limited number tonight. So you're all welcome. This is all available on the website too, folks. The, okay, so I've got to I've got to keep this moving along. We still got a. Thank another, you. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Guy Pace. Is Guy here? Okay. And then Sean Hyde, and then Garvin Walker. I got one request and two questions. Um, Mr. H, the TV cut out out there when you started making the distinction about Niagara Parkway as opposed to the River Parkway um, and agricultural something. I don't know what you're trying to get at over there and how it would apply to rezoning. Um, so that's, if you can clarify that, I'd appreciate that. And I believe Mr. Todd mentioned in great detail, um, and you did, sir, about uh, public notices and when someone does apply for an application. Um, I'd like to know what the process is when there's a complaint. Is there a follow-up to the complainer? Is there some sort of a no notice on the house? And also there was mention of three strikes in your route, if I got that right. Um, who's out, the applicant or the house? Valid question, because going back to legal, I mean, there's a lot of crafty people that can circumvent. And, um, and my last question is enforcement. Um, currently, I believe property standards is nine to five, Monday to Friday. Most of your violations will occur Thursday night to Sunday night. Um, will their hours be changing? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Levich. Okay, so the uh, basically within the Niagara River Parkway, we were recommending the same rules as we would have for a residential area. So um, a three bedroom, bed and breakfast, that is the owners in the residence, he's renting out to, up to three rooms, would be allowed as of right um, on, in the Niagara River Parkway, so from Chippewa down to the town line. Um, and so it's a three, a, a B and B. They can re-register as a, or rezone I as, it was a, four. as a, as a, uh, the grandfather ones are four bedrooms, but the new applications will be allowed six guests, three bedrooms. Correct, for a bed and breakfast. The owner is the right. owner proprietor is living in the building. He's renting out some rooms. Right. He's going to serve breakfast, whether you eat it or not, it's up to you. But that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the nature of the business. Okay. Um, and that was a recommendation for the agricultural area as well. Vacation rentals, where you go out, you and your family rent the whole farmhouse, that would not be permitted as of right. The owner of that property would have to come to this council, ask for permission, and council would decide whether or not to give that to them. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what your question was about how public notice is given. We give that out. Well, public notice, there is a public notice if there's a new applicant. It's going to be on your website, according to Mr. Todd, that the new applicant has uh, applied for a place. But what happens in the violation process if, in fact, people are notified? If someone calls in, um, right now the way the process works, if you report an illegal operating vacation rental, um, you just deduce that there's less traffic than the following weekend, that somebody has dealt with it. It would be nice as a courtesy if the city got involved and returned a courtesy phone call or an email or some sort of dialogue with the person that complained or the peoples that have complained. It would just be nice, yeah. right? Yes. I mean, so we're helping you do your job. Right. I assume that was happening and if it's not no, happening, sir. and I take take your word for it, I, I will certainly speak to my staff tomorrow morning and say we've got to call them back. I think Mr. Beeman outlined that we've had good success yep. with using the mortgage companies, and so as soon as we get that notice that they've shut down, then you should have been notified, um, Mr. Brace. We your complaint has been heard. They were shut down as of you know December or April the tenth. Um, so I'll, I will speak to staff about making sure they get back. Thank sometimes you. you don't hear because it takes, not everybody is responsive, it sometimes takes weeks or months to actually get them to shut down. 
Um, the uh, enforcement hours, I don't know when they will change. I do know that our uh, manager of enforcement and uh, his boss, uh, our chief building official, were meeting with uh, Ken Todd er, uh, late last week and certainly outlining the, uh, the program by which there would be a rotating schedule and we would have one enforcement officer working Saturday and another working on Sunday. They would rotate. We have currently four and uh, we have a program that's drafted that would allow that to rotate through. Um, so staff would get, still get their two days off a week. Um, they're not always going to be Friday and Saturday anymore in that particular job. Um, to be honest, the way it cycles through, they might end up actually with four days off, just so you know. But there will always be somebody working Saturday and, and, uh, and Sunday once we implement that new one. We've but just, just got, one person is, is in the initial stages right. of the We plan. only have four people for the whole well, I understand. So. That. I know that part. Yeah. Um, and will future funds be directly attributed to enhancing SF if the number of complaints go up? We, and, and don't misunderstand my, my position is I, I do understand that the economy is evolving and yeah, we got to go this electronic route and that's right. all fine and dandy. But you know, most of our violations are, do occur from long distance or the outer towners. I mean, the people that are um, owner occupied or have, don't have an issue with it's It's the outer town people that come here and park a bunch of cash, open their doors to weddings and the whole nine yards and that's a problem, right? right. But the, lo the locals that are doing it, uh, support them as long as they abide by the law. Right. Thank right. you. So, but we do need greater enforcement uh, than one person. Because yeah. NRP are run thin as well, right? right? Very, very thin. So um, let's use their lack of judgment to make a better one here. Okay. Perhaps. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so next up we've got Sean Hyde. Sean here. Wow. And then after is Garvin Walker, and then uh, then uh, some Michael Miller maybe. Okay, welcome. Thank you, sir. Four six nine one River Road. A lot of questions been answered, but the main question is false accusation. How are you going to deal with that one? So people complain on you, not true, trying to get rid of you. You got a lot of bad people in this city. How are you going to know, difference the, the truth from fiction? So do we have any uh, experience from our enforcement where it's just a bad neighbor trying to cause problems? or? Oh, that happens every day. Yeah. I have no idea what the speaker's referring to. But, <laughs> oh, but, really? But He's I got funny. some neighbors don't like me. Oh, okay, we're going to complain on you. You got noise, there's no noise. Well, there's garbage, okay. there's no garbage. Okay, so somebody's, somebody calls and says, there's garbage in my neighbor's yard. He's got an old mattress rotting and it's full of rats. So I get this complaint every day. He's making noise. Um, People running around naked. I'm <laughs> well, when yeah, you come, there's nobody. Right, right. How are you going to deal with that? Right. So we, so we no, it's just an example. Because right. you know, people do come up with fictional ideas when they don't like you, they want to put you out of business. You said three strikes, you're out, right? So I can really go watch myself. Right. So, so your worship. <laughs> Our officers go out there and they investigate whatever the complaint is. If it's a mattress running, uh, lying in the backyard, they take photographs of that. We send out letters. We say you've got to get that cleaned up. We give them a num number of days in which to get that cleaned up. You know, if it's a mattress, we give them five days. You know, if it's a yard full of mattresses, we probably give them two weeks uh, because that takes a bit more time. Um, if it's making too much noise, um, typically the police are involved, but you know, if we get something, we have to go down. But you know, the noise is usually, it's like any enforcement, the noise is stopped by the time our people are there. Um, so a little bit to the last speaker. We're going to have one guy working Saturday, and he's going to be down you know, in Willoughby looking at noise, and we got a call from somebody up in Kalajura Estates, big party going on, too much noise, it's after 11. Yep. So if the yep. noise is stopped by the time you get there, I mean, I don't get a ticket. <laughs> it, it could <laughs> be that. That's what you're saying. But, well, it could be that, but then it's not a bad, false allegation. The noise is just stopped. No, uh, it's a point I'm making. So <laughs> I, I don't know what your point is. If you made noise, you're guilty. You stopped making noise, congratulations. But how do you know I make noise? 
You just said you did. It could be a false. It could be a no. I said it could be a false accusation. Somebody said I was making noise. You come, there is no noise. So who are you going to believe? Well, you know what it is. The complainant it's be, or me? It's got to be evidence based. We're not yeah. going hearsay. But now, take the video phones, right? Everyone oh, takes yeah. video of what's going on. So it's not too hard to capture what's really going on. All right. On. And All that thousand bucks, I think, is too again. high, too. Thousand dollars is pretty high. Well, you know what? That's the initial fee. And it's got to be cost recovery because we're hearing everybody saying. You, you need got four more guys on staff. But you need more enforcement. Bucks. You can't have more enforcement without the money. So that money's going to go directly to enforcement. I don't so. I know I'm going to get more than four guys for my $1,000. Well, that's that'll the be point up. I'm making. Well, yeah, that's you got good. four, right? You're going to rotate, like it says, maybe four off, three on, and I'm paying $1,000. Yeah. What am I getting for that 1000 A 1000 times how many people? Yeah. Well, that's in the market with other municipalities or twice that price. So we feel it's in the market. And okay. We have the council to make that final decision. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up, uh, is it Garvin Walker? Do I Garvin Gavin? Walker. Gavin. Okay. 4597 Eastwood Crescent. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll get in a lot of trouble for my speaking my mind, you know. Um, I find most of the, the people that sit on this, and these chairs that's making decisions, a lot of them never went through hardship in life. So coming up with a thousand dollars is just win out your mouth. What about the lady there who draw the example of she couldn't afford this and this, you know, babysitter and all these type of things. Personally, I figure five hundred dollars is really it's acceptable. You're making a um, Take, take for instance, now you're saying that you report anybody who is doing the Airbnb illegal. How would you know that it's illegal that they're doing it? Are you going to go and ask them? Are you asking the question? Yes, I'm asking. Are you going to ask them if they're doing Airbnb illegal? Well, we'd have you know, to ask our enforcement people. If you want, let's get an answer to your question. So how do we do it? If a complaint comes in, what, what happens? So th this is a real example. You know, we had a, a complaint you know, on one of the crescents in behind uh, Betty's restaurant. So Sunday morning, our you know, enforcement officer dro drove out there, knocked on the door. Some guy came to the door and they said, do you live here? And they're going like, no, we're just, we're just renting for the night. Uh, well, who's we? Well, just me and some buddies. You know, we, we wanted to have a drinking party, and so we didn't want to go out and have to drive afterwards. So we rented this place, and uh, some guys came from Hamilton. Uh, you know, I actually live in the falls, but you know, I wasn't going to drive home late at night after drinking. Uh, but you know, how did you know we were here? We were really, really quiet, because the driveway was full, the street was full of cars. That was the complaint. There were cars parked all over the street, and that was, was winter, it was hard to back out with the snow banks and cars parked on the street, so we got a complaint. The guy admitted they rented it, that was the proof that we needed. We wrote the owner a letter and said shut it down. Uh, as, we, as Mr. Beeman outlined, fortunately there was a mortgage on the property, we wrote the port mortgage company, they don't want their place destroyed because they don't know if it's a party, it could be, you know, Walls punched in, doors broken, uh, fixtures smashed. So the, the mortgage companies have been our best ally to date in getting these shut down. But we walk, walk up, we knock on the door, the people admit it. We visit the property, no one answers, we record the license plates. Um, those are all parts of documenting what's going on at the property. Well, you know, <coughs> Niagara City is a city that it's developing. The, the economy needs to develop. Airbnb is just a one form of way of developing the economy more. Take for instance, I'm 65 years of age. I get a pension of $566, CPP of another 519. How far can that take me? Wouldn't I need some extra income? Most of you guys there can afford it. Most of you sitting in that chair can afford it. But you don't think about the small people. You sit on your chair and you make a, you, 
you make a bylaw. Charge them this, charge them that. You don't think about the average people. We are the ones that have you sitting there. Why overall uh, a statement? If I buy my house, why should you tell me what to do with my house? Look at the property taxes. Everything is going up. This is a city is about to blow wide open. It's about to blow open, but you know what? But we Canadians, we like to hold it back. We like to hold back. We are so behind. Compare us to the States. If America had this, you know what would have been going on? You know how much money would have been turning over? The average person in Canada here, the average street person, cannot play with any kind of a money to spend freely. You go to the States. There's many ways the average guy could pull in an income to spend. But you guys sit there and make uh, bylaws in order to control the people. Not the economy, you're controlling the people and they're spending on everything. And you talk about this one making noise, that one. Any city that is developing, you will get noise. Look at how many... Uh, so, sir, are you in favor? I just need to know where you're coming from. Are you in favor or do you have a question? I'm in favor of what? Are, are you in favor of what we're yeah, I'm here. You're in favor of... Of yes, the recommendation, or are you not in favor? No, I'm in favor of uh, rezoning uh, the, the A and B businesses, right? I'm not in favor of paying an arm and a leg. So you're referring to the thousand dollars? Not only that, I, I, different points I'm making, but the the thousand dollars is a lot. Of course, it's a lot. It mightn't be a lot for you. It's a lot for me. Okay. As I explained to you, my income. Yeah. If you had an income like me, what I'm, I'm sitting in your chair, how would you respond? I understand. That's why we're trying to get, some, get some answers. Uh, Councillor Campbell, you had yeah, a comment? Thank you, Your Worship. But I'm not speaking for anybody else around this table, but 40 years ago, my wife and I bought the house that we're presently living in because it had a basement apartment in it. We could not afford to buy the house without the income from the basement apartment. So don't tell me that I haven't lived a life working my way through things. I still live in that house. And you know what our plan was? When we got enough money in our pocket, we would get rid of the apartment. Well, we found out we really liked having that extra mark money, and so we put an addition on the house. And we still have that apartment in the basement. So, you know, a lot of us have grown up here in Niagara Falls and we've been through things, we've grown through things. So don't paint a brush uh, across all of us. Thank these, you. I, I said most of you, these times are changing. <laughs> these times are changing. You, how much can a hundred dollars take? How far can a hundred dollars take you if you go? Thank you, sir. Okay, next up I've got, I think it says Michael, is it Michael Miller? Is, it, is that right? Yes. Yeah, and then after that, uh, is there a, Marianella Morales, is that right? How many more speakers do we have? We've got nine more, Councillor. Nine Ooh, more. You're in trouble. I'll talk fast. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to make sure the next people are, are lined up. So Marianella Morales and then uh, Jane Sir Luca. So you're all set, Michael. Good evening. The comments have been very interesting. One of my comments on this, I live in a neighborhood that now has two Airbnbs in it. We just found out that the neighbor behind us is selling their home, sorry, they bought a new home so they can turn their current home into an Airbnb because of the money. I bought into a neighborhood that is very old, very established, and very well formed family homes. I now have one beside me where every Friday at five o'clock when I get home from Toronto where I commute to afford my house, it's a crapshoot what I'm getting. I've had some very nice people. I've had people with screaming kids all weekend long. I've had drunks. I've had groups of very drunk women that we actually phoned the police on who were very nice to show up and then call their friends to show up and chat to the women. <laughs> so, so much for calling the police to help us out. All the neighbors were watching this outside <laughs> as you went to this, exactly. The girls were in the hot tub, they were very drunk. This was two o'clock in the morning. I get up at four to go to work. My response the next morning was to knock on the door 
They say, I'm leaving for work now, have a nice day. <laughs> I agree that Airbnb is the way of the future, I use it. I don't agree that they should come into established residential neighborhoods. If you want it, fine, have it. I will probably rent from you or recommend my friends rent from you. But I do not want to wake up to have someone crawling over my fence because they kicked a ball into my pool. And that's the stuff that happens when people do not live on the property. I love my neighbors, even the ones who have the Airbnb. They're fabulous, but they don't live there. And I said, you've got to come here, spend the weekend, and see what we go through. So on a Saturday night, you get five or six drunk guys smoking up, having a party. Well, that's lovely. I still have to get up in the morning. So Airbnb, yes, it's coming. VRBO, it's coming. But don't give it away for free. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Okay, next. Oh, thank you. Uh, next up uh, is Marianella Morales. Is that name ringing a bell here? Okay, I guess not. Moving along. Jane Sir Luca. No, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, that was my outside voice, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> Jeffrey? Jeffrey uh, Chapman, maybe? Is it? what it says yep okay and then after that Brian Keenan hi I'm Jeffrey Chapman um, live at 6187 Main Street uh, it's a block from the uh, Falls View Tourist District um, the one thing that I've, I've been to the meetings and the one thing I see is consistent is Factions of people, whether they're uh, vacation rental hosts who rent out one room in their house, maybe they were a retiree trying to pay off extra income, uh, maybe they decided to do that because they're tired of having a sociopathic roommate. <laughs> uh, they might be the ones that are renting an entire house. And then we've got uh, the people that are pro uh, rent, month to month rental people. We've got the people that have the bad neighbor. I bought my first house at 18 in the city. I have always had a bad neighbor in every place I've had. The people that have vacation uh, rental properties as a bad neighbor have not had a renter next door. They would pray to have a vacation rental host back after they have a renter with an absentee landlord, with the nightmarish type of, of, of tenants you can have, the damage they do. Uh, the one thing, everyone would have these sort of narrow points of view and it's consistent with every meeting I've been to, it's consistent with this one. With the counselors, you're probably just hearing complaints. You don't hear about the good vacation rentals. Uh, at the last meeting, someone said that there were 200 vacation rental units in the city and 16 licensed ones. What does that say? That says that there's something wrong with the laws and the legislations. It's comparative to the Cannabis Act. For years, they, the government fought the cannabis situation. Now they're embracing it. And what a difference it's going to be. It's be, be it's, I feel it's going to be like being in the States in the 1930s when prohibition uh, to be alive while this, this all happens and see it. My grandmother would, would have saw the, the, the prohibition lifted in the, uh, that time period and what, what she could have related to it. Um, I don't see that this should be passing. It is not ready. I don't think I've heard anyone understand the parameters of what is going on here. Uh, they're, they're only looking at their unique aspect in a little pigeonhole. Um, I've been a homeowner. I own multiple homes right now. Um, I've been a landlord. I had a small apartment building 30 years ago. The Tenancy Act was a nightmare. Tenants were a nightmare. The Tenancy Act today, someone would 
to be a landlord, you would have to be insane or a masochist to be a landlord. The, the laws that they've created for the, the rights of the tenants play, uh, remove the landlord's, the owner of the property's rights at all. Uh, in between two of my properties, there's a beautiful old Victorian house. Uh, it was a rental unit with three rental units in it. Um, the landlord rents the ground floor apartment to eight guys. One had a job as a dishwasher. That sounds like good tenants. So of course, when he kicked them out for dealing drugs, the last night they were there, they broke into the three houses beside them, including mine. Then they came back two weeks later and broke in again. You're talking, I hear complaints that I can appreciate bad neighbors, but the group that are here complaining about bad neighbors are scapegoating vacation rentals and blaming all this stuff on vacation rentals as opposed to an incident. It's, it's are the bylaws being enforced? Are the police coming out to be called? How many t rental properties in the city in comparison are happy with that? How many homes, owner-owned homes, do, are the police called out for? Some uh, domestic situation. How is that comparable to, to vacation rental? Why are they not being regulated at this meeting? Uh, there's very pigeonholy things. I've, I've been a landlord. I have vacation rentals. I have vacation rentals beside me at four properties. They are far better than they were when they were owner occupied. Because being a vacation rental, they have to be manicured. The owners are in there all the time. They're having the yards done. It's like they're first, you're putting your house for sale. It has to be in top shape. Otherwise, you're going to get negative <coughs> reviews and you're going to be out of business. Because the, the, the vacation rental business sort of regulates a lot of its own with uh, you're just going to get a bad reputation and you're not going to be able to rent it. So Jeffrey, you're saying, just because our times... This is not ready. There's problems in every level. The definitions don't cover it. The zoning bylaws make no sense at all. Uh, zoning and in commercial, uh, tourist commercial. I go to Dunn and Falls View Boulevard. How many three-bedroom homes are there? None. It doesn't make any sense. The people who are renting these are primarily families. You get extended families, so you have three generations coming on a reunion trip. Most of them are families. They, they can't afford to go and rent four hotel rooms at the Hilton, put their kids in one room, do that, and spend $700 a night. And they want to spend the time together. You get certain ones that are, might be the rowdy ones, but you could have that same rowdy in a regular rental, and you're more likely to. Uh, the definitions of, of the are limited and wrong. Where, where is guest house? Then you've got uh, the fees of re-site-by-site the applications looking at maybe ten thousand dollars per application and the, the total. Somebody has two. That's twenty thousand dollars. Would it be better in their interest to put twenty thousand dollars for a flip of a coin, whether they get approved or not, or invest that money with a Toronto lawyer and fight the whole thing? How many people do you have in your group? You know, thank you. It, it, it doesn't make it. It is not ready. People just don't understand it. The trends right now. Uh, Niagara Falls has a history of starting things when the trends are over. <laughs> the trends are the people are the people are moving out of the big cities, and moving into surrounding areas. We're becoming a Toronto suburb. That's from bringing the GO train, bringing the, the GTA airlines here. Um, we're also becoming cottage country. Because Strata Vista condos were sold as vacation homes. Instead of buying your $2 million home in the Muskoka, 
you come here and buy this one for 500,000 a little box. But I was at the first meeting for that and I, my response was, finally, civilization is coming to Niagara. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Brian Keenan, and then we got John Pinter, then Car Caroline Meyer. I will ask him. Yeah. Folks, I just ask, uh, as you're coming up, if you could please not repeat, um, just give us the new stuff if you can. It's all here, all new. Okay. Okay, my name is Brian Keenan, I live at 3813 Potter Heights. So I just need some clarity on some math here. How many vacation rentals are there in the city right now that you guys know of? I don't have a number. Throw me one, 350, 500? Sure, somewhere between 300 and 500. Let's go with 250 okay. on the low end. 365 days in a year. 91,000 stays, vacation rentable days in this city, but we had 44 complaints. 91,000 days. And that's a low gas, we went low. My point here is, this has to be addressed, it's tourism, we're a tourist town. So the whole space has to be addressed. Hotels, motels, and rentals. And so, I'm hearing like, you've had complaints, and you've had complaints, and you've had complaints. We're not flowing the information through the system. We're clogged here. We're clogged at the neighbors. These guys, they're your counselors. Those guys are illegal and bylaw. You gotta go to them. I'll give you my number. I'll shut the house down in an afternoon. <laughs> bylaw doesn't want it. These guys don't want this. We have the tools in place. We have noise, we have parking, we have garbage. We're putting another bylaw in effect. We already have three. All the complaints you're getting are all the three bylaws that we're not enforcing. Why are we putting more bylaws out? It doesn't make any sense. Like, let's take the bylaws, the tools that we're given, take our four guys, and let's get them out there, get them working on the bylaws. The guy who's running the, the, the house, and I don't have any in Niagara Falls, I have one in Alkaville, New York, in the ski town. Population 500 on the weekend, population 20,000. They have no issues there. It's regulated, they watch it, and bylaws everywhere. So what we have to do, and I agree with Jeffrey, like we're not ready with this bylaw. Like there's a lot of challengeable things on this and I'll, I'll just run through a, a few points. So you spent a year on this and you said, and if I quote you wrong, tell me, it's increasingly popular over the year, over your review period. And of the 44 complaints, how many of those were zoning complaints? Because we're trying to issue a zoning bylaw to, create, to stop vacation rentals. How many complaints were zoning? Well, they would all be complaints against zoning because they're illegal they're uses. Illegal, illegal, illegal. No, how they're many illegal. how many phone calls came in saying this is a zoning? I'm I'm calling you because this is a, this is a vacation rental. How many came in as a zoning complaint, or how many came in because Buddy had naked women jumping over his fence? How many? <laughs> like we have to clarify what we're trying to stop here. Are we trying to stop a zoning issue? Or are we trying to stop the parties? I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah, when you've got a bunch of questions, we'll answer those. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, so that's that's my big thing is if we're not getting zoning complaints, then why don't we enforce what we're actually what the problem is? Let's go after the problem. My next thing um, is you're saying that the banks are agreeing with you guys and shutting them down. Banks lend on cash flow, okay? So I have I have homes not in Niagara Falls that are vacation rentals, and the bank like on my next review is 25 million. The bank lends on cash flow. They don't care the use. And North Blenheim and Young's Insurance both have policies now in in the works for vacation rentals. Okay, so the insurance companies are on this. Like this is a global trend. This isn't like new to Niagara Falls. This is global. So financial industries, insurance companies. All, it's, all they're doing is they're just changing the way they do it. They might say put 35% down and lend it as commercial lending, but they're still lending. Like I can, I'll send you credit agreements or you wanna see the, the wording, but they're not shutting the guys down. Um, so I've covered the other bylaw. Benefits. So the negative stuff in these people here, like when I walk out that door, if you want help, I'll help you guys. Because you, should, you shouldn't have to live in fear in your neighborhood. You shouldn't. Financial benefits to the city. Furniture sales, lawn maintenance, painters, plumbers, internet, electricians. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, if I show you my phone right now, I have a bunch of student rentals in St. Catharines. I got building permits on all of them. 
And the cleaners are already calling me because I pay them $30 an hour. Where do you get $30 an hour to clean a house? So husband and wives come in, they go clean five or six houses in, in three days, they make themselves a quick $1,000 and they love it. The people that we have to hire in vacation rentals charge more than minimum wage. And if you want to get good ones, you have to pay more than minimum wage. Like I have so many, like the girl here who has going to school, I have like 30 of those on my phone that just say, I just need to make a quick $500, can I clean one or two houses? It's, it's such a benefit for the economy. Um, okay, licensing. Some of the things that you guys want to do is publish names on, on a, a website and phone number. If you did that to the owner of a house and there was ever an incident, you are liable. Like you cannot release a citizen's inf private information. Like you're not publishing where pedophiles live or where criminals live, but a guy who owns a vacation rental, you want to publish it? If he was to even get struck once by an angry neighbor, the city would be sued. And you can, I, I, have the, I took screenshots of the court cases already that's gone through Toronto. Um, the next big issue you have with the housing is you guys are trying to say six people per three bedrooms, okay? And you can check this, like legal can check this, but the Supreme Court's already ruled that six unrelated people can, can rent a house. So I can go with my brother-in-law or somebody else or a best friend. If, if we arrive at a destination as a group, you can't discriminate on the number of us as long as we're within building code and fire code. So if I show up with, if I have seven kids, you can't say, well, you gotta leave one at home. So right there, it's already been ruled by the Supreme Court. So I would revisit that section of it, have legal check it, but it's already been it's already been ruled on, and we've already won that like four years ago. <laughs> so I think I think that this is going in the right direction. Like the work in here was epic. I think we have to tweak a few things. I think that there's some points about bylaw. We need them at night. We need them Fridays and Saturdays. That's 95 percent of your rental time. I think that Niagara Falls is a tourist community. So let's treat it as such. Let's say if we're going to tax these hotels, I'm hearing there's 15,000 rooms at $2 a room. This is a room right here from my friends that have hotels. Let's take 25 cents of that and throw it to the vacation rental industry and say, we now have two bylaws. We're going to fund this by taxing the industry, not seven or 300 houses. We're not going to get anywhere 300 houses. That's not going to cover anybody's wages. Let's take the whole industry, tax it fairly, Take the money, a percentage, you have accountants here, figure out that number, hire some bylaw, and let's enforce the issues. The issues are trash, parking, and noise. We're not having zoning issues. We're having trash issues, noise, and parking. The zoning is irrelevant. Um, and I am now going to the Grand Central. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you staying so late. Uh, hold on one second, Carolyn. Uh, Councillor Iononi, you had a question or a comment? You know, you start, you come in here with one perception in your head and then you listen to people and you get an entirely different perception. Your number, and I'm going back to this gentleman who, who I didn't need to be talking to, either, by the way, but your number of how many rooms you have rented from now to the end of June and you using the number 91,000 vacation stays and 44 complaints really puts it into perspective. Mm -hmm. Listening, and I know we're going to vote on this bylaw, but I have to say, listening to everybody, there has got to be a way that we can help the people who have problems with the with the being the vacation rental beside them, and not make it so prohibitive for people who are trying to make ends meet, who are living paycheck to paycheck, who we are you. We're not everybody here is not. So <coughs> I don't think this bylaw is ready either. And and the more I listen, the more I don't think this bylaw is ready. And and your number's gonna drive me crazy all night. And that's now. that's low. And no, I stay <laughs> when I travel I stay in VRBOs. Mm -hmm. So and and I know to get in the VRBO in my vacation destination of choice, I have to book six months ahead. I watch those calendars like a hawk because I know where I want to stay. I know I stay in the same complex every time. I have to find an available unit. They're zoned for it though. That's just the, that, that's the difference there. But I don't think that this bylaw matches helping people make more money to augment simply surviving every day 
and fixing residents that are living beside people who are problematic. Perhaps it is comes down to trash, noise, partying, and our bylaw and lack of enforcement. Mm. So. But, may I make one more point? Yes. So the city of St. Catharines is rolling out a student housing bylaw. Okay, so uh, they have a town and gown committee, so Walter's got this committee, and Margaret's the expediter in their planning department. And I have tons of students, tons. And so they came to stakeholders and they said, what, what are your issues? What are you need? Like, I don't want St. Patrick's Day party. Like, what land? Oh, yeah, let's have 4,000 kids on our front lawn. Like, we don't want that as an owner. We want them to don't turn the water on, don't flush the toilet every second time, keep the bills in line. That's what we want as, as an investor, right? We don't want parties on our property. It's not good for us. There's a girl right here. She's got 20 people or something in her group. Sit down with the stakeholders. 20 views that can come through right here. Take her up on it. And county. And county. There you go. I'm promoting you. Councilor Anoni. You make a very interesting point because when we talk about sitting down with our tourism stakeholders, we sit down with all our hotel owners. We sit down with all our restaurant owners. We sit down with everybody in the tourism business. Maybe when, as this association comes together, we need to sit with the 20 core people and say, here are the problems we have. I just don't think, the, the, I touched my iPad, I don't think the bylaw that's sitting before us addresses all the concerns that they've given us. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. And just the last thing to council, the hockey the sticks, time. excellent. Thank oh, you yeah. very much for that. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. John Pinter. I'm good, Jimmy. You're good? I'm oh, good. thank you, John. Oh, Wonderful. Uh, Caroline? Uh, Caroline Meyer? Oh, you come? Yeah, okay. You can go that way, too. And the next will be Caroline Bird? Burden? Some? Bird? Will be next. And then we just got a few after that. Okay. Hello, my name is Caroline Meyer. I live at 5309 3rd Avenue. There's so much that I wanted to say that's been said, so check. And there's a whole bunch of new things that I wanted to address. Um, one question that has been outstanding, I read your, uh, the whole agenda before coming here, and um, I did notice that you'd mentioned uh, Toronto's charging a $50 fee for their licensing for up to 180 days, and uh, Niagara Lake charges 110 Per bedroom, and I was just wondering how 500 to 1,000 is in line with uh, the, the market, what's going on around us. I have other questions. Should I keep going? Uh, yeah, why don't you do that? So, um, for, uh, did the, you want to deal with that yeah, one? One of the things that I was, I just happen to know, the Toronto is a whole whack of other fees. So, when you come in to get the $50, uh, the, the report speaks of. It's delightful of the Toronto people when they ask the question, they'll tell you 50 bucks. But if you're a nasty person like me, then you ask, yeah, but if I pay 50 bucks, go, oh no, then you got to get this and this and this and this. So by the time you're finished going through the rigmarole that you, you go through in Toronto City Hall, you're short well more than a thousand bucks. So they're, they're act by the time you actually get your license, you'll have spent close to 2,000 bucks. So, so that's what the, it's, it's a bit different. Our idea was to have an all encompassing fee, you pay the thousand bucks and that covers everything. Like uh, fire and yeah, all that building trying, and all we that stuff. We're trying to make a one fee. Okay. But we still haven't decided between the departments who gets what, but that's an <laughs> internal problem. <laughs> all right. Um, I just wanted to note that I've uh, run an Airbnb. Um, no, I don't want to say that. Um, basically, like a bed and <laughs> breakfast, minus the breakfast part, uh, in another country when I had my first child and I wanted to, to be with her and, and raise her. and. Uh, so to supplement a part-time income, I did that, and you know, in that community, it was like, well, it's your house, and we already have bylaws in place that we will enforce. So go ahead, do what you want. It was very open and welcoming, and and uh, I realized that this can work. I'm a tourism professional. I've worked um, in Niagara Falls here for 30 years. Probably served all of you lunch at some point, and worked for <laughs> others of you. I'm sure I have I've seen all of your faces before um, in various places, but. You know that I don't work half the year, and um, when I do, I'm lucky to get $12, I think, now an hour, because it's gone up. And uh, yeah, I get some tips too, but um, Airbnb is a way to, uh, that has been supplementing my meager income that I support my family with, and uh, this is just totally heartbreaking, what's going on tonight. Um, 
oh my gosh, I didn't want to be emotional. Anyhow, um, so what I wanted to say is that what I brought up at the last meeting is, um, is the CRA, and I know not everybody was at the last meeting at uh, um, the Gale Center, but um, the CRA defines, uh, there's a definite difference between having a business and home sharing. And um, I, I feel like it's, first of all, unfair to um, lump vacation rentals and B&Bs in, um, in the same lump, basically. They are very different things. And to have the same fees and the same processes, I, I don't think that's fair to begin with. And then the third option is the person like me trying to um, raise my own children and stay at home. And um, home sharing is fined by the CRA. Is I think it's less than a certain dollar amount, basic personal amount, $7,600 or something like that. Or it could be that it can't surpass what you pay in mortgage for the year. And what it is to do is to offset what you have to pay to maintain, maintain and live in your own home. Um, and not, uh, and then once it goes above that amount, it's considered a business. So I haven't heard any word about home sharing, but as far as like the CRA and taxation is concerned, if you, you know, if you're not making money, it's not considered as a business and you do not need to declare that as business income. I looked into it last year because I, I made less than $7,000 renting out a room at my house, which made a huge difference to me, but it didn't really make a difference to anybody else. And if I were to be faced with um, paying $1,000 for a license, I would probably just move out of the city. But um, I'm not sure what would happen in that case. I just thought maybe that would be something to consider, that that is um, a different species. Like if I'm supplementing, I'm not going on EI in the winter and I'm making $7,000 and renting out a room in my own home, I don't think that should concern anybody but my family. Caroline, if you can hold one second, the CEO would like to comment. Just on the, uh, the home sharing, and Alex, I'm gonna take a shot at this, but home sharing, if it's longer term, it's a short-term rental, which is under 20, 8, 29 days. Or if it's home sharing for a longer period, that's always been permitted, and it's viewed as a rooming house. So if you're taking in two boarders as home sharing to help pay your mortgage, that's been approved and allowed in this city for years. So is that what we're talking about here? Um, no, that's actually not what I'm talking about because you're um, talking like, short -term uh, yeah, as as Jeffrey was saying about you know taking somebody into their house, your house, and making it their home, that it's a whole other ball of wax. That's very difficult uh, to live with as a family, 365 days a year, having other people in your house. And when you know when this demand is there for extra rooms in July and August. I mean, I did this for like four months um, a couple years ago, and I was able to bring in a, a little bit of income, but I I wouldn't be able to, I mean, I don't have the kind of home, it's a tiny home. I don't have the kind of tiny home to, to live on top of strangers um, with my children and everything all year long. So for me, that was the difference. Um, I guess, so I really only had the one question, which was the first question is how is the, which was answered, so thank you. Okay, thank you, appreciate you doing this, sharing that with us. Uh, Caroline, I'm not sure what it says here, Bur Bur Burden? Burgie oh, there you go, okay. And then Robert Ainsley is next. Okay, I just wanted uh, to state that I live on the Niagara Parkway and I had a, um, a illegal Airbnb out where I lived and it's a rather large home and he was advertising as, as the place to come and have your bachelor parties and your weddings. Of course, that wasn't very pleasant for us because um, of course, noise comes with these things and uh, that is um, upsetting to have to deal with that on a regular weekend basis. I'm totally for vacation properties, Airbnb, whatever they're called. However, they need to be regulated in the right areas and you have to regulate the fact that perhaps certain um, places are not really made for these type of venues. You know, you have your Club Italias, the Hiltons, the Sheridans, where you could be holding your large parties. And that we all need to understand that yes, this um, Airbnb, the sharing of the economy, is the new platform that we're all going to the new economy. However, we all like our freedoms and we have our freedoms within laws and regulations. So uh, I think that is why this is coming forth that we need to regulate this and we need to have uh, these proper um, rentals in the proper neighborhoods so that we can all live happily ever after. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Robert Ainsley and then the last three after that will be Giannina, Carletti, John Clark, and then Peter Fisher. 
Oh, it's not on the list. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're across that. Okay, sorry. Uh, Robert Ainsley, 7100 McMillan Drive. Um, McMillan Drive, did you say? Yeah. <laughs> We, we, we went through the nightmare. I want to, I think you guys are on the right path. I think it does need to be regulated. Uh, we had 25, 25 year olds having their stag and doe party until three o'clock in the morning. It, it was a nightmare. It's been resolved. Want to thank you guys, but I thought I'd come here and talk about it because I want to support the other people here too that are concerned about this. Um, I think there is a place for it. It should be regulated with consequences. I heard a lot of people sitting here talking saying, we don't want to pay the registration, but I think the fee should be enough to cover the cost of enforcement. And there should be consequences. So if you're running a good business, there's no problem with that. Um, I hear the word enterprise where people want to be able to acquire lots of property and stuff like that. I live in a residential neighborhood. I've got three kids. I want them to be able to afford a house in Niagara down the road. I don't want some whole co registered in Toronto acquiring more and more property and then my kids can't have a place to live. And so <coughs> I think you're on the right track um, and we'll see how it goes. I'd, I'd like to see the zoning like you're saying 400 feet for being told if one's in your neighborhood. I'd like it a little further just to know you know what's happening in your neighborhood and I'd like to make sure that you don't get multiple ones in your neighborhood. I'd rather have a neighbor. You're gonna get some good neighbors, you're gonna get some bad neighbors, but my neighbors right now are good. The one across the street that moved into the old Airbnb, great neighbor, and I just like to keep it that way. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Linda, Linda Morrison? Harrison. Or what's it say? Harrison, I'm sorry. Linda, it's crossed out, I can barely read it. Well, I left my notes <coughs> at home, and everything that I wanted to say was covered. But what I do want to say, sorry, Linda Harrison, 8149 Post Road, and I am an Airbnb host. Don't come and find me tomorrow. <laughs> As we were sitting here at this meeting, I got a reservation request, and I have to read this to you because it's just so fitting. Sorry, I'm nervous. <clears throat> Hi, Linda. I and my wife have to attend a wedding at the Sheraton Hotel located at Falls, Falls View. We are from Houston, and we will fly into Buffalo Airport and then drive over. We are empty nesters in our 50s. Quite frankly, we could not afford to stay in the hotel, but we need a place not too far from the wedding location, but it should be private so that we can come and go at our will. This is for three nights in August. I don't know what the Sheraton charges in August, but I'm guessing it's five or six or $700 a night. I charge $110 on a weekend night, which is nothing, but still it's a lot. I only charge those rates in the summer months. I, I, I just had to read that because it just fit what is going on in the city. We're bringing Airbnb and, and VRBO is bringing people into the city that can't normally afford to come here and stay for three nights. They'll stay in Niagara Falls, New York, Eek, or Buffalo and come over and see the falls and then go back because they can't afford to stay here. I agree it needs to be licensed. I agree there needs to be regulation. Licensing fee $1,000, yeah, that's a lot of money for some people, it's a lot for me. Maybe we can do a, a payment plan, you know, 500 up front, 500, six months down the road, something like that. And my other point was about the three strikes you're out. Is that three strikes in a year? Is it three strikes and you're out forever? Can you reapply? Those are concerns that I have. I don't think this is ready to be voted on tonight, councillors. Please put it back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gian Giannina Carletti? Is Giannina here? Carletti? Okay. Uh, John Clark? Is John here? Here we go. And then lastly, I've got Peter Fisher uh, next. My name is John Clark. I live at 6245 Clare Crescent. Uh, your worship, members of council, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have several questions. First question being, I'd like to know what authority does a bylaw officer have to stop an infraction that's that's happening immediately. 
how does he stop that fraction? He doesn't have one. He's gonna go and he's gonna bang on the door. If you can get him to come to the house at three o'clock in the morning, he's gonna come and bang on the door, and if no one answers, he's gonna sit there and twiddle his thumbs. So the next step is you call Niagara Regional Police. <coughs> if they have a car available, and I'm gonna tell you a noise complaint is very, very low priority, especially on a weekend in Niagara Falls when things at the casino and Clifton Hill are rocking and rolling, you'll be lucky to get a car. If they do come, they will bang on the door and they will try to get someone to come to the door and if no one comes to the door, they're gonna drive away because they're gonna get another call. Lord knows they dance as fast as they can and they do a good job, but there's just so many of them and there's not, just not enough. And I would have thought that, you know, with this topic, there would have been a representative from the regional police, a, you know, a liaison officer that, that could speak to this issue because I know what, what he would be saying. And perhaps if this issue does go forward and doesn't get voted on tonight, that might be an idea to have someone that can speak to that issue. I have it on good authority that a lot of Airbnb, I won't say Airbnb, a lot of vacation rentals in Peel region are used for human trafficking. That hasn't been mentioned tonight, but I'm gonna tell you, I know for a fact it happens. The gentleman spoke before me, he lived across the road from it. I walked past the house every day. I saw people coming and going, men coming and going, different plates, different cars, and I did have an opportunity to find out who some of the people are, and I'm gonna tell you, that will be a problem here. It's gonna happen. Are vacation rentals coming? Yes. It's the future. We should adapt to change, but that doesn't mean all change is good. We need to strictly enforce it. $1,000, yes, I understand that it's a hardship to some people. To someone that's running a human trafficking ring, that's chump change. That's nothing. $1,000 be made in an hour, not even. So I would suggest that you know, this is not ready to be passed. It needs a lot more investigation. It needs not more thought. And I do agree that it's coming. It should be in our uh, vacation area or whatever it is, the, the commercial area. Most of the people here have worked very hard to live in their homes that are in neighborhoods where they know the neighborhoods, where there's a, a road hockey game going on on the street and there's a park around the corner you can raise your kids. Unfortunately, a transient population does not fit into that area. And that's what vacation rentals bring. Thank you. Thank you very much. You just want to hold on one second. I've got uh, Councilor Iannone. Wanted to make a just, comment. Just through you to staff, have we asked the Niagara Regional Police to comment? Have, were they part of this whole process? So we'll find that out. I don't know, um, Andrew or uh, Alex? No. We didn't invite them, but did we circulate to them? I think the short answer is no. Yeah, they, I, I haven't seen any representative for the NRP at any of our um, public meetings. And you have a very good point. I mean, priority, a, a noise call is at the bottom of the list. Um, it just enforces everybody who has stood up at this, whether they agree with, with vacation rentals or they don't, every single person has agreed it's the way of the future. Just find some way to make it work and make sure that it works for everybody. And I don't think this bylaw does that. <coughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Peter Fisher, is Peter here? Oh, here. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Well, we've seen Niagara Falls change a lot over the years, especially the downtown area, the real estate in particular. It was pretty rough back in the days when it's come a long way. But if you pull out the rug from these people, you're going to have 100 houses probably on the market being sold at discount prices to who? And who's going in there next? Tenants? I've dealt with tenants. A lot of these people have dealt with tenants, and that can be a nightmare. So the neighbors who are dealing with people on the weekends with their suitcases and license plate from New Jersey they don't know what they're in for once you get the wrong tenants in there and it takes you eight months to get them out. Garbage is a joke in comparison to that. I've, I've been there, it's brutal. 
As far as the zoning goes, I don't know why an R2 or an R3 would have preference or less preference to a tourist, commercial, commercial, or industrial. These people are going there to sleep, to eat, barbecue. What difference does the zoning really make? Maybe not in a R1 zoning, perhaps, I don't know, but an R2 butting up to a tourist commercial zoning. A lot of these people are in those zonings. I, I know this, so that's something to consider, and I think you're very, very premature on this this evening. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Peter. Okay, is, uh, yep, of course. Good evening. Normally, are you normally behind the camera? <laughs> Get the camera on. I just came from Toronto, and I'm so involved about, about these things. I'm so sorry about my English. By the way, I live in Second Avenue for 21 years. And I heard a lot of things that make me sick this evening. I visited uh, last June a friend of mine in a uh, uh, residential area. And uh, his neighbor has uh, three kids and 20 guests. It was unbelievable noise. We couldn't hear each other. And I said, is that happened very often? He said, 365 days per week, per, per, per year, maybe. What about next uh, neighbor? Oh, he rented for Air and B. And do you have any problem? Never. Because those people who rented through Air and B or uh, very beyond, they register people. They have a license. The Air and B need a uh, review for them almost 10 hours after they are leaving. And they are not people like that uh, gentleman say, trafficking and all that stuff. They are people who are known. They use uh, that system, and they are so nice people. Second things, I rent to apartment. I have an unbelievable problem with my neighbor, with my tenant. Two o'clock, three o'clock in the night, he turned the music to the maximum, called the police, no, that's not a crime. <laughs> Your owner, you can have, have to save that, that problem. I, next day I came here and tried to work with uh, some people about the noisy problem and bio. And I'm 21 years here and I'm going to save that problem. And that continue. I cannot rip off the, those uh, uh, and uh, those, those people, because the, the uh, act is called Tenant Pr Protection Act. I visited uh, 20 years ago, maybe a friend of mine, he, he was a uh, front desk in a motel, they report that motel in a ferry and, and standing in uh, one display. One o'clock, in one room, eight people around for two people. And they were drunk, um, young people maybe from the state, they come to drink here because of slow age. And the uh, owner called the police and he ripped them off. The people who are rented, they don't have that uh, right. And uh, three years ago, somebody come in my garage and I was uh, robbed maybe seven, eight thousand dollars. Called the police, it was this winter, and the uh, police man said, I cannot do anything. I said, look, uh, there is a, a step. He ripped off uh, the chicken drip and uh, he have a piece of uh, dress in the, uh, in a, in a fence, and I said, look at that, do something. I'm not CIA. He said, what do you think? You're not the police. I'm police, but I cannot save your problem. Who make that problem? 
not people from Airbnb, neighbor. I have a friend in uh, Rolling Cakers. More, maybe 20 years they live there. 20 years they fight with their neighbor. Not <laughs> with people with Airbnb. What's the bottom line? Money. My dear friend, you said early, must be regulated. Thousand dollars. How that thousand dollars gonna be regulated? I don't agree to thousand dollars, but I know we have to regulate it. We have to work on it. Okay, tell me, even if it is free, how gonna be regulated? Well, you have to direct your comments <laughs> and questions. As well. I know, but this is not. Regulated. So, are you saying? Are you? Uh, so, you're saying what? You're. In, you're I'm saying that last. Area, I was in Paris and through Airbnb. Played about seven years. I said, Did you pay something? She said, I pay my taxes in my income. Did you pay any tax for the uh, city? Or? No. So many people use uh, Airbnb. Nobody pay license or anything else. And Niagara Falls should be town that can be lead in that uh, uh, business. And nobody in the world pay license or anything else, only Niagara Falls, like a $10 uh, parking in a Chippewa uh, park, like all that uh, parking machine over there in a, uh, Glendale. In a, this, is, this is a crazy. Bottom line is a money, money, money. And uh, those uh, friends of mine who have a neighbor, noise neighbor, and uh, uh, with uh, we a big, they said those people said that they don't like those people to make money from their house. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I'm totally against uh, any taxes, any regulation, any uh, thing against uh, that uh, Airbnb because that's a uh, future, 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So folks, we've exhausted our list. Now, if we have someone that wants to offer, it's a public meeting, a brief new piece of information, that's all we ask. It's got to be new because we think we've heard it all. But yeah, come forward, ma'am. You, you can state your name and your address. Yes. Um, actually, I did send in a request for deputation, Mayor. It's Maria Recruit from the Canadian Real Estate Investors Association, okay. and also I'm part of the AROA, which is the Association of Vacation Rental Owners and Affiliates, which is worldwide. And I'm on the board of directors, and I'm also on the advocacy, uh, chair of the advocacy committee. And I would just like to just point some things out here. Um, I own a bed and breakfast in uh, and a vacation rental in Niagara Lake, and have so for 18 years. And these horror stories that I'm hearing here don't happen in Niagara Lake. And maybe what I would like to see happen is that we, I am against the licensing, I'm against going ahead with this bylaw. I think I, I would like to sit down with yourself and all the councillors and all the stakeholders here and this association, and let's talk eyeball to eyeball about what the other cities are doing as far as bed and breakfast and cottage rental. So I'll explain to you what happens in Niagara Lake. Um, in Niagara Lake, it just costs you $120 per bedroom that you want to rent out. That's all it is. So if you have a bed and breakfast and you have three bedrooms, you pay $330 a year. If you have a cottage rental like I do, it's $240 a year. That's all it costs me. And it, we, they grant us a license for four years. And every year, we pay that licensing fee again. Okay? So it's the same amount over and over and over again. And with that, you have every four years, we have the bylaw officer coming to the house, and they have to check for parking. We have to have a certain spot, and we also have certain dimensions for parking. So you have to make sure you have dim that dimensions before you even purchase the house for parking. Um, the other thing, too, is that we have the... Um, uh, fire, the fire chief or the representative come and do a walkthrough. So that happens once every four years. But that doesn't stop them from coming to your home at any time and saying, okay, I want to check on what's going on. We also have to keep books of who's coming in. 
So we have a registration form. So whether they come through Airbnb or booking.com or whatever, we have to have that registration. So I, I would suggest they do that. That way you can control who's coming through your home. Because certainly myself, I don't want a stranger coming into my home and destroying it. And I've heard lately in Niagara Falls, there have been people coming and destroying properties. And, and that, that's not right. And what I'm finding is a lot of them are like 25 years of age, these people who come and have these wild parties. And they actually, I heard from someone that there was $20,000 of damage in one beautiful piece of property. The guests were there through Airbnb for only 20 hours. Can you imagine that? $20,000. So thank goodness um, this uh, homeowner is able to go to Airbnb and they will probably get the money back through Airbnb because, uh, because of this damage, they have insurance in place. So as far as, as that is happening, so we pay $120 per bedroom in the, in the home that we're renting out, whether it's a bed and breakfast or cottage rental. We have, we're inspected one time every four years. We have to get commercial insurance. And um, my commercial insurance is very expensive because you pay above average. We don't get residential insurance. We get commercial insurance. So for my, my cottage rental, because I don't live there, I have to pay commercial insurance. In my bed and breakfast where I live, I pay also, I pay commercial insurance, but it's less expensive because I live there. So that's how the insurance agencies um, um, take care of that. Uh, whether you're running a bed and breakfast or not in your home, um, my bank doesn't care about that. Just like this gentleman said, uh, they don't really care. So that's not your recourse to go to the mortgage holder um, or the mortgagee or whatever else. So what I'd like to see is, is for us to sit down and, and discuss this. Um, and, and, you know, because right now it's kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. And I don't think it needs to be a knee-jerk reaction. I think we have to sit down and look from the stakeholder's point of view. Thank you. I've got yes. a comment by yes, Councilor of course. Yeah, just a quick question. Yes. You say you have a, a vacation rental in Niagara Lake? Yes. Is it legal? Of course. Okay. Yeah, because in Niagara Lake, you can't do that without it being legal. But, but it only costs me. Your town that, in any part of the town that you like, can you have a Yeah, it's, oh, that's, that, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, the whole town. There's no such area as commercial area. The whole town, any residential area, you can have a bed and breakfast or cottage rental. But I'll tell you one thing that they did, because what was happening is what's happening here, where people were coming into town building these huge buildings in Nargon Lake, and at one point we had 400 houses. So what the town did, they put a moratorium, they said, you can, okay, you build your house, but you cannot have a bed and breakfast or cottage rental for four years. You have to live in that house for four years before you can rent it out. So perhaps that's something you should be thinking about. Is put a moratorium that, okay, you want to come in and you want to buy a house. So your new residential areas, they're just going up and you're like, you have 15 in one area, because I know that for a fact. You say, no, you can't run a bed and breakfast or cottage rental or Airbnb for four years. That will slow it down. Okay, that's what they did in Niagara Lake. It slowed it right down. So even if you have a house in Niagara Lake, and what you do is add a new room in the house because you're thinking you're going to rent it out, that has to be there for four years before you rent it out. Okay, so if that offers any type of help with how we handled it in Niagara Lake, by all means, I think we should be talking about it. That might help everyone here, understand? Because you're, you're concerned about these residential areas, these new residential areas. They probably shouldn't be allowed for four years to run anything commercial in there for four years. Then you're, gonna, you're going to really see that people will not be coming for that. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, council, you've uh, now heard from approximately 40 people. This is our third public meeting. And staff, I gotta give them credit, they worked very hard uh, trying to gather the information. <coughs> and I don't think that whatever we do Everyone's going to be happy. I can promise you that. So I've got Councillor Morocco and Councillor Strange. Well, Your Worship, it's What's almost um, the same as we've oh, yeah. the oh, other. I'm, I've got to first close the public meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. So the public meeting with respect to the proposed official planning, plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your Worship, I think that uh, this is almost like we uh, attended one of the, the first couple of meetings and like the L Center that people came. There's a lot, of, a lot more information and uh, a lot of different 
ideas that have been brought forward from different individuals, both pro and con, but I think that no one's saying that they're totally against it, it's just where they're located. And, and I guess it does come down to the fact, the lack of bylaw enforcement to try and get rid of the ones that are bad or shut them down or however that is. Um, with that being said, I think that I actually was ready to support the, uh, the bylaw with maybe not the fact of paying a thousand dollars, but um, I would like to defer this and I would hope that I could ask the support and maybe have some more conversation because some of the things that came forward, like the lady that just spoke about Niagara and the Lake, I didn't get that information here because I, I believed it was something different. And uh, like some of the people that are actually getting an income from working and taking care of some of the vacation properties that do really function good. And I think another thing too is that how are they being regulated? I, I don't know and I have to say that the first time I ever used an Airbnb is when we went to Italy the, this last year and um, my daughter did it all. She said you had to actually book. Sorry, I've gotta, I gotta get this point across. But you had to book and the only way you could book is if they approved you to be there. And after when you left, they rated you whether you were a good person or not. So therefore, if you went to rent another place, and I'm thinking that that should be something that is, is looked at as well, so that there's some other control to get the good people and the right people there. Um, so in the short, I'd like to just defer this, okay. uh, motion to defer, so we can take a look at it again. But I really <laughs> want to make sure. We're going to defer it. We're going to. So. Well, I mean, unless we have. I, I, well, guys, a motion for deferral is not debatable. We can't, it's not debatable. So you're making a motion for deferral. And she said, she said to get more information. So. Well, because they didn't ask for the, the police. It's not debatable. We're not debating it. You can, can you worship, you're allowed to ask for clarification on what the, on what the motion for deferral is. You can ask for, it's not debatable. It's, it's, so we've got a motion for deferral. Who seconded it? So, so for those in the audience, there's a motion for deferral, and we can't debate a motion for deferral to not make a decision tonight. That's the current motion, so we're gonna call the vote. All those in favor of deferral? Opposed? Okay, so that motion is defeated. So we'll look for another motion. Councilor Carrier. We worship, I thought we'd have some discussion. I mean, we've heard from all the uh, people in the audience, I thought it would be good for the council to have some discussion. It was my feeling that this was a zoning meeting. We're not here to debate whether or not Airbnbs are good or bad or whatever. I, I happen to believe they're, they're good. But this is about a zoning meeting because there's a whole bunch of businesses being run illegally in our community, which is threatening the residential areas in our zoning bylaw. So that's what we're here to debate and talk about. I want to talk about it as a zoning issue, not as an Airbnb issue. I like Airbnbs. I think they should be in tourist commercial areas, commercial areas or industrial areas. And I'll support them 100%. But I don't support them in residential areas because where's it going to stop? And I haven't got a call from any resident yet who wants to see an Airbnb beside them. I thought that we were going down the right path. Uh, we don't, I don't need to hear from the police. I don't need to hear from anybody else. I've heard from all these people. And I've heard from many of the people who don't want an Airbnb beside them illegally. So. I'm prepared to move forward on what we have on the table. We have other comments? Councillor uh, Strange and then Campbell? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. I, you know what, I, I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of different people come up and, and you're on, on both sides, you know. It's, and you think of Niagara Falls and, and the way of the future and that's, you know, Airbnbs. I've been to Italy and I stayed at Airbnbs before and a great place and they were, they were always owner occupied to tell you the truth. but. Um, you know, it, it, we're in Niagara Falls. We're in a destination where, obviously, the accommodations are needed. It was, we said there's over 350 maybe illegal Airbnbs, but they are being used. Obviously, I've heard from James, who's got his place booked up for the summer, basically. And, and, I, and I, I just I hate to see people not making income. You bought them as an investment property. Um, you know, and, and I, I see and I see the other side, and you don't want to be beside a neighbor. Who, uh, who has an Airbnb and it's constant noise all the time. And, and I don't know if, if, if there's that much or if it's just a few instances. We've heard you know, 47 complaints that have all, and I can understand Adam too, and, and 
you know, I, I like the idea of a property owner being in a, in a B and B, and if not, maybe tweaking it that there's a, a property management company running it at least. You know, if, if it's not an owner occupied, so you know, I don't know if that would help you in your circumstance, James or, James or not. Um, you know, on, on the other hand, you, you can see if there's too many Airbnbs and B&Bs, you'll see it, the, the low income housing, there won't be any. That's right. there, there will not be any. People will not rent to long term uh, renters over 20 days. And sometimes, like I would rather, you know, rather, rather make $200 a day than make $750 in a month, obviously. And it's probably less hassle, to tell you the truth. Some of these, you know, you can't get rid of your, your renters. You know, I've, I've been there, right, where you can't get rid of them. And they make a massive disaster. You know, you see it at Brock University where you got the, the school housing and stuff like that. And, but there's got to be some um, kind of common denominator where we help out and try to help out both sides. Because obviously you don't want to be next door to a, a, an illegal Airbnb. But it's something, if we can tweak it somehow where we can let a property management company in these B&Bs, and help them out. I don't know if that's a solution or not. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really on the fence here because um, I can totally see both sides. I think you get more problems at the motels down on, on some of the motels on Lundy's Lane, where you know you, you see some of the, the uh, you know long-term people that are renting there because they can't afford to, to go into any of these these homes. So, you know, we, we had our last meeting where we we did, you know. A, a, you know, adding dwellings so we can let these low-income people have a place to rent. You know, you add this now, and, and it's like, what would you rather have? Uh, someone in there that's, you know, for $700, $800 a month, or you're getting something $200 a night. And obviously our city needs it. We're here, and we're Niagara Falls. We're a tourism city. We're the biggest destin tourism destination in, in the world. You know, how are we saying no to this sort of stuff? But I think it has... It can't be saturated. I, I, I've noticed and I've Googled some, some other places in New York where um, the Airbnbs are so saturated that people are homeless. They are. They can't afford to stay in places. Mm -hmm. And I can see both sides. I don't want to take any way from anyone's making an income. And I know these guys personally. And they're friends of mine. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really torn on this. And um, I, I voted for maybe either tweaking it, let a property management company in, I, I just don't know if I can vote on this tonight. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I've got Councillor St Campbell, sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, earlier in the, first of all, I, I have to say I I agree with uh, Councillor uh, Curio. This is a zoning meeting. This has got nothing to do with, with B&Bs, Airbnbs. Uh, it's a zoning issue. I support B&Bs. Um, I support owner residing in the operation. <coughs> I heard uh, Mr. Hurlovich say that he might be willing to consider a live-in manager as being the equivalent of an owner. Could we get some clarification on that, Mr. Hurlovich? Um, we've been using the word proprietor. Um, and I know our solicitor takes a slight different interpretation, but what we've done, taken is when you look at the dictionary, it says something about exclusive rights to the property. So if you are the manager and you're, you've got the exclusive rights to live there by virtue of the owner, then we've taken it to be that they are the equivalent of the owner. And, and if I think, uh, Excuse me, Mr. Councilor, uh, Mr. Bean wants to add to that. If you want that, if you want that, the bylaw is going to have to be changed. The word proprietor means owner, and, I, and <laughs> that's what it means. So if that, I know Mr. Hurlovich wants it to mean something else, but that isn't what it means. So if you want that, we'll just tweak the bylaw to put permanent well, managers as a person, a live-in manager, if, if that's what counts. But we're already doing that. that. Yeah. Oh, no, we're not. Yes, we are. Uh, no, we're not. We have a manager resident on and River Road. He just said that tonight. Yeah, I know we did, I know we have that, but that isn't legal. It was permitted, but the bylaw should not have been applied that way. Right? Then that's the licensing bylaw that he's talking about. Okay, so the fact that we made an error in the past isn't a reason to repeat it. 
We will modify the bylaws to suit what council well, wants. Well, if, if, if that's I would make that a friendly uh, amendment to the uh, what's on the table tonight because I think that that's significant in terms of uh, uh, operations of uh, vacation units. Uh, uh, if 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 you've got uh, three bedrooms, four bedroom house that you want to put someplace, and you have a manager managing that. I, I don't have a problem with that. Well, we that, that would be a live-in person that's responsible for the 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 operation of that facility, and that's the problem. Is there's nobody there that's responsible in a, a vacation rental unit? Well, we certainly can. That's not okay. just a matter yeah, okay. of taking the work. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor Iononi. Thank you. I have a number of things to to point out. It's a zoning application. I have no problem keeping it on a zoning application, so why are we adhering fees to B&Bs if we're talking about a zoning application? And they should come back for licensing. If we're just talking about zoning, why are we talking about imposing a $1,000 licensing fee? I prefer owner-operated, owner-occupied, but it took, I, I'm not sure, I think the young lady was the 12th speaker, and she already found the loophole where she said, so if I have a manager there full-time, took. 12 speakers to find the first loophole, which is why I didn't think this bylaw is ready. Not one of us came up with that. Mr. Beeman just, just corrected Mr. Herlovich and said, in fact, that's not what your license allows. So how are we supposed to understand? How are people supposed to understand if the two behind us don't understand? No, they do now because Mr. Beeman just highlighted that it can't be. But she understood it in no time. So, so did we. That's why I brought it no, up. Uh, but I'm saying that's, that's not how Mr. Hurlovich explained it. So already we have loopholes here. When our tourists, what we call, when our tourist agencies that we call fees for service come before us, we are forever getting the commercial that says. Our, our, ex, our, and our event brings in $18 million of revenue on this event, $18 million of spin-off money in this event. Um, eight, Festival of Lights, for instance, came and gave us the spin-off dollars of their event. They haven't even had the opportunity to do that. If we have eight, and I think we have far more, if, I, I think I have 4,000 people on Facebook. I've lost track of the people who are advertising their Airbnb on Facebook that are in this city that don't care. So I think we have far more than 250. But if we looked at the spin-off dollars from that, not just from the income coming in here to the restaurants, but the income that the people who are running the Airbnbs then have to spend in our own community. They could probably give us the same dollar amounts as the Festival of Lights does when it says, here is your spin-off money. I just don't think we have that much information to make the decision tonight. But if we go back to it just being a zoning decision, then I don't have a problem with the zone, how we zone it here. If you're, if you're on site, you're going to call it a B&B. &B. Then we don't attach fees right now. We've heard the fees are the issue. Let's take the fees out of the problem, talk about zoning, and look at the fees at another time. Because clearly $1,000 was prohibitive. Let's zone and then look at the, how the other uh, municipalities do it. Because if it's a zoning application, let's just deal with zoning. Yep, yep. Councillor Cario and then Rocco. I just... Um, to Councillor Anoni's comments. The reason we're here, the priority is to stop them going in residential areas, because that was the issue, to stop them from continuing to open illegally in residential areas. So we're here to say, part of this is gonna say, you can't open an Airbnb in a residential area. You can't have it. You're gonna have to come back here for rezoning to, order, to open up a vacation rental in a residential area. And that's, that's my number one priority is to stop people from thinking they can come to our community, buy a home, and have a vacation rental illegally in Niagara Falls. That's why I didn't want to defer it. I want to stop that now. Yes. We're way overdue to stop that. Um, I, yeah, to, to, that point, to that point, yes. So that's a zoning act. That's a zoning matter. It is not a licensing matter. It's not a fee matter. It's not anything like that. So I have no problem supporting this bylaw if we take the fees out of that and, and talk to people about how much 
licensing fee should be. But I'm still confused on if somebody is living in a residential area and they want to have a, a bed and breakfast, they can do it as long as they pay their $1,000 in, in, and, and they live there. Am I understanding that That's clearly? Right. That's right. So we're so see to me. That's right. And and you jumped on me when I said semantics. It doesn't matter whether you're renting your house out to call it a bed and breakfast to make extra income, or you're calling it an Airbnb to make extra income. Vacation rental. Vacation rental. <laughs> we want owner occupied. That's what we want. So it seems to me we're kind of at cross purposes here. So we now have managers who can be on a on a property, and it's no longer owner occupied. It's just have somebody full time on the property, a proprietor or a, a manager, or that's what we just heard. A representative. a representative, but somebody who deals with the same the the noise problems and the garbage problems and the drunks in the in the hot tub problems, but somebody who's responsible for doing that on site. Correct. Okay. So the, so zoning. I have no problem with this application then if you take the, the fees and the licensing out of that because it already lets everybody here do then what they want to do. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Morocco and then Campbell. Saying that we went from sixty dollars to a thousand was pretty uh, hefty to, to move right away, and bylaw has to step up and, and be enforced to take care of those ones right now that are in the residential ones and shut them down. So <laughs> Councillor Campbell, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and you know that's why we needed to have this discussion. It, it would have been a real shame to. Uh, defer this this discussion and we're having positive discussion I agree we all said it that when we spoke about it earlier it seems a little steep and especially all the people who have been paying that fee that presently operate legal B&B's to go from sixty dollars to a thousand overnight that's not fair so I, I'm more than willing to, to look at this on the basis of uh, the zoning bylaw aspect, and we'll defer the the fee situation. And I think that um, a, a manager, a live-in manager, would be as acceptable as a, a resident. Now, if no one has any problems with that, I would make that a motion. No. All right, let's speak a little more. I've closed the public meeting, so I'm sorry, I can't come back to the gallery. Now it's a decision, a discussion up here. Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo, did you want to comment? Yeah, well, you just, I, you might as well. Let's get it all over. I didn't so have my hand up, but okay. Well, you, come on, bring it on. Um, you're mumbling or something. Yeah, 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 yeah I guess so. Uh, you Worship, I guess the fundamental issue that we're dealing with tonight is zoning. I, I, I think Council needs to decide whether or not we want to allow commercial operations amongst residential zones. That's the issue because the vacation rental is a commercial operation. Um, I myself, I live in a home, I've lived in there for 15 years now. Neighbors on both sides of me have lived there for 15 years and the neighbors on both sides of them have lived there for 15 years. I chose to live there. I mean, I didn't choose to live somewhere where all of a sudden the rules could automatically change and then I could get commercial operations beside me. I chose to live in a residential neighborhood. I personally, I'd like to keep residential neighborhoods. I'm happy to support the recommendation that staff have laid forward for us tonight. I do have a couple minor changes though. Uh, under page nine, section E, where it talks about recommended changes to the residential designation, it talks about being able to apply for a zoning bylaw amendment to then allow the right to operate a vacation rental inside a residential zone. <clears throat> I think it's almost hypocritical in a sense 
to say that we're going to pass a blanket bylaw to outlaw these vacation rentals in residential zones and then say, but if you want to pay a fee, we'll consider it. And these are the criteria that we're going to use to accept you. It, it doesn't make sense. One side doesn't equal the other. I think we either go one way or we go the other. We shouldn't have a mechanism <coughs> that you can come to City Hall, pay money, and then be allowed an approval so that you can operate your vacation rental inside a residential zone. I would prefer that that be taken out if council chooses to maintain residential zones. I, for one, do like that. Okay. I understand that anyone can make an application yeah. to have anything approved. I think it's a different story when the city is putting in its official plan the rules and regulations that it will go by for as to whether or not it gives it a positive recommendation. Okay. Yeah. I think that if we just had a blanket no, we're not going to allow them, people are still allowed to make a rezoning application, and then we'll have to consider it at that point. Let me just get a, a comment from sure. our solicitor. Mr. Beam. Just going to, well, Mr. Hillovich is going to speak this, but um, the, the rationale for having that in there is specific, from the point of view of the planners, is the, the in the one decision we went to the OMB on, the OMB was particularly critical of the city for not having any policies on what you do when one of these things is applied when somebody makes an application for one of these things. So the idea was to have some criteria that would be applied in order to, so that there'd be some predictability in the process, and that was the, the, uh, the idea of why these things are in there. Now, I'm not, I had nothing to do with writing them, but I do know that's why they're in there, and that's why it's, uh, that's the rationale for having these things in the official plan. Um, okay, Your Worship, but again, it goes back to the fundamental question. It's a zoning issue. <coughs> So do you have in your official plan ways that a hotel can gain access into a residential area? Ways that an adult parlor can gain access into a residential area? You don't have those. You haven't listed those in your official plan simply because you don't support them. Um, if you don't actually, support them here, then why would you list those criteria in your official plan? Thank you. In, an answer. in other municipalities which have a lot more money to spend on planners, they do have such things. And so that's, you know, for example, I used to, uh, when I first started uh, in the uh, region of Hamilton, <coughs> I did every, at least four a month, guys trying to get retirement lots on, in, on farms. And there was a specific set of criteria you had to go through that was listed in the official plan as to whether or not the guy would get a retirement lot. You know, was he a bona fide farmer and uh, the guy had he farmed for a length of, a sufficient length of time and so on and so forth and go through all these things. And those criteria were set in there because they didn't want to give retirement lots. Retirement lots were forbidden. You were supposed to have a minimum lot of 25 acres in that particular area of, of Hamilton. So it, it is a, it's a common practice in official plans. Um, yes, we don't have other, for, for every you know, potential land use set of criteria, but for this one, because the OMB specifically targeted us for not having one, we're putting it in front of council. If council doesn't want to do it, that's up to council, but that's why it's there. I prefer to not to, Your Worship. The other, um, the other small change that I would like to make is, it talks about the rural areas and it talks about as of right. I, I would like to change that as of right so that at least neighbors understand that people have applied for a zoning bylaw change and that at least they have a say in whether or not the property next to them is granted the opportunity to become a vacation rental. The one that I can think of is on Lions Creek Road. I hear from the neighbor all the time. Once again, like the uh, woman who spoke before, um, there's weddings, there's bachelor parties at, at, at this residence, and it's the neighbor that ends up having to deal with it. I, I'd rather not see an as of right granted to the rural area. I think it should go through a zoning bylaw amendment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Carey? I have another question to our planner um, on the number two bullet where he talks about uh, and good agricultural, general agricultural designation. Um, Mr. Herlevick, how does, how does tourism and agriculture go together? I, I don't know how we picked agriculture because uh, farms are noisy, dusty, sometimes smelly. I don't see how the uh, that goes together. Yes, well, part of it is, is the uh, 
again, just a uh, support mechanism that the region's policies have come up with. So in order to assist the farmer with uh, farming operations, which don't often pay for themselves, they don't always pay for themselves, the ability to then be able to rent out rooms and or their house to uh, augment their income, the same as the people that we've heard speak tonight that they need ad additional assistance in affording um, like the their property. The the so, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah green, green Acres. That was do we have other uh, questions of staff or of counts or comments for council? Councilor Crater? Thank you, Worship. Just a, just a couple of really short comments. Uh, I think it was a, maybe a year ago. Uh, I remember this because I got a call at 10 o'clock at night. And I remember the fellow calling me and saying, you gotta come out to my house, Kim, and you gotta see what's happening with the house next door to me. And he started talking to me about Airbnbs. I didn't know what he was talking about. All I remember is I said to my wife, Helen, I said, is it okay if I go at 10 o'clock at night to see a resident who's got a complaint? She says, what's new? Go ahead. So I went out and, and I met the fella and he showed me the house next door to him and he showed me six or seven cars parked there and he was telling me how they came over to his house and they were knocking on the door and he has the two children, his wife was there. So they're telling me all this and that's my first First involvement ever with Airbnb. And I still didn't know what Airbnbs were. And so for me, I'm only, for me, maybe there were only 44 complaints. I sure felt like I got a lot more than 44, but I got a lot of complaints. And we visited, and I think Councillor I know and I wrote it once or twice, but we went out to visit them. So when I looked at all of this, all I was, in my mind, as we were going through this whole process, I was trying to figure out how can we help those people who are having those kinds of problems. And I do want to take, if, if you'll indulge me for a second, I want to read a couple of the emails that were sent to me uh, personally from people that I spoke with. Um, after talking with you, contact a number of the neighbor owners in the neighborhood uh, where we live. Many of the homes that are owned, they're owned by agents who presently illegally rented the rooms, also on the Airbnb website. There are nine homes that went up for sale or short-term lease, and the homes aren't even finished yet. The agents, now they're talking about real estate agents. I didn't quite understand, because I called the gentleman and talked to him. He said, so what's happening is real estate agents are buying the homes. They're buying them. And they thought they'd be able to flip them, but they didn't get they, the market didn't, didn't work out for them. So what they then did is then converted them into Airbnbs. Then they went on to explain to me, there's bachelor parties going on all night long at these homes. Okay. Um, on the weekends, it's also a frat house party, like parties spilling out of the streets. There's type of clientele coming into a very quiet community. We have noticed, and one gentleman mentioned this, I'm only reading what the individual sent to me. We've noticed a sex trade industry working in our neighborhood all of the hours, day and night. I have pictures, I have security, uh, security cameras to show that I'm not just saying things, these are allegations. So I could read, I have, and I could spend a couple hours reading, not just the ones that we all got, but I got other ones. So in my mind, all I was trying to accomplish is how do we come up with helping the people who are having these problems? And I will say, and I'm going to acknowledge this, that I now understand much more clearly that there are a lot of Airbnbs that probably have, that have been running and people don't know about them because they've been running really good. And I'm sure there's a lot that I have never, I'll probably never visit. But now the question arises, how do we, how do we fix this for those people? So one way was, as our staff was ex suggesting, because that's, all my calls to the staff was for the same thing. You've got to stop these things. How do we stop, stop the parties? How do we, how do we stop? So when I read the report, I'm thinking, okay, then one option is we just don't allow them in residential areas. That's the end of it. We just, just say that can't happen anymore because you're thinking, well, maybe that will stop for these people that are going through these difficult times because it hasn't worked. And I'm not saying this to be critical of our staff but it hasn't worked, our bylaw enforcement does, they don't have that kind of authority. The gentleman who spoke here a while ago, they're not police officers.
you can you can knock on the door and if they don't want to open the door and talk to you, they don't have to. There's nothing you can do. And you can call the police and tr get them to come down. There's nothing really they can do either. So the only option I thought when I read the report was that was the part that I that caught me in the report is we just don't allow them in there. We put them in a specific area. And then I thought, okay, maybe as time goes on and things work out, maybe we may revisit it and look at it, moving it into the residential. Maybe it could happen. But in the meantime, the only solution I could think of when I read all of this report from the city and the staff is the only way we can help the residents are going through in their <coughs> mind, and, and I've been out there, so I've seen it. The only way we can help them is to restrict it in the tourist, in the residential area. And that's why I was, that was the thing that I wanted to support. The fees and all of that, I didn't expect that when I read the report when it came out. And again, not being critical of the staff, but I didn't expect all that. I was just trying to look at how do we stop it to help the residents. So I want to support this tonight, because if not, then I haven't done anything to help those residents. They're still in the same boat. Uh, they're gonna walk out of here and they're gonna have the parties going on and they're and all those things. I wanna do something for them tonight. And that's the reason I didn't defer it, because I felt like I, we all have talked to, I'm not the only one, I know I know all the counselors. I like what uh, Councillor uh, Peter Angelo said as well. So I just wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna vote because I wanna come up with something to help the residents. And I know we can say, well, it isn't quite ready now, or, but I don't live where they live. I don't see what they see every night. You know, I don't go through what they go through. As you said, Victor, I live in a residential area, and that's, that, it is a community, and the Crescent I live in is a community. We all know each other. We all trust each other. We all, I can leave my house open. They're there, I know it. So I don't want me to ramble on, but I, I take this very, I think we all do, uh, very, very personally. We wouldn't want our space and our investment and where we live to suddenly be changed dramatically because of people coming in and out. And there's probably a lot of good people, as some of these people have explained about Airbnbs. Or, and I like the young lady who spoke and read the, uh, the yes, the, the text of, from the people that are coming from, uh, from uh, down in the States. So I know there's a lot of good, and it is, if we didn't have the complaints and if things were done the way they should be, we wouldn't be sitting here. You know, they probably would still be running. But where it's here, and we've got to help the people who are in need. And so I want to support something that will at least give those people some hope that we really care and we're going to solve some of the problems for them. I don't know if it's not a I, don't, I never thought of it as a zoning issue. I thought it was an issue to protect the, uh, the integrity of the people and their rights that they have in the communities in the area that they live in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to maybe point out here um, First of all, I know we're saying we want to help the residents. Currently, it's not you're not allowed to have vacation rentals in residential areas currently. So anything we pass tonight, it doesn't change any of it. All we're doing tonight is allowing it in certain areas. That's what the proposal is before us tonight. It's not to ban it anywhere. It's already banned. It's not allowed. So tonight, if we approve the recommendation that's before us, it's to allow it in certain areas of the city by right by right, by right. Yeah. so it means you'll be able to get a license yeah. so and what i've heard here tonight is i think people have said maybe a thousand dollars is too hefty so maybe we got to come in at a more reasonable number and maybe that number we don't have to determine tonight necessarily we can determine that at a at a coming at a, a you know maybe at the next meeting we can have some discussion around it so a thousand is too much the other thing that i think i'm also hearing is whatever we do we got to be sensitive to a grace period <coughs> because there's people that have booked and you're not just punishing the person who's running the, the vacation home, you're punishing the tourists from all over the world that have already planned and booked their flights and that are already coming here. So you got to think about that too because that's going to have negative ramifications. So we got to think about a grace period. And the other thing too that I think I've heard tonight is um, that we're supportive if the owner can't necessarily be on site, if they've got their designate there, whether that's a superintendent or it's a manager or it's your mother or whatever the case may be, but a designate that will be there on site to keep an eye and an ear on what's happening and that'll be responsible for what happens. The other thing that I think I heard tonight is that we're all supportive and this, if is approved, room sharing will be allowed anywhere in the city. So the idea of a B&B, &B, 
So if you want to rent out a room or two or whatever to supplement your income anywhere. or help pay your mortgage, what's that? Anywhere in the city. Anywhere in the city, you will be allowed to room share. For those of you that are looking for some relief, you still will be allowed to do just that. I think I also believe it's gonna be tricky because some people might say, you know what, I'm a three bedroom, I normally would rent the two, I'm gonna rent mine as well, and I'm gonna stay at my mom's lay on the couch because I can grab a few more bucks. It's gonna be very tricky to police. The other thing I heard tonight is, it's all about enforcement. You can make all the bylaws you want, but if you don't have enforcement, it's just a piece of paper. So that's gonna be tricky. And I don't think we want to, and I like the one idea that we don't want to come down hard authority because this industry in a large part regulates itself. Because if you get poor customer evaluations on the website, nobody will rent from you in the future. If you've got an infestation, if you've got leaky roofs, if you've got broken air conditioning, if the water doesn't run, whatever the problem is, you will leave a negative review and people in the future won't want to rent it. So it self-polices, it's, it's a very good, but unfortunately, like anything else, you got bad apples and you've got exceptions. Things like that have happened on McMillan Drive that have given a black eye to this industry. So for those of you that are doing a great job, I feel bad that you, you, you're gonna feel the heat because of what some other idiots have done before. And so they made it bad for everybody and that's unfortunate as well, but we are a tourist town and these types of things are popular, and I bet you 90% of this room, including around this horseshoe, have used vacation rentals here in uh, North America and around the world, and I know that for a fact. So we believe in it, we can't be hypocritical on one hand, So, but I also think that I heard tonight is, I don't want one next to my house. I don't wanna live next door to one that can get out of hand, and I've seen that too, noisy. So when there's someone living on site, and there's somebody that's keeping an eye on things, it's a good way to have, instead of our bylaw bringing down the hammer, it's the owner bringing down the hammer, and it's as well, the neighbors complaining on the site and giving a bad review to that property. So there's a lot of ways, and and, and I think, things uh, in place that can make this work. So I think I've tried to encapsulate most of the discussion that I, that I heard tonight. Yeah, well, I, I'm not making a motion, but uh, as the chair, but I think that kind of encapsulates most of what we heard tonight. So if someone here is willing to, Council Maracas, you've got your hand out if you want to make yeah. some kind of a so, motion. So, you know, I, I think that what we are hearing and I actually brought forward that, you know, we want to table it and have some discussion ourselves later on, but ever, that didn't work. But we're having discussions, but I think at the end, we all want the same thing. We want to take care of the, the people that are our residents uh, in the subdivisions that are being tortured by these bad apples. So. I actually have to say I like everything that you said and you pointed out exactly and I think that I'm willing to put that forward as a motion to outline um, and hopefully get some feed feedback as to let's go forward and get the bylaw in place. Well I'd suggest that Councillor then if so I, I'm support I'm saying that recommendation is good, the recommendation. Yes. But I want I, to take out the, the fee. Yeah, the fee, which isn't in the recommendation, but it's further in the report. Okay. So, so I want to start somewhere. So right. I'm looking for some input from somebody So you're here. suggesting, work on it. Councillor, that move the recommendation, less the f aspect of the fee. It's a start. Okay. And implement, I'm suggesting, if you are to, um, a grace period be implemented to not penalize those that have already booked. Um, the illegal ones? Pardon me? You mean let the illegal ones run for the summer? Well, I don't know. They're, they're all illegal, though. Everyone in the city is illegal right now at this point, right? As well, of today. Law enforcement, not less. Well, well yeah. if you want, uh, okay, well, that's the discussion. I'm throwing the discussion out here. Yes? To that point, we're now global. We're now online all the time. TripAdvisor, Airbnb, comments on, on hotel reviews, everything. I'm getting messages from residents now who say, I, I run a five-star Airbnb. I'm booked all summer. My neighbors all know and help with my guests when I'm not home. These are messages that are coming through right now. I'll pay the fee when you come up with a fee, but I'm booked. We're taking, we, I like your suggestion of phasing it in. When do we phase it in? Do we do, we do this now and have people who have factored that income into their own family budget 
or, or owning that property and are booked straight through to September. Because I'm getting messages from people saying, I'm, I'm booked straight through to December. September, I don't have two days open. You mean booked illegally? Booked illegally, but they're all illegal. Well, all illegal. But they're it's all illegal, illegal right now. Illegal. It's, so I'm saying to you, if you have 100 Airbnb, or 1,000 Airbnbs, and all those nights are, are booked and we say, okay, no, you can't come anymore. Buddy's 90,000 number are those 90,000 people who aren't coming and in a digital world start saying, you know what? I'm gonna go here because Niagara Falls, which would be beautiful, but I can't afford it, isn't progressive and you can't get an Airbnb in Niagara Falls. We look for Airbnbs or Verbos so we can afford it. So I think we're kind of closing a door on, on giving people the ability to make a, a better income and we're, we're opening a door for far more. We're, we already have the reputation of charging people for breathing air. And now <laughs> we're gonna tell people they cannot use Airbnb here too. Like whether it's true or not, that's the perception we get in the complaints we get from people. I like your phasing it in. So can we have a discussion on phasing it in so we don't hurt those that are already booked? And maybe in that time period, we can come up with some happy meeting. I've got Mr. Beeman uh, anxiously. Uh, uh, sorry, just, yes, just one. Yes, yes. Well, yes uh, no, I, I, I think there's, there's some good sentiment in this idea of a phase in. What is it be a concern from us is, uh, from a staff perspective? We'll have to, I'm asking that that particular matter, can you, can you let us have a, a council meeting to come up with a plan for that? Because what I'm concerned about is, you know, I, I well hear that, you know, we have these ones that nobody's found. You know, we heard the number 90,000, whatever they are, and they're booked and so on. And I can understand that might dam would damage, would, would damage the city's reputation if we started just shutting them down. At the same time, council will want us to come down with the hammer on the ones that are having the wild parties. So we need to have uh, to sort of, I think we need to kind of define the situation a bit so that council can give a staff some guidance as to how they want to approach. We have some guidelines and we can explain ourselves when we hit one and leave another. Because you know, very few of the, we've, with the exception of one gentleman who likes to look, go on the, on the website and find them and complain, the complaints have been generated by garbage and noise and so on. Not just the mere fact that it's a and b and so, with the exception of one complainant, he, and the mayor knows him well, <laughs> um, but so what we want, if we're going to phase this in gradually, um, I, I would advocate that we provide some, some guidelines for content, and by all means, phase it in. That's, that's not my, i just like some, uh, us to have some time to develop some guidelines. Okay, so then the three main things that I saw was, number one was the cost that we'd have to come back on. The second thing was, as we mentioned, some kind of a phase in grace period, whatever that is, yes, for the illegal ones. Uh, and then the third thing would be a proprietor um, instead a substitute, like a superintendent or a manager. Or a live-in. A live-in, but, but the person that would live on site, yeah. but staff to come back with the right language around what that would be called, right? Because is that just having somebody live on site on a court And rights, also all the rural, rural area? Right. Yeah. And the rural. And the rural. And the rural. Yeah. So those, is it safe to say those are the four main points here yeah. that we need them to come back to us with? Yep. Yeah. So then, so we could, what? Enforcement. Yeah, and we'll enforce. That's a lot. I'm talking about enforcement, give it a more tooth. Okay, and enforcement, so five things, right? More tooth. More tooth, very good. <laughs> if I could, um, I'm being told that they don't, uh, the heard of the chiefs have gotten shy. Um, we seem to be having some difficulty understanding the rural issue. As I understand the proposal, um, not, they're, you're not allowed to have um, a vacation rental as of right in a rural area. So that, that's already the proposal. Is that not what council wants? What did you guys want in the rural area? Did you want it loud or? I thought that it was as of right. So you like it that way? Or no. no, no. So it's not allowed right now. Yeah. Can you confirm that, that your proposal is? Well, I said that to council earlier, and I said again. Vacation rental units would be by application only. Bed and breakfast would be allowed right. in every residential zone plus the rural zone. But maybe the councillor is saying he doesn't want bed and breakfast in the rural zone. No. 
No. Okay. okay, so we can scratch roll off then. Yeah. So it's four things. So then basically we're at we're moving the recommendation as it sits here, but but we're taking out the cost at this point to be dealt with uh, not tonight to discuss the grace period, phased in period, whatever the, that's going to be and how that's going to look for the illegal ones. And um, also the, the live-in superintendent manager piece, how that's going to be, and enforcement. Is that right? So that's the motion by Councilor Morocco, seconded by Councilor Iannone. If there's no further discussion, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. So that's where we're at tonight, folks. Hopefully everyone got a little bit of what they were looking for. To be continued. Thank you very much. It's strange to give the bylaws a first reading. All those in favor? Okay. Yes. <laughs> what did they give you? Tap water? Like oh, uh-uh. just read them off. Bylaws 2018-37 through to 2018-40. Read a first time. Thank you. Motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange, that the bylaws be given a second and third reading. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Bylaws 2018-37 through to 2018-40, read a second and third time and passed. Motion for adjournment. Councilor Strange, seconded by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor, we are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.